Hello, I'm Peter Van Dusen, and welcome to the launch of CPAC's Vote 2021 election coverage. In one hour from now, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, will be making a visit to the new Governor General, Mary Simon, at Rideau Hall to formally ask that she approve his request to dissolve the 43rd Parliament and call a federal election, we expect, for Monday, September 20th. After a 36-day campaign, that's the minimum length required by law. These are live shots of Rideau Hall now as we get set for the arrival of the Prime Minister, as I say, in about an hour from now. The campaign launch will happen 22 months after the Liberals won a minority government and two years before the end of the government's mandate in Parliament. And it will take place as Canada battles a fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Coming up, we'll hear from party leaders as they launch their campaigns, from party commentators, journalists, and also from Canadians across the country about the timing of the election, the issues, and the options available to them on voting day. We also have reporters in every region of the country to set up the campaigns for you and the issues where you live. But right now, let's hear from CPAC's Martin Stringer at Rideau Hall about how this campaign will formally begin today. Martin, what will happen at Rideau Hall this morning? Well, Peter, as you mentioned, the Prime Minister is expected here at about 10 a.m. And what you will see is that just behind me, you see Rideau Hall. Prime Minister will be arriving from Rideau Cottage, which is only a few hundred meters from Rideau Hall. He's been staying there, as Canadians know, because of uh, the renovations being done on the 24 Sussex, the Prime Minister's residence. He's going to arrive, and he will arrive, we've been told, with his family. So uh, he will be greeted at the uh, location here at Rideau Hall by the Clerk of the Privy Council and by the Secretary of the Governor General, and he will go inside. We've been told that they will be meeting for about 30 to 45 minutes. And it's at that meeting where he will sit down at a formal meeting and he will actually ask of the Governor General that she dissolve Parliament. Uh, some of these meetings uh, historically have been uh, shorter, some have been longer. Uh, there was a very long meeting between Stephen Harper and Mikel Jean, we, our viewers might remember when he was asking her to dissolve Parliament for a federal yes. election. Uh, let's uh, put a little context to this. Why does the Prime Minister need to get the approval of the Governor-General to launch an election campaign? Well, uh, as our viewers may know, the Governor General is actually the head of state in Canada. So she is the only one who can dissolve Parliament. She will inform, if she get, grants the Prime Minister's request, she will inform the Queen that Parliament has been dissolved. Uh, and what would happen was that she will then instruct the Chief Electoral Officer of Canada to issue, to draw the writs of one, uh, 338 different ridings. So 338 electoral writs would be issued. Now the question is, does she have to accede to the, the Prime Minister's request? There's only been one time in history in the 1920s when a Governor General refused the request of a Prime Minister to actually go to election. Uh, we know that Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the NDP, has asked that the Governor General reconsider uh, calling an election at the Prime Minister's request. But if you look at it, the legality is that the elections law says that uh, the Prime Minister can ask for an election before a fixed election date. Stephen Harper did that once. And also, Elections Canada has said, they're on the record as saying that they do feel that they can conduct a safe election even with uh, the pandemic conditions going on. So it would be very, very unlikely that the, the Governor General would not accede or not grant this request of the Prime Minister. And we're being told that Prime Minister Trudeau will ask, he sets the date, he will ask or request a date uh, of the election for September the 20th. Right, which would, as I mentioned, would be the, uh, the minimum uh, length allowed by law. Uh, then following that, we're going to hear the Prime Minister will go in into Rideau Hall, meet with the Governor General, make that request. Then he comes out, uh, will speak with reporters, take questions from reporters. Uh, what happens then we, we expect to hear in fairly short order following that from all of the other, uh, from the opposition party leaders uh, as they launch the campaigns as well, right? Well, that's right. The Prime Minister will come out here to a podium and his, uh, his uh, first address to journalists here will be the official launch from the Liberal Party's point of view of their campaign. Uh, we also know that Jagmeet Singh, for example, is, is jetting off to uh, Montreal. He wants to attend the, uh, the Pride Parade in Montreal. But as you mentioned, this is day one. This is a crucial day. All of the parties will be weighing in with their first press conference to get the message out. A lot of concern. They don't want to have any missteps on the, on the first day. Where they choose to give their first okay. address and make their first campaign speech is also quite significant they'll be looking for symbolism and about messaging and getting a kickoff to this uh, this campaign all right martin stringer will be hearing uh, from martin again from rita hall in uh, our continuing coverage this morning i'm also joined for our coverage of the election launch this morning by three political commentators susan smith is a liberal commentator ashton arsenal is a conservative commentator and kim wright is an ndp commentator they are with me for our coverage today and it's uh, good to see you all as we head into this snap election campaign susan let me start with you lots of questions about 
the reason for this election now and the timing as Canadians deal with the fourth wave of the pandemic. How will the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, a Liberal Party leader, oh, you'll hear, we, hear him referred to as both now as the campaign gets underway, how does he justify the timing for calling a federal election today? I think what he'll explain to Canadians is that it's about COVID response and COVID recovery. And he'll be asking Canadians for a mandate for uh, to validate the plan that the Liberals have going forward. He'll be comparing and contrasting what he's proposed, what his government's proposed with the other party leaders. You know, 19 months into a campaign, we've had five elections already in this country. Not everybody knows that because we haven't had, you know, unless you live in a province where there's been one. So we can do it. We're in, yes, we're in the fourth wave of the campaign. There's no question, or, or the, of the pandemic, but it's different this time, Peter. People are double vaxxed, or at least many, many, many are single vaxxed for the top country in the G20 with vaccination. Kids are going back to school, people are going back to work, and we need to get the economy going. We need to get the country opening up again and firing on all cylinders, okay. and that's what the Prime Minister is going to be asking people for. Ashton, what are your thoughts about why the Prime Minister wants this election now? Well, it's a political play, pure and simple. I think a lot of people have said that uh, maybe an election isn't the most appropriate thing to be doing right now. I, I do think we are heading towards, unfortunately, a bit of a fourth wave. And as for how this election interacts with uh, the severity of the fourth wave, I think that'll be interesting. And the proof in the pudding will only be there after the fact. But uh, you don't have to go back very far. There were some concerns in Newfoundland about having an election during the uh, during the pandemic. So, look, it's it's fairly clear the prime minister likes where his numbers are. He wants that majority mandate. He wants an additional four years, and he doesn't want to have to deal with the minority parliament. Uh, let's call it for what it is. It's a play for a little bit more power. Uh, Kim Wright, the NDP leader, ha has said the governor general, Mary Simon, we've touched on this, should deny Justin Trudeau's request for an election now. Why do you believe uh, Justin Trudeau is pressing ahead with it? Look, this is entirely an ego trip of the Prime Minister. He has never liked the idea that he's had to work with parliamentarians, either in his own party or across the aisle, uh, so to speak. So he hasn't really, you know, thrown, leaned in and thrown his weight behind working uh, for the benefit of Canadians on this. Jagmeet Singh and the New Democrats have certainly pushed him, whether it's been on increasing the rates on CERB, uh, moving forward on some of the housing initiatives, certainly uh, lots of things that we hear Liberals during campaign time promise we're going to get to daycare and pharmacare and all of these wonderful things. Uh, it never quite gets to them. So. This is one of those things that, to your question and the question everyone is asking, why, why now? Entirely a power grab, entirely an ego trip. I don't know what he's actually going to do, uh, what the prime minister might think he can do in a majority government that he couldn't get done in a minority government when he's got willing opposition leaders that were ready to help Canadians. Okay. Uh, Susan, how big a risk is the prime minister taking by calling this election now when there is uh, so much uncertainty about how bad a fourth wave could get? Every election is a, a risk for every leader, but to my previous colleague's point, or my colleague's point there, on parliamentary co cooperation, yes, there was co cooperation on pandemic measures. Uh, that was unusual, and the Prime Minister did a good job of steering that, and he was the, the Liberals were the government that proposed these measures for Canadians. But in every single office, or every single uh, motion that was a confidence motion in the government, Aaron O'Toole's Conservatives voted against it. So when you, it's, it's, can't be all of one or all of the other. You know, the end, the Conservatives have consistently moved and opposed this government. And so the Prime Minister is saying to Canadians, hey, we need a smooth path for our economic recovery. We feel we've got the best option for you. And, and let's let's take that to Canadians. Okay. But Peter, nobody loves elections except us political nerds. It's a 36-day campaign. They have to start sometime. By the yeah. time Election Day comes on September 20th, People will be talking about the issues. They won't be talking about whether we needed to do it now. Right. I think I think that, that's where we'll get eventually a lot of the conversation today, Ashton, is about uh, the timing issue. And you can expect questions for the Prime Minister about that for sure this morning when reporters talk to him after his meeting with the Governor General around uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, but uh, talk to me about uh, how big a gamble this might be for Justin Trudeau and, and what might go wrong. Well, there's certainly a lot of things that can go wrong. Look, campaigns matter. Uh, anybody that's worked in a political campaign previously will say that, you know, you're only one gaffe away from losing everything that you've worked for. Uh, and elections don't happen overnight. Uh, this was a calculated gamble. 
um, from the Liberal Party. And I think it is fair to say that Aaron O'Toole uh, and the Conservative Party and certainly Jagmeet Singh are going into this campaign as underdogs. If we're to believe where the numbers are right now mm. with respect to polling, the Prime Minister and the Liberal Party is in very, very good shape. But again, that's why campaigns matter. And you never really know what's going to happen. We've got 36 days. It's the shortest amount of writ uh, uh, in terms of uh, the length of the election that we can have. Uh, and I think it's going to be exciting. And I'm really looking forward to watching the leaders sort of compare and contrast each other's messaging uh, this morning. But uh, we're off to the races uh -huh. and it's pretty exciting. Yeah, yes, we are. Kim, a uh, quick comment from you here about uh, how big of a gamble this might be. It absolutely is. I'm sure uh, viewers will remember David Peterson thought he should go early in, in Ontario. The Liberal leader thought he could go early, go to the polls, get a get some extra momentum. And it failed miserably uh, for him. The New Democrats, in fact, took office in Ontario uh, at that time. So there's lots that can happen. There are lots of unknowns that are happening in Canada. We've got wildfires across the country. We've got a housing crisis. There's all sorts of things happening, plus what's happening in Afghanistan, uh, what's happening around the world, what's happening with the two Michaels in China. There are lots of things that can and will go wrong in that 36 days. So while it will be over in a blink of an eye, uh, there's lots of things that can go wrong. And the question will be whether the prime minister would have any time to recover. All right. Uh, lots to uh, cover and we'll be covering lots more. Uh, you're with us for our uh, several hours of coverage this morning. Thanks for that. Uh, we'll be back to you in the next little bit here. Uh, so stay with us. Thanks so much. Uh, look, as the election gets underway, each of the parties and their leaders have a game plan. Uh, we've heard a little bit about that from our party, party commentators. We'll be hearing a lot about those individual narratives as the morning unfolds and the leaders all hold their campaign launches. They've spent months looking at polls and analysis on where they're strong, where they're weak, all with the objective of trying to win power or hold on to power. Let's look at what you can expect to hear from the leaders and why during this election campaign. This is Justin Trudeau's third campaign as Liberal leader and second as Prime Minister. And with a minority government lasting almost two years, he's been building the case that an election is needed now to end efforts by the opposition parties to block his agenda. We have seen a level of obstructionism and, uh, and toxicity in the House that is of real concern. For the Prime Minister, the objective is a return to a majority government. The Liberals upended Canadian politics in 2015 by becoming the first third-place party in Canadian history to win a majority government. But that majority was reduced to a minority in the 2019 vote. In fact, the Liberals lost the popular vote to the Conservatives and Andrew Scheer. For this campaign, the Liberal narrative will play up the government's response to the pandemic and what comes next. The hundreds of billions of dollars spent to keep Canadians safe and prevent economic ruin and the tens of billions more that will be spent to rebuild a stronger, more equitable and greener economy on the other side. We have been over the past many months not just announcing uh, a path through uh, this COVID-19 pandemic, but demonstrating our commitment to building back better and a stronger economy. Eight out of every ten dollars in support to Canadians for this pandemic came from the federal government. We've had people's backs and we will continue. But with the pandemic easing, Canadian voters are also becoming more focused on the need to deal with longer term issues. The failings of the health care system, the treatment of Canada's Indigenous peoples, housing costs and climate change. The Liberals held 155 seats at dissolution. They need 170 seats to form a majority government. And they hope to find more than half of those additional seats by ousting Bloc MPs in the province of Quebec. That explains why the Prime Minister supports the Quebec Premier's proposal to unilaterally change the Constitution to protect the French language and why the government pushed so hard to pass Bill C-10 in the House of Commons to regulate streaming and social media giants. Quebecers see that as a move to protect their culture. The Liberals are also targeting a half dozen seats in Ontario, five more in Atlantic Canada and the Prairies, a half dozen more in tight three-way races in British Columbia, and as many as four seats in the Conservative stronghold of Alberta, where the unpopularity of Premier Jason Kenney may sow the seeds for improved Liberal fortunes. The key to a Liberal majority is convincing progressive voters in those key ridings across the country that the time is right to unite behind one party. 
There isn't a choice between the Liberals, the NDP, the Green and the Bloc Québécois. They're all the same. The Conservatives represent the main opposition for the Liberals. It's the first campaign as party leader for Aaron O'Toole. For O'Toole, the objective is winning government, no doubt. But the Liberals hold commanding leads in Canada's largest urban areas where most of the seats are located and where Conservatives need to pick up support if they hope to form government. But the bottom line is trying to at least hold the Liberals to a minority again and hold the seats the Conservatives already have. The Conservative election narrative will be a shopping list of alleged Liberal failures, a mismanaged pandemic response, mismanaged public finances and a ballooning deficit and debt and personal attacks on Justin Trudeau as well over ethical breaches such as the We Charity controversy and the handling of misconduct allegations against senior military leaders. But the Conservative leader must convince more voters that change is needed and that he is that change. Aaron O'Toole is promising a five-part recovery plan that includes creating one million jobs in year one, creating a domestic vaccine capacity, tougher ethics rules, a mental health action plan, and a balanced budget in 10 years. Let's ensure that we have a government that serves the people as opposed to serving the friends of Justin Trudeau. It's a much more difficult path to victory for Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives. The party's been smashing fundraising records, but... Do you know who this is? Probably not. Aaron O'Toole enters the campaign with a low likability number in the polls, and he isn't well known outside Conservative circles. The Conservatives would have to add another 50 plus seats across the country to form a majority government. But winning more seats means winning over more voters, and polling shows that Conservatives are the second choice of only 11% of Canadians, less than any other party. So where does the Conservative Party hope to win those additional seats? For starters, it would have to scoop up more ridings in seat-rich Ontario, chiefly in the Greater Toronto Area, and in the province of Quebec as well. The polling suggests that's a tall order. Aaron O'Toole's leadership has also caused some internal rifts. Many social Conservatives, some whose votes helped O'Toole win the party leadership, now feel alienated by his efforts to draw more voters from the centre. And by his push to expel Ontario MP and Social Conservative standard bearer Derek Sloan from caucus. O'Toole has also angered many Conservatives, including some caucus members, by suddenly embracing the need to price carbon. Three strikes and you're out, Mr. O'Toole. That hit hard with the party's Western base and even drove some party members to the upstart Maverick Party, raising the prospect of vote splitting on the right. But Aaron O'Toole is hoping some lost votes in the West will be more than offset by policies that could deliver big gains in Ontario and Quebec. Quebec is a separate nation. Quebec will never ask permission to nobody to be a separate nation. This is the second election campaign for Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchet. The Bloc holds the balance of power in the minority parliament along with the NDP. The Bloc holds 32 seats in the House of Commons. Blanchette's mission? Save them all. His narrative will be a familiar Bloc refrain, that only the Bloc will defend the interests of Quebec. The party always does better if the voters in the province feel a threat from the central government in Ottawa or feel ignored by it. But during this pandemic, the Trudeau government has responded to just about every call for help from the Quebec government. And the Liberals have muted many of the bloc attacks by supporting Quebec's bid to unilaterally change the Constitution to protect the French language and also by passing that bill to regulate web giants. If the bloc cannot make the case for its relevance in the lives of Quebecers, it may well lose seats to the Liberals and maybe Conservatives too. Where do the Conservatives stand? Is it going to be the same thing in French and in English? Where do the Liberals stand? They've had six years, and we've seen what their track record is. In Quebec, the NDP has almost nothing left to lose. A decade ago, under Jack Layton, the NDP won the majority of seats in Quebec. Since then, it has seen its seat count in successive elections reduced from 59 to just one. And in this campaign, that single seat in Quebec is also said to be in peril. This will be the second campaign for NDP leader Jagmeet Singh. His objective is to try and build on the 24 seats the NDP won in the last election scattered across Canada, 
losing seats would be a blow to Singh's leadership. The NDP leader is encouraging Canadians to opt for leadership and policies that will rebalance the economy by introducing economic and health care programs funded by higher taxes on wealthier Canadians, a promise to cancel student debt, and a promise to end for-profit long-term care homes. Jagmeet Singh will also be badgering the Liberals on their bold climate promises, but the failure to deliver on them. Singh consistently polls as the most popular federal leader, but his party remains mired around 20% support or less. Expect the NDP campaign to target some Liberal-held ridings, particularly in Toronto, while trying to hold off challenges from Liberals, Conservatives and the Greens in NDP-held ridings across the country. If you want to see universal pharmacare, if you want to see dental care, New Democrats are your only option. We are the ones that are, that are consistently committed to improving our health care system. And we've seen time and time again that neither the Liberals nor the Conservatives, nor frankly the Bloc, care about improving access to these universal social programs. We are a strong voice that is needed in the next parliament. And this is exactly the thing that they're afraid of and the thing that they have gone after in such a cynical and dastardly way. This will be the first campaign as Green Party leader for Anime Paul, the country's first black woman and Jewish woman to lead a national party. And she was almost pushed out of the leadership before the campaign got underway. When she took over as leader in 2020, Paul inherited a Green Party with three MPs, she now presides over a party in turmoil. The objective for this campaign was to take the Greens to official party status in the House of Commons by winning at least a dozen seats. But Paul's leadership's been undermined by internal attempts to oust her from the party following the defection of Jenik Atwin last June. Elected for the party in Fredericton, its first seat in Atlantic Canada, Atwin quit the Greens to go red. She says she joined the Liberals after public infighting among Greens over the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Paul accused the Prime Minister of deliberately working to destabilize her leadership in hopes of converting Green supporters to Liberal voters in tight races where the progressive vote splits resulted in Liberal losses. The Prime Minister is not a feminist. He is not an ally to undermine my leadership at this early stage in such a willful, craven way. That is not the kind of politics that people in Canada should want to see. They should want to see me in Parliament meeting him on the battlefield of ideas, not the shady backroom deals. Paul survived internal efforts to push her out as party leader, but she enters the campaign as the wounded leader of a divided party. This election was called by a Prime Minister looking for a more robust hold on power. He's putting his minority government on the line by betting Canadians will give him a majority in Parliament this time and carte blanche for the next four years. The voters will soon tell us whether the Prime Minister's gamble paid off. All right, Peter Van Dusen along uh, with you as our live coverage continues this morning. This is a shot of Rideau Hall, uh, which you can't see in that shot. You see the uh, main entrance to Rideau Hall where the Prime Minister is expected in the next 40 minutes or so, which you don't see as the throngs of journalists gathered around the outside of that shot, uh, waiting for the Prime Minister's arrival and uh, the launching of Vote 2021, uh, the election campaign expected to be 36 uh, days for a vote on September 20th. Uh, back to my, quickly to my par party commentators here. Um, uh, we've now heard in that uh, report I just presented to you where the parties stand, what kinds of things they're going to talk about. Ashton, let me start with you. Uh, we know the challenges. I've outlined them in that piece that face Aaron O'Toole. How does he crack uh, through those? What kind of a campaign should we expect to see from Aaron O'Toole? Yeah, I think there's actually a really good opportunity today, Peter, because I think your your clips package accurately highlighted one thing. He is still a little bit of an unknown commodity, and uh, I've you know I've been around folks that are obviously on O'Toole's campaign, and you know the one redeeming quality that I hear over and over and over again is that the more you get to know him, the more you like him. Canadians still have a little bit of uh, familiarizing themselves with O'Toole, so today I think he has a tremendous opportunity, and obviously he will be across national television. But I think the the real opportunity for Mr. O'Toole lies in contrasting himself with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. I think you're going to see him lay out his very clear five-point plan today. I think they're going to hammer that home throughout the duration of the election. And I also think he's going to want to make this about trust. Do you trust the Prime Minister? Do you trust the Prime Minister mm -hmm. with the economy?
All right, uh, we'll watch for that as uh, we'll hear from Mr. O'Toole later this morning. Kim Wright, uh, we said it, the sort of uh, challenges, the uh, kind of campaign strategy we think we'll hear from Jagmeet Singh. What's the challenge for him? So Jagmeet Singh is, it's interesting, he's got this uh, spring in his step, he's got campaign, uh, you know, money in the bank, he's got candidates. He doesn't have some of the demons that sort of plagued the early days of the last election campaign. So people are getting to know him. But when he is now transitioning that, be besides being, you know, personable and charming and thoughtful, really showing to Canadians what he could be as prime minister, how he can really represent Canadians and making sure that we're not doing things like continue continuously taking uh, Aboriginal kids to court over settlements, actually getting down to the work of, of, of transforming pharmacare, making sure that uh, people get housing that they need. The pandemic really laid bare a lot of problems we have in this country. Now there's an opportunity to do so much more and so much better, and that's what he's going to get to showcase to Canadians over 36 days. All right, Susan, we also uh, laid out in, in that report the... Uh, uh, the uh, the hopes of the Liberal Party here and the Prime Minister, and that's to, to try and win a majority government. But, but what's what's the challenge going to be for Justin Trudeau? Because the campaigns do matter. And uh, you know what they say, uh, you know, when it comes voting time, it's not so much what you've done uh, for the last however number of years in office, it's what you're going to do for people in the, in the years ahead. So what's the challenge for the Prime Minister? Well, the challenge for the Prime Minister is to keep people on board with him. He's proven. He's got pragmatic, proven, practical leadership. He's steady hand on the tiller for the country and, and showed Canada the kind of government that they needed when the world shut down and the country shut down. And so he will be, his challenge will be to, for Canadians to say, we've still got your back. We have the plan to deal with climate change. We have the plan to deal with reconciliation. We've put the wheels in motion already and you can trust us. He'll be contrasting himself with Aaron O'Toole, who really still can't decide if he's for the, the hard right wing of the Conservative Party or he's trying to broaden the tent, um, you know, look at the vaccine scenario already under Aaron O'Toole, he's flip-flopping in with Jigmeet Singh. It's, you know, the moon, the, star, the sky, the stars, we're going to do it all, is tends to be what the NDP present. And this is where Trudeau's contrast is. We can look after Canadians, but we can do it in a practical, pragmatic and proven way. Well, all right. Uh, thanks. We talked about the moon, the sun, the stars. Uh, it happens to be a sunny day in Ottawa here at Rideau Hall. And, and uh, it's going to be a nice setting as this campaign gets underway. And then it's going to be a frenetic 36 days, as you all know. So we'll be back to you in just a moment. Uh, thanks so much for providing a, a more perspective to us as our coverage goes on. But let's go now to Rideau Hall and my colleague Martin Stringer. Martin. Hello, Peter. I'm joined now by two veteran journalists who have seen quite a few elections come and go. We also have a red fox that's just walked by here, just an aside. But we're joined now by Tom McCharles, who is a veteran political writer and a national reporter for the Toronto Star. And we're also joined by uh, Joël Denis Bellevance, uh, who is the uh, Ottawa bureau chief for La Presse. Now, as I say, if you hear any sounds behind us, it's a people scurrying and looking at a red fox, which is only about 10 feet from us. Anyway, the, uh, the election. You both, as I mentioned, you both have seen elections come and go. This is a very particular election. What are you watching for in this election? I'll start with you, Joey. Denis. Well, I'll be watching for the in intensity of the regional battles, because this would present, I think, one of the more regional battles in, in some uh, years namely in Quebec, in British Columbia, and even in Ontario, we've seen the NEP rise in popular support. So will that prevent the Liberal Party from getting the majority it is seeking in this election? So regional battles with a lot of intensity and also whether premiers of the provinces will get involved in this election like they've been in the past. I think some will have, uh, um, I think, some interest to stay very quiet. Okay. Others maybe to shout a little more on the public place. Okay. Maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be a détente amongst <laughs> What's them. You know? uh, Trudeau needs a détente with the Premier in Quebec and he needs perhaps a détente in Ontario as well because they're really looking to pick up seats. Trudeau is going to a campaign where he has to get 15 yeah. seats at a minimum to get a majority. But look, if he, he ends up after 36 days with where he started that's a huge threat to his own political future yeah. and legacy okay you mentioned a detente with the provinces we have seen the announcement of now eight multi-billion dollar child care agreements we've seen mm -hmm. a, a, a lot of funding but we've seen also all of that pandemic funding that went to the provinces 
are, what are you watching in terms of federal provincial relations in terms of you mentioned it uh, Denis, about how it might relate to whether premiers well, will get involved. Well here's how it relates to um, a federal campaign. So mm -hmm. the government has now struck eight deals with seven provinces and one territory. Yeah. Uh, they need a couple of more Alberta and Ontario to have a pan-Canadian child care framework. But what it becomes is a wedge issue for yeah. the Prime Minister to force the Conservatives out on child care to mm -hmm. say they would uphold these deals which are very popular with families or uh, replace them with a substantive program. Not just choices in child care handing out checks to parents because that does not say all the activists create spaces so it, you know every federal provincial issue is potentially a wedge issue isn't absolutely. it absolutely uh, and Tana was mentioning the daycare deals that Ottawa signed with some provinces the remaining provinces are being led by conservative premiers yeah. Yeah. Jason Kinney in Alberta Doug Ford in, in uh, Ontario and Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick so it has the potential to be a very yeah. big wedge issue between the Liberals and the Conservatives nationally mm -hmm. uh, because of the uh, kind of uh, situation we have. The answer to this question seems obvious, but it isn't always. The pandemic, how will it figure in this election? Not just in terms of whether they can have a safe election, but the Prime Minister's approval ratings are the highest in terms of how he's handled the pandemic as opposed to other issues. How much are the Liberals going to run on the pandemic and how much are they going to run it on even the latest measures that have been announced? Well, I'm told that they're going to run uh, for sure. They're going to point to their record, but they're not just going to say, look at what we've done they're going to look forward and to say, and to say we need an election now because we need a majority now because we need to do these bold things and the things they keep pointing to are more measures on yeah. uh, climate change and economic recovery so yeah they've already spent 350 billion and they've already told us they're going to spend that much and they're going to spend another 100 billion so where are the details on the 100 billion they plan to spend in the next three years in election, yeah in election campaign you know you never get people to say what have you done for me lately yeah. it's also always, always what will you do me right. for me uh, yes. in the future and um, i would argue that it, because of the pandemic the mood of the electorate will be very unpredictable yes yeah. the liberals are ahead in the polls but uh, will how big will be the level of engagement of voters in the first two weeks. I think they'll be, be very engaged after Labor Day when we'll have the two debates by the Commission. Except that because of a pandemic election and advanced ballots and mail-in ballots will uh, be coming in, the first two weeks actually do count in terms of the national yeah, message. So the air war is really important in the first couple of weeks, but the ground war, uh, the ground game of all parties to get those fights in those 15 ridings that the government wants to take, that's going to be where the last of the campaign really plays out. The big question, though, has to be, or one of the big questions has to be, anger over having election. Um, a lot of a lot of Canadians can live with election, but a lot of Canadians are concerned about having election as we head into a fourth wave. What do you make of it? That's regional, I think. Look, I just got back from a month in the Atlantic provinces in Newfoundland and Labrador, where there were no COVID cases and everyone's relaxed, and there's an absolute joy at being back at what felt like 2018. Yeah. So I think that's very different region by region. Like Ontario, coming back to Ontario felt, oh my God, we're like we're all back masked up today, outdoors. <laughs> Yeah. It feels very, people feel apprehensive, and so I think that's a regional thing. Yeah, it is, but also uh, some people have been pointing to the David Peterson election of 1990. David Peterson called a premature election, he lost. But you could also point to 1974 when the father of Justin Trudeau, Pierre Trudeau, called an election in the middle of summer and won a majority afterwards. So will the Mr. Trudeau repeat his father's history mm -hmm. uh, will know uh, by the end of September. A lot of people watched the election in British Columbia when John Horgan, Premier John Horgan, called an election last year, and there was a lot of anger. The polls were showing a lot of uh, electorate uh, voters' anger, but within three weeks that had dissipated. Uh, what was a, absolutely a red hot anger, but it dissipated. It, what do you, you think? got about? a majority, right? And um, incumbent governments have gotten majorities through this pandemic. Scott Moe got a majority. Blaine Higgs got a majority. You know, like Joel Denise said, we'll see what happens in Nova Scotia, right? But mm -hmm. um, no, I think, uh, you know, the potential is there still for uh, voters to sort of set that aside and, and look ahead. If this the one question the Prime Minister needs to answer and has, you know, a proper narrative to convince people is why have an election now? now? Yeah. Why now? Yeah. And he's got to have a good answer, otherwise this will probably be the dominant issue in the first two, two, three days of the election. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, thank you, uh, thank you both. Thank you very much for weighing in. Thanks, and have a good election campaign. Yeah, you, you too. too. Have fun. <laughs> Peter, I've been in discussion with uh, Tonda McCharles, who is a veteran reporter and national and parliamentary reporter for the Toronto Star, and Joe Denis Bellavance, who's the Ottawa bureau chief for La Presse. Back to you, Peter. All right, thanks, uh, Martin Stringer. We'll continue to keep an eye on Rideau Hall, where we expect the arrival uh, soon, uh, in the next, uh, as early as the next 10 or 15 minutes of the Prime Minister, for a 10 o'clock rendezvous with the Governor General to officially 
uh, ask her to dissolve uh, the 43rd Parliament and uh, call an election campaign for September 20th is the date we're expecting to hear after a 36-day campaign. Uh, throughout our election coverage, um, we'll put Canadians at the centre of the conversation, as we always do here at CPAC. Uh, we've been out across the country uh, asking Canadians uh, how they feel about uh, the election timing, the election issues, the leaders, uh, the vision from the party. Um, let's hear what some of them are saying. Do you want a federal election right now? Not right now. I think people have had enough of everything. People just need to get back to a little bit of normal. And I don't think we need to uh, put signs everywhere. Absolutely. We need to make some big changes in our federal government. I'm not sure that the result is going to be that different to what we have now. Uh, it, it might be a minority government on the other side. Uh, I, I don't think you're going to get a huge majority either way. I would say with the way Canada's moving right now, especially during the pandemic, the way things have been dealt with, I do believe there's a change to be made. Um, I don't think Canada was ready for the pandemic at all and the fact that it's taken this long for us to get this many people vaccinated. Obviously, there's uh, a little lack of leadership there. I haven't put any thought into it. Um, I don't feel the need for, like I personally, I, I'm not like, don't feel that I need to vote for a new party right now. No. I don't know. I just don't feel like uh, I don't feel like it's the right time. I know that sounds. We're just coming out of a pandemic, and I don't think anyone wants to deal with it. No, no, I would not. No, it's like paying for branding over and over. No, we're no, we're tired. We could use a break from lots of things. That's one. It's just not the time to spend money on politics. It's time to spend money on the pandemic, on the indigenous problems on straightening out the country. Personally, I don't think we really need one, but, um, you know, it's a democratic uh, issue, democratic right, so we sort of have to uh, exercise that every four years or so, and it sure beats the alternative of uh, non-democratic and uh, dictatorship and military government and that type of thing. So, you know, uh, it has to happen. Uh, whether I want it or not, it's gonna happen. Not really. And why is that? Because we're just out of a mess. Let's take a deep breath and just enjoy the way it is now. And I think the government, whoever was leading it, has done a good job provincially, federally. Let's just enjoy uh, the next few months and uh, quietly take care of ourselves and our families. All right, here, live shot again of uh, Rideau Hall as we await the arrival of the Prime Minister to uh, kick off uh, the uh, 2021 election campaign in this country. Uh, we'll have that for you as soon as he arrives there. But over the course of the campaign, uh, we'll be checking in with pollster David Coletto from Abacus Data to get a sense of where voter support is and how it might be changing during the campaign, what the key issues are for voters and how the parties are promising to deal with those issues. Let's hear from him now. David, it's good to see you again and uh, looking forward to uh, getting your insights and analysis during the campaign. Thanks for being with us today. Let's start with your latest survey numbers. Who did you survey and how? What do we need to know about this survey? So good to see you, Peter. We did a large survey of uh, 3,000 Canadian adults. We did it from August uh, second, sorry, August 6th to the 11th. And uh, so with a large sample like that, we could look at some, some really interesting regional and demographic differences. But this is our first kind of benchmark survey uh, before the campaign kicks off. All right, let's go through it. There have been lots of questions about the timing of this election call and whether voters will punish Justin Trudeau for sending them to the polls uh, at this time in Canada. What does your latest survey tell us about that? Well, what we know is most people don't want an election, but the question is, will they, as you said, will they punish them? And we found that actually, you know, a small minority, 17%, tell us that if, you know, well, not if, now that the, the, the election's been called, Will that change your vote? Will you be upset with Mr. Trudeau? And only 17% say uh, it will. Now, for, for a plurality of everybody else, they say, yeah, I prefer not to have this election, but it's not going to change my vote. In fact, 38% actually say, well, I, if I have this choice, um, I'd like to help choose the next government as we go forward. So there's going to be some Canadians out there who are, you know, again, Maybe they don't love the fact that we have an election, but they do appreciate the opportunity to choose their government. So I don't anticipate we're going to see too big of a backlash from this 
in this early election call. All right. So the timing of the election call may not uh, be this major blowback for the prime minister, but you also asked what if there's a fourth wave of COVID-19 during the campaign. And many experts believe that the wave started, we're in it. Uh, the question is how bad uh, will it get? But you asked about the fourth wave and election timing. What did you find there? Similar number of people say, you know, they'll be upset if there is a fourth wave, they're going to hold it against the prime minister, change, you know, they wouldn't let them vote for him. 20% feel that way. But again, everybody else says um, it wouldn't have any impact on their vote or a small minority, 14% say, well, actually, um, I'd be more likely to vote Liberal in that case because of how well they feel they've handled the pandemic to this point. So again, you know, again, the extent to which how big that fourth wave might be, how bad it, it turns out, we're all hoping it, you know, there's no big impact. Um, the early indication is that that people at least are entering this campaign knowing there's there's a risk of it, mm -hmm. but that for most it's not going to impact how they vote or, or make them upset with the prime minister for doing this. Let's talk about the mood of the country. Uh, what, what Canadians are feeling after, look, what's been a, a tumultuous couple of years since the last election. Uh, what are they saying about the direction of the country? Well, I haven't seen a number this high in over five years where we've got almost half the country, 46 percent, saying they feel that Canada's headed in the right direction. You only have to go back to April, and that number was only around 32%. So in a very short period of time, our mood is lifted. You know, most of us have been double vaxxed. Uh, it's summer in Canada, a little more relaxed, more back to normal, um, and so the mood's good. But at the same time, we also asked, how do you think things are going in the United States? Mm -hmm. And we'd seen an increase in that number over a long period of time, but over the last few weeks, that number has dropped quite a bit. So people are looking to the South, particularly like states like Florida, and seeing the high case numbers and saying, well, maybe that country's not headed in the right direction. We feel still pretty good about it. And so if you're an incumbent government calling an election, you want to do it when the country's feeling good. And again, I haven't seen numbers this good for, for many years. Let, let, let's, let's carry that out a bit. So what about the level of approval of the Trudeau government? What, what are the voters saying? So 45% of Canadians approve of the government's approval overall, not just with its handling of, of the pandemic. 37% disapprove. Um, if we want to just go back to 2019, right before the last federal election, these numbers were almost reversed. You had more people disapproving of the government than approving. So again, another indicator that the Liberals are entering this campaign in a stronger position than they were in 2019, an election that they lost their majority but still won the most seats. Let's travel that uh, uh, um, analysis a little bit as well. One, one of the key measures you and I always talk about, we always watch around election time, is uh, you know what we call the desire for change. Uh, are voters fed up with the governing party, or do they have a strong desire for something new? What, what are we seeing in this survey? Well, first, there's, there are a majority, more than a majority of, of people, not more than a majority, almost 60% plus, who say they'd like to see a change in government. But the difference this time is the number who say they definitely want change. Those who are, you know, just, just really dislike this government and want to see it replaced is down. Now, it's been creeping up over the last few weeks. It's at 43% today. But if we compare that again to the end of the last federal election, it was at 52 points. So that nine point difference between the end of the campaign in 2019 and where we start this campaign is a key indicator, right? The anger against this government's not, not as strong. And those who'd like to see it reelected is actually a little bit higher, which I think explains when we get to it, um, where the horse race is, that the, 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 this liberal government is not facing as angry an electorate, uh, an electorate that wants wanted to see it removed from office as it did uh, just under two years ago. Yeah, well, we'll get to those. Everybody wants to know the horse race numbers. We'll get to those. But it's important, I think, to have this, uh, this, you know, this understanding of what the horse race numbers mean by looking at all these other uh, measurements you've taken to, to get us to the, to the sort of horse race numbers, and they're, they're coming right up. But uh, let's talk about the leaders and what Canadians are feeling about them. Let's start with Justin Trudeau. As we enter the campaign, how is he being viewed by Canadians? Well, Mr. Trudeau's numbers have, have held pretty steady now for over a year, with about equal numbers viewing him positively uh, and negatively. We've got 41% who view him positively, 39% negatively. That number, again, hasn't changed within about two points for a very long time, right? Because people know this prime minister. Um, his, his numbers improved over the course of the pandemic. They've, they've stayed higher than they were headed into the last election. Um, but again, the prime minister, if, if at this point you, you don't have a view of him, um, you haven't been paying attention for the last six years. So Canadians know their prime minister really well, and and he's a fairly polarizing figure. Sign, you know, significant numbers like him, 
significant numbers dislike him. And, and to watch who, uh, you know, who the campaigns target, I, I always find this, you know, fascinating and very interesting is, is where, you know, where do, it, it, where, where the support is, you know, where does it come from? It's important to know that, I think, in terms of the performance of a leader. So where's, where's Justin Trudeau finding his strongest support? Which groups? Well, we find that, that he's, you know, his, his, his numbers are fairly spread out across the country or, or across different age groups. But we do see that in Atlantic Canada, um, in Ontario, among those who self-identify as a racialized, a member of a racialized community, we see much higher positives for Mr. Trudeau as we do among women. So those would be natural places where the prime minister finds more goodwill than he does in other parts of the country or among other groups. But as I said, he's popular among his own party supporters, usually mm -hmm. the party leaders are. Um, and he also has an opportunity among those who right now don't support the Liberals but are open to doing it. So again, Mr. Trudeau finds himself in a stronger position going into this campaign than he did back in 2019. Let's talk about Aaron O'Toole. Uh, impressions of Aaron O'Toole, the Conservative leader, what are you finding? Well, we find a, a challenging um, situation for the, for the Conservative leader. He has almost double the number of people who have a negative view of him at 41% than have a positive view. And that's been the case for Mr. O'Toole for quite some time. Now, on the positive side for him, if there is a positive to that, is there's still a large number of people who say, I don't really have a view of him or I have a neutral view. So he has an opportunity over the course of this campaign um, to introduce himself to many Canadians who don't know him very well. But his challenge is one in which um, he's got almost, he's got higher negatives than the prime minister, half as many positives as, as the prime minister or even Mr. Singh, as we'll, we'll talk about in a minute, and so he's got a very short period of time in which he's got to at least convince um, some of those who have a negative view of him that he's not as bad as they think. And that's not always easy to do in a short campaign when, when you're going to be you know, uh, targeted by your opponents and others in this campaign and, and questions about whether you're, you're ready to be prime minister as an alternative to Mr. Trudeau. All right, you touched on Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader. What do Canadians think of him as the campaign gets underway? Well, Mr. Singh, I think, is the real wild card, and that is because he would come into this campaign as the most popular leader in terms of his net favorables. Um, you know, 40 percent have a positive view of him, 24 negative. That's a plus 16. That's that's better than Mr. Trudeau. Um, and that's as good as Mr. Singh has had in a long time and better than when he entered the last campaign. So he's coming into this campaign more of a known quantity and somebody who finds a lot of support among um, young people, plus 37, among women, mm -hmm. and among particularly in his now home province where he represents the riding in British Columbia. So those are natural places for Mr. Singh. And uh, he's wildly popular among his own party, and a lot of liberals like him. So, you know, this is a place that is, is there going to be a really interesting um, period of time to watch how Mr. Singh performs and, and whether this goodwill translates into more support for the New Democrats. Right, because, because of, you know, I mean, uh, watching the dynamics of a campaign, the more you know, the more popular Jagmeet Singh is, the the less um, the less happy I guess liberals are because you know that that might hold some of that progressive support that the liberals are hoping to draw away from the New Democrats. So lots of interesting things could happen here during the campaign, depending on how Mr. Singh performs and uh, how Canadians feel about him as we go along. So, okay, let's move now to the latest numbers on voter intentions. What are we seeing now? These are what we call the the horse race numbers. Where are we? Well, the horse race numbers show uh, a liberal advantage. They've got a nine-point lead over the Conservatives. Uh, nationally, we have 37 for the Liberals, uh, 28 for the Conservatives, and 20 for the New Democrats. The bloc um, nationally is at 5%. They're at 22. We'll, we'll talk about the regional numbers in a minute in Quebec. And the Greens are at 5% nationally as well. And if we look at the trend line on this, the Liberals have been at 37 now for, for four straight waves of our research. The Conservatives had actually dipped quite a bit over the last few months. Uh, a little uptick for them over the past few weeks, and the NDP holding fairly steady around 20%. So the Liberals entered this campaign nine points ahead in our polling. Um, they entered the last federal election four points behind the Conservatives. So another indicator, you're the Prime Minister, today you're going to see the Governor General. Why did you do it? Well, this, this number is one of many that says, you know, it's, it's a better time than probably they've ever had uh, to, to try to go after that majority government. All right. V viewers want to know what's happening where they live. So how does that vote intention break down by province or, or region in Canada? So let's, let's start in the West. And in, in British Columbia, I think, is going to be a key battleground in this campaign. Uh, lots of three-way races in the lower mainland and even on 
Vancouver Island, and, and we, saw, we see the Liberals doing quite well. Um, they've got a seven-point lead over the New Democrats, 36 percent to 29, with the Conservatives not too far behind um, the, 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 the New Democrats, but at 26 percent, that is substantially lower than they had in the last election, where, you know, recall the Conservatives actually won the popular vote in British Columbia. We go east to, to the prairies in Alberta, um, you know, at 46 percent, the Conservatives are still well ahead of the two other parties, but uh, they got 64 um, percent, or were close to it, if I recall, in the last federal election. So this has been a, a big shift. Will it have a big impact on the number of seats they win? Probably not. But the People's Party of Canada is polling at 7 percent. The, the Maverick Party at 1 percent hasn't yet made a big dent. But the Conservatives are really competing against two other more conservative or, or um, you know, conservative parties that they didn't really have to deal with. Um, well, they did uh, with Ms. Mr. Bernier's party in 2019, but it, they seem to have a little more energy right now. Um, in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, similar story. The, the, the Conservatives are ahead, although the Liberals are doing, if you look at the Manitoba numbers in particular, quite well in Manitoba. Saskatchewan's uh, still a very strong place for the Conservatives. Um, in Ontario, mm -hmm. which has been the case for a while, we find the Liberals well ahead. They've got a 13-point lead over the Conservatives, 41% to 28 the NDP at 22. Um, so that's a really strong position for, for vote-rich and seat-rich Ontario for the Liberals. In Quebec, some interesting potential dynamics appearing. Uh, we've got the block at 22, um, uh, 15 points behind the Liberals. Now, that's a slight decline, Peter, for the block over the last few weeks. We'll see whether that trend holds. Um, but I think Quebec's going to be critical for the Liberals um, if, they, if they're going to want to win that majority. And then lastly, Atlantic Canada has been a strong... Uh, region for the Liberals for the last two elections. Um, they, they, they swept in 2015. They almost swept again in 2019. And we see, you know, them with almost half the vote in that region with the Conservatives and the, the uh, New Democrats vying for, for second place there. So, you know, overall, good regional numbers for the Liberals in the places they need to do well. Does it turn into a majority? You know, I think it's maybe 50-50 with these kind of numbers, right. but they're getting pretty close to that, that threshold. Okay, just a couple of things to cover. Let's finish on preferred outcomes. What did you find when you asked Canadians what election outcome they hope to see? Well, we gave them only two real choices. Imagine you could have a liberal government or a conservative government in which version, a majority or minority. And we found that over six out of ten people, when forced to choose, again, a lot of New Democrat supporters, Green supporters, Bloc supporters, would rather not have you know, uh, in an ideal case, a liberal government. Sure. But if they only had those two options, 64% would choose a liberal government, including 36 who want a liberal majority. Uh, 27 want a liberal minority. And on the other hand, 38% of Canadians want the Conservatives to win some form of government, with 26% wanting a majority and 12% wanting uh, a minority. And I think it's important just, just quickly to, to mention that, you know, among New Democrat supporters, if we're talking about one of the things the Liberals are going to try to do, as you mentioned, bring right. some of those New Democrats into the fold, New Democrats are much more likely to want a liberal government. Um, but when we ask people who they think they're going to, who's going to win the election, um, almost half now think the Liberals are going to win, and only one out of five think the Conservatives. So people believe the Liberals are going to win this election as it starts, and they prefer a liberal government. So um, mm. I think that's going to have an impact on the dynamics of this campaign. All right, finish on this. Uh, given these numbers, uh, what's the upshot, and and what do you think we need to watch for as the campaign unfolds? I think quickly, you know, the Liberals have a clear advantage. You, you name the, the, the number I shared, and you can see they're in a better place today than they were in 2019. Um, there's a few wild cards, though. Mr. Singh's popularity is something to watch. Uh, people like him. Will they vote for him? Will they switch their votes? It's something we'll watch for. Mr. O'Toole starts in a weaker position than Mr. Scheer did back in 2019, but there's a lot of people who don't know who he is. So can he um, introduce himself? Ultimately, there's a lot of, lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty. Does the fourth wave really materialize and have an impact on the conversation? We're not really clear what this ballot question is going to be. What's this election about? Mm -hmm. And so there's still, as we've seen in the number of campaigns we've done together, Peter, um, lots, of, lots of uncertainty and, a lot, and campaigns matter. So liberals start in the lead, but we've seen in the past that doesn't mean they're going to end there. So we'll, we'll keep watching this together. All right. Thanks for walking us through the numbers and uh, providing that analysis, David Coletto. And uh, we will talk again uh, surely soon as the campaign unfolds. But uh, thanks for your time today, David. Take care. Thanks, Peter. Take care.
And live shot again, uh, Rideau Hall, as we await the arrival of the Prime Minister in the next couple of minutes. Uh, we are told for a 10 o'clock meeting with the uh, Governor General, Mary Simon, to ask her, uh, formally ask her to dissolve Parliament and uh, trigger um, an election for September 20th. We expect the date will be a 36 day campaign. Uh, so as soon as we see, uh, to understand what's happening, the Prime Minister and his family live at Rideau Cottage. It's, it's on the property of Rideau Hall, so uh, we'll, it's, it's not a long way to go. Uh, to come to Rideau Hall and meet the Governor General. So when we see that shot, we'll put that up for you and we expect that in the next few minutes. Back to my uh, panel of party commentators who are with us for our coverage this morning. And uh, Kim Wright, let me start with you. We he heard the numbers now from David Coletto. So uh, let me ask you this question. I mean, things will change during the campaign, but how do New Democrats uh, want to frame the campaign? What, I mean, if you can, what, what do you think the ballot box question has to be by the end of this campaign for Canadians? It really does boil down to this whole ready for better, which is the platform uh, name. And we all like slogans, so that's always the fun part of it. But it really is about, yeah, there's things that are happening in Canada, but it can be so much better. There are ways in which we can go about this, having, the, having all of the things from clean drinking water to actual housing. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that are on the table. So Jagmeet Singh is uh, really positioning this, and uh, I suspect we'll hear more about this this morning. Yeah, there are people who took a look at him last uh, last election and, and went with the went with the Liberals and the tr the Trudeau government. So they're having a little bit of what I like to call diner's remorse on that menu. And uh, so now they're looking at this. They're going back and saying, okay. These guys now have their footing under them. Jigmeet Singh and the New Democrats have their footing under them. They actually are showing what they could do, what this could be, what a better Canada could look like. And you're going to see a lot of that narrative uh, over the next 36 days, for sure. Uh, Susan, uh, we've, we've touched on some of this, but let's let's come back to it. What, what, uh, what do Liberals, what does the Prime Minister, the Liberal Party leader, want to frame this camp? How does he want to frame it? What does he want the ballot box question to be? I think it's COVID response, and it's the response that his government provided for Canadians at the height of the pandemic, and the response that his government is going to provide for Canadians for digging us out of the pandemic. And that's the contrast, and, and that's the advantage that the Prime Minister has. He's the one that was standing in front of the microphone every day in that freezing cold winter. He's the one that, uh, that had the backs of Canadians. It's his government that put forward the CERB, the wage subsidy, the rent subsidy. And, and help unite the provinces in a COVID response. And that's the advantage that the Prime Minister has, and that's what he will say going forward. He says he will be saying to, Can to, to Canadians, I made Canada work well during this pandemic response. We will make Canada work even better. We'll build back even better when it comes to COVID rec recovery. All right, Ashton, uh, how, how do, does Mr. O'Toole want to frame this campaign and the ballot box question for Canadians? Yeah, I think I think the, the big issue number one is is trust. Who do you believe is best to secure Canada's economic future? Uh, I think to Susan's point, uh, everybody agrees that uh, supports did need to be rolled out during the pandemic. I think we're now talking about a point where okay, well, what comes next? So the prime minister and the governing liberals have spent 350 billion dollars. As Tony McCharles said, they've already promised 100 billion more. Uh, with no real clarity on how that money is going to be spent. And of course, they've extended all of the COVID supports until conveniently after the election. And if you've been following government spending for the last week and a half, when everybody said, oh, an election isn't coming, although we all knew it was coming, they've been spending hand over foot for as many days as you know they're allowed to. So uh, I, what I think it's actually going to come down to is who do you believe is best positioned to secure Canada's economic future? And if that is the ballot box question on election day, the Liberals will be in trouble. All right, Kim, what's, what's your response to that? Well, look, there's always a lot of election promises, pre-election campaign, right, and, you know, promising a bunch of checks, but all of them are dependent on somebody getting re-elected or something, you know, two, three, five, six years down the road. At the end of the day, what we have seen time and again with this government is a lot of pretty words, a lot of great promises, a lot of theatrics, the Prime Minister taking a knee on Parliament Hill around Black Lives Matter, but there hasn't been things that have been done about it. So talk is great, and as they say in my favourite musical, Hamilton, you know, campaign is easy, governing is harder. And the Prime Minister has not shown that he is uh, ready to continue to govern. There needs to be some new blood in this, and how do we make, forward, make this go forward? Because 
because Canadians actually need to get on with living their lives and in a way where we're not always worried about how is the government going to continue to ham fist us in this. And yes, the vaccine rollouts have gone forward, but they have it for a lot of people, in, in, especially in racialized communities. Those who don't have actually access to the internet talk about a problem that a problem that continues to surface. And if it wasn't for places like Vaccine Hunters Canada, most of us on this panel wouldn't have gotten our, our vaccine uh, in the way that we did. This was not the government. This was others coming forward. So there's a lot of explaining to do for the right. Prime Minister. Uh, Susan, we've seen, uh, Kim touched on it, we've, we've seen in, in the last couple of weeks and even before that, uh, federal ministers, including the Prime Minister, rolling out billions of dollars in promised new spending, signing uh, child care deals with a, a number of different provinces. Um, should we should we demand and expect in the campaign uh, to have more details about what building back better, which has been the prime minister's uh, promise for a post pandemic Canada, more details about exactly what that looks like in greater detail? Absolutely. And I think they should demand it of the liberals and they should demand it of the conservatives and they definitely should demand it of the NDP. We need to know what it's going to cost and what it's going to entail to, to do these things. Um, uh, there are a lot, that's true, there are a lot of promises that fly around during a campaign. The Liberals have proven that they can deliver on them child care, seven or eight child care agreements that have been signed already. The holdouts are Conservative provinces. That's going to hurt the Conservative Party. But absolutely, do the costing, do the numbers, uh, show who has a practical, pragmatic and proven uh, approach for digging us out of this economic uh, this economic situation that is the result of the global pandemic that nobody had any control over when it hit us, but who's got the path, who's got the steady hand and the tiller? And I like that as a ballot question. Uh, Ashton, uh, what what sort of, I mean, let, let's talk about those childcare deals in particular. A lot of those were with uh, conservative premiers and conservative governments. Uh, what would Mr. O'Toole do with the childcare deals? That's actually a really great question. And in terms of a detailed plan, I think you can expect one from the Conservatives very, very soon, uh, simply because we are in a situation, well, we don't know for sure just yet, but we all think it's going to be a 36-day campaign. So I think you can ex uh, expect a very large expansion on uh, the Secure the Future platform that O'Toole has been sort of leaking one day after the other. Now, with respect to child care, look, there's a couple of provinces that still haven't signed on. You're absolutely correct that some conservative premiers have uh, you know, taken the hand that the federal government has extended, and it's their prerogative to do so. At the end of the day, they're responsible for governing within their own provinces, and they have to respond to their electorate and their voters. But here's the difference between conservatives and liberals when it comes to child care. If you're a liberal, you have no choice, and the government program is what is there for you. End of story. Under the conservatives, we believe that parents should have additional choice, more choice, so that they can do what they want with their children, and it's not forced on you by the government. That's the difference between the conservative and liberal plan. Let's talk a little bit about the, we're still, as I say, standing by for the Prime Minister's arrival. It's now a little bit after 10 o'clock Eastern time. Uh, he's supposed to be in there by now, but a couple of minutes late, so we're, we're keeping an eye on it. We'll expect to see a bit of a flurry of activity as he walks across from uh, Rideau Cottage on the grounds of Rideau Hall. But I want to talk a little bit, we, we touched on it earlier, a bit, about uh, ad wars uh, being underway and then the ground game as we get into the campaign. Uh, some of the ads are out. Uh, I want. I want to show you a liberal ad now, and I'm going to show you a conservative ad that's out as well. We'll, we'll talk about those as, as we stand by for the Prime Minister. Here's the, uh, the first offering, I think, out of the gate from the Liberals. In Canada, we have each other's backs. We always have. And though vast lands and mountain ranges separate us from each other, we know the best way to overcome great challenges is to work together. This is a big country with big ideas. We build stronger, think bigger, work smarter, and push ourselves harder than any other place on Earth. We speak our minds and we listen to each other. And while we may not agree on everything, we find a way to work things out. That's what Canadians do when we get knocked down. We pull together to make things better and leave no one behind. That's the Canada I know and the Canada I fight for each and every day. So let's think even bigger, Canada. Let's be relentless, and let's keep moving forward for everyone. Okay, so that's the latest, uh, the ad out of the gate here, setting the tone for the campaign, I guess, from the Liberal side. Kim, uh, how effective is it? 
Look, it, it sounds great. It looks slick as always, but like I, I saw in there, the, he took a knee. But what have we done? What is happening with the RCMP? What is happening with our military uh, on sexual assault pr problems that have plagued the Canadian military leadership the entirety of the time that the prime minister has been in power? It's great. It sounds aspirational. Although I always watch ads on mute. That's the first place I start. So again, it looks like a lot of optics, but doesn't say a whole lot. Ashton, how effective is that ad? Uh, similar trope, uh, really amazing images, uh, top-notch production quality, as you might expect. Uh, the Prime Minister looking very good, um, just filled with vacuous words that said approximately nothing. Now, if you listen to the audio again, <laughs> all of those words sound fantastic, but what is he actually going to do and what has he actually done? I don't know. I couldn't figure it out from that ad. All right, let me show you. You know, we have access to different shots. <laughs> Hang on, Susan, I'm going to come to you. We just have access to different shots. I'm going to swing away from this shot. There's a walking shot uh, to, to our control room here. Uh, if we can throw that up for a second, uh, just to put you in the moment, uh, this is the camera crew getting in, into, you know, there, there's a lot of planning around these kinds of uh, election launch, launch events. This is the camera crew uh, down at Rideau Hall getting into position for the walk up to Rideau Hall from the Prime Minister, which tells you we're getting close. Uh, I just want to see what happens at the end of it. Uh, as we get to the end of this, are we actually uh, going to see the Prime Minister starting that walk? Uh, so we'll leave this shot up as we continue our conversation, just to you know, show our viewers what we're seeing uh, behind the scenes as uh, we get into position for the walk up. So that gives you an idea. I've been watching this for a minute or so. Uh, so the walk's going to be at least that long coming back in the other direction. Uh, okay, Susan, weigh in. Uh, you heard what your colleagues have to say about the effectiveness of that Liberal ad. Uh, what do you say? Sure. I, I like that ad, Peter. I think it's in, it's uplifting and it's inspirational for Canadians, and that's what leadership needs to do. I, I'm hoping you're going to you're going to post the uh, conservative ad from Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. It's coming, it's coming uh, up next. Endorsed by Aaron O'Toole. So to me, that's a stark <laughs> contrast of the kind of leadership you can expect. Uh, the Prime Minister, I think that ad is great. It shows him interacting with Canadians, leading Canadians, unifying Canadians, inspiring Canadians. Uh, we've been through a super tough time as a country. And uh, for once, it, our country has worked really well uh, over a sustained period of time. Our premiers cooperating with one another, getting vaccines into the arms of Canadians, leading the G20 in terms of vaccinated Canadians having the vaccine Canadians for support. So that's what that campaign, that's what that ad did. I think it was fantastic. And I look forward to hearing my my colleagues' uh, comments on the Conservative ad, uh, which is, in my opinion, okay. and I'll share with you again, pretty juvenile. Let me, uh, let's go there. Uh, here's the, uh, <laughs> the the ad that our group has been talking about, uh, the Willy Wonka chocolate, chocolate factory ad, as it's already become known. It came out a couple of days ago. Let's have a look at it. Here we go again. Daddy will get you a golden goose as soon as we get home. No, I want one of those. I want a party with roomfuls of laughter. 10,000 tons of ice cream. I want the works. I want the whole works. Presents and prizes and sweets and surprises of all shapes and sizes. And now, don't care. Okay, that's the ad from the Conservative Party. Uh, already, uh, you, you know, for the, you understand that your critics will attack your ads, but this is being attacked from inside the Conservative Party as well, by uh, including a number of MPs who called it juvenile and amateurish <laughs> and want to know who's responsible for it. Ashton, uh, you get to go first. Uh, what about this ad? Uh, that's really fair. I think that B-real footage of uh, folks walking uh, down the Rita Hall pathway should have been narrated by uh, David Attenborough. <laughs> but uh, I will address this ad. I think it did uh, two things. So first of all, not my favorite. Second, uh, definitely got people talking, uh, perhaps not for the right reasons, but maybe history will look on that differently. Uh, and the last thing I can really say about this ad is that it was posted to a Twitter account. It's not going to have a national rollout schedule. You won't be watching it on TV during uh, hockey games um, or what have you. And I think uh, they floated a trial balloon that didn't make it that high. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it, it comes out on social media, but look where it is in the last couple of days. It's on all, yeah. every mainstream media as well uh, for, I guess, what conservatives feel would be the all the wrong reasons. So, uh, 
it's still out there, Ashton. I mean, it, it may have been a social media play, but uh, what effect do you think it's had uh, early days of the campaign here on on, on the Anytime conversation? Anytime you post something online, you know, it's it's going to be around forever, and uh, folks can try to delete that as much as they want. But uh, I, look, I do think that uh, well, I'm certainly glad that that ad didn't go up during the you know formal writ period of the election. I think. Uh, it was an attempt at humor uh, that overlooked uh, some things that Canadians actually want to see for the party, some things that uh, I know uh, Mr. O'Toole is going to present later this morning. Uh, and I think uh, once he has a chance to speak to Canadians directly, um, okay. that little piece of, uh, of fun will be in the rearview mirror. Let's show you the front door of Rideau Cottage, because in the next few moments, uh, we expect the Prime Minister to come walking at that door, accompanied by... His, uh, his spouse, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, uh, his children, Ella Grace, Xavier, and Hadrian, and they, as a family, will be making the walk up to Rideau Hall. Uh, Susan, weigh in on this conservative ad. Uh, it's a problem for Minister, Mr. O'Toole. Uh, if this is what the leadership of his campaign uh, thinks is good strategy, if this is what he thinks is good strategy as leader, he's got people in there that are making decisions that think this is a good plan that's going to show him in a, a serious light. Uh, I'm all for it. Like, keep doing it. That's great. But uh, I, I think they're going to regret that one. Um, I suspect there's a person or two, to, two who may not be in their job. Big mistake for the Conservatives starting out that way. Shows the mentality and perhaps the level of maturity and the depth that's there from a campaign perspective and is, a, is an excellent contrast to the Trudeau Liberals. Uh, Kim, uh, what are your thoughts? Look, if uh, in the last election, Andrew Scheer had far too high of expectations going into the campaign. Aaron O'Toole, I guess, is trying to lower that bar as, as low as he possibly can. But ultimately, uh, this was a fail. This was a juvenile frat boy move. And if you're trying to be the leader of a G7 country, not exactly what I would want to start framing the narrative a couple of days before uh, the start of a campaign. In a campaign where no one knows who your leader is, you've got internal squabbles and battles. These are now highlighted. You had at least five, maybe six uh, MPs of, of Aaron O'Toole's, like Shadow Caucus members who denounced this. But the other part that I, I find particularly goofy about this is not only has most people not seen that version of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the people that they're hoping to get to, but the fact of trying to play the Prime Minister as a girl could we just really stop doing this sort of uh, gender-based uh, cheap shots? I think it's beyond, beyond and beneath so many people. And frankly, I'm back on the, you want to play like a girl? Look at how our women's uh, team did in, in the Olympics. We're pretty epic. Stop trying to dim dim diminish what's happening and trying to make it a, a sort of some gender stereotype. I think it was stupid. I think it was juvenile. They got roundly slapped for it. And they darn well better start doing better if they don't want to be, uh, you know, Elsie Wayne and Jean, Cre uh, Jean Charest back in the day of two caucus members. All right. Ashton, it does speak to the issue, I suppose, that a lot of people, if you don't know uh, who Aaron O'Toole is and you want to know more about what the party stands for, uh, I wouldn't a lot of experts suggest that, look, let, let's make every single ad uh, during this campaign about this guy, who he is, what he stands for, and put that up against uh, the Prime Minister as opposed to uh, that kind of ad uh, that talks about why we're having an election and, and depicts the Prime Minister in, in that, kind of a, uh, that kind of a way. Yeah, look, Peter, I think it's fair to say that those uh, sort of national ad buys are coming. Um, as you alluded to earlier, the Conservatives have a formidable war chest, and you can uh, certainly take to the bank, no pun intended, that uh, that campaign will not be outspent. But at the same time, that is two days prior to the election call, the expected election call. Uh, again, a trial balloon floated online that maybe landed a little bit flat. I think we can all agree on that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go to war to try to protect it. Uh, I've said what I needed to say about it, um, but I think, uh, you know, now that we're uh, officially all engines go for the campaign, I think you can expect a little bit more uh, of a different tone from Mr. O'Toole. I think he is going to have to work very hard to define himself for Canadians. I agree with Kim that uh, the Conservatives are coming into this election firmly as underdogs. And I think with that comes a tremendous opportunity yeah. to do something a little bit surprising. All right, uh, let me jump in here. And we're just going to give our viewers this shot. Here's the Prime Minister and his family uh, making the uh, walk from Rideau Cottage. They're uh, 
uh, interim residents making the walk up to Rideau Hall, and I'll just uh, let you uh, watch and listen. Uh, this will probably take a couple of minutes, and then we'll come back to our guests. But uh, let's just put you there and let you watch along. All right, so uh, watching, so I, uh, I have a better sense now. So this, this is the shot that the, uh, the pool camera, uh, which happens to be our camera, was uh, permitted to take. So it's leaving the cottage, making that turn. And I guess we will not uh, be accompanying them all the way to this gate, but it won't take very long for the next shot to pick them up as they uh, turn the corner of that walkway and make their way up to the front door of um, uh, Rideau Hall. As I watch along with uh, our uh, commentators, uh, Susan Smith, Ashton Arsenault, and Kim Wright. Uh, Susan, let me have you follow up on as we see the doors swing open. Uh, let's just stay with this shot as we see uh, the Governor General, I believe. Uh, are they, these are the, uh, no, this is uh, the, the two, the secretaries, I believe, who will uh, accept the, uh, meet the Prime Minister and greet as he arrives. We'll watch this for a few moments. And the Prime Minister gets set to walk up the walkway and we'll see if we can pick that shot up as well. All right, these are the, you can see them. I'll play by play this a little bit for you. The camera crews that were following the Prime Minister uh, now making their way back uh, ahead of uh, the Trudeau family uh, for this walk up to Rideau Hall, uh, returning to the front of Rideau Hall for the arrival of the Trudeau family, uh, the Prime Minister, Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, Ella Grace, Xavier, and Hadrian. Susan, uh, let, let me ask you, what, what is you, you know, the fact that the Prime Minister makes this arrival with uh, his uh, family in tow, uh, what do you make of that? I think it's wonderful, and I think it reminds Canadians uh, that he cares about Canadians. He has his own family, uh, and he... He is like Canadians because he has a family, and he's had the backs of Canadian families during the campaign. Uh, this family has been committed to uh, leading the country um, for the last six years, is it now? Uh, as I do the math, uh, they've grown up, with the kids have grown up uh, with that, but just like our Canadian kids and Canadian families have grown up. So I think it sends a very good, strong message uh, that the, the Prime Minister is grounded in families, understands children, kids, what it's been like um, as much as I can to be working from yeah. home, schooling kids from home during the pandemic. So it's a, it's a very nice sing signal. There would have been some discussion going into this, Kim, about how do we want to make this uh, this visit to the, to the Governor General at Rideau Hall. Uh, what do you think of the optics of this scene that we'll pick up again in a moment of the Prime Minister and his uh, entire family uh, showing up to trigger the election? Yeah, it, it is entirely trying to have that happy family image that, you know, I'm not just the prime minister, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, you know, I'm here for my family and our family. I, I get the imagery. Uh, it, it's it's pretty typical. I'd, I, I think it'd be a bigger story if the family wasn't uh, with him uh, coming to, to see the governor general. I also think these, all of these will be great images uh, over the course of you know, history and time. And I, I always like to see the families where we can. And if if it's not such, you know, it, you know, people people want to see that those moments. And I think this is a good moment in time to celebrate uh, those who are around you. And look, we all have been around politics a very long time. Campaigns are grueling. Campaign life is grueling. Uh, so to have these moments of, of joy and, you know, togetherness before crisscrossing the country is a lovely thing. All right, and here's that image. Ashton, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, this is cl clearly a, a, an image that uh, there was some discussion about how to uh, how do we want to how do we want to portray the prime minister on day one of the campaign launch? What do you think? Uh, I think the liberals uh, each and every day run a master class in political imaging. Uh, I think the prime minister has a beautiful family. This is a really nice shot. Uh, you know, I think everybody. Um, 
should be proud that their prime minister is uh, walking with his family to Rideau Hall. In many ways, it's a historic day. I think any other prime minister in uh, similar circumstances would do the exact same thing. Uh, I also agree with Kim that uh, it is nice to see families every once in a while. You sort of uh, only see the person um, on TV or, or in the House of Commons. So uh, in many ways, historic, and I'm looking forward to what happens next. All right, let's just listen in if, if we can pick up any audio on this quick conversation. Here is the... He is uh, the family's met by officials at Rideau Hall now to be brought inside uh, for the discussion with uh, the Governor General. Now, now I'm, I'm assuming, and I think with protocol, and maybe you guys can help me out, that uh, the discussion between the Prime Minister and the uh, Governor General will happen uh, without the benefit of the entire family uh, being present in the room. One would think that's a one on one uh, conversation. And he's expected to be inside there for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. And then come out and tell us that uh, the Governor General has agreed to his request to dissolve Parliament and uh, Canadians will go to the polls on September 20th in a 36 day election campaign. Uh, we'll come back to you guys uh, shortly, or uh, you folks, thanks for being with us today. Um, and we'll have more to say uh, as the morning unfolds because this will happen in fairly rapid succession once the Prime Minister does emerge uh, from that meeting with the Governor General. That will happen. You can see uh, uh, the podium being set up. He'll come out, speak with reporters uh, and through them uh, and the networks uh, to Canadians, and then take questions from journalists. And then uh, about five minutes after that, we will hear from Aaron O'Toole. Five minutes after that, we'll hear from the bloc leader, Yves-Francois Blanchet. Five minutes after that, we'll hear from uh, Jagmeet Singh. And five minutes after that, we'll hear from the Green leader, Anami Paul. So it'll be a, a sort of rapid a freight training of uh, leaders and their uh, initial thoughts as the campaign and uh, very key initial thoughts this is a this is the launch of the campaign so uh, a number of Canadians not sure how that number would be on a, a nice day in August but uh, they'll be paying attention to the launch of the campaign at some point today so these comments will get lots of coverage and will be important to uh, set the tone uh, for the launch of the campaign. Uh, so we'll come back to our political commentators in a moment, but right now let's go to my colleague uh, Martin Stringer outside Rita Hall. Martin. Thank you, Peter. Well, as you mentioned, and as we've seen, the Prime Minister and his family have gone into Rideau Hall. I'm joined now by two journalists who have watched many an election campaign. John Iveson is the Ottawa Bureau Chief and a columnist for the National Post, and Susan Delacourt is a columnist and veteran Ottawa watcher for the Toronto Star. Both of you, um, let's start with... You both watch so many elections. This is a particular one in many ways. What are you watching for in this election, Susan? Well, since you have referred to how many I've covered. <laughs> we date ourselves. Eleven. Um, wow. Uh, I'm reminded of the one where Jean Chrétien, I believe it was the 1997 one, couldn't explain why he was calling an election. Okay. And it, it did haunt him for a couple of days because Chrétien had a habit of going early, you know, uh, incredibly early, three years into the mandate. And I think there are, uh, you know, we have the complication of the pandemic here. Um, so I guess the Prime Minister must know that that's going to be the leading question today is why. Mm -hmm. do, you think, uh, do you think that's going to be more of a poignant and more of a potentially dangerous question uh, politically? Uh, because a lot of people have said, no, this will just blow over after an initial anger. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we've... We have covered a lot of elections, all post-war, I would add. But, um, but, but, it, but it generally does blow over. It becomes an issue on day one. And I mean, even in 2008, when Harper did it, came here in early September, it blew over after a couple of days. Um, the thing I see here, I mean, the voters don't say, I'm, I'm not going to vote a month hence for this party because of what they've done here. But it, it may induce a bit of apathy. Okay. And, you know, 1963, Lester B. Pearson, 1 in 63, campaign in 65, to go from my minority to majority. That was the pitch. We need a majority. The public said, well, well we, we actually quite like what you're doing. Uh, you're not getting a majority. And I think that that's what I'm going to watch for. Are people, does this conjure up some apathy among voters who might otherwise have gone out if there was a really good reason to do so? I'm going to make another past uh, reference. Uh, his father. He doesn't like being compared to his father, but his father was elected in a huge, you know, Trudeau mania of 68, lost it in 72 with a, to a minority and came back. And though Justin Trudeau does not want to be accused of walking in his father's footsteps, there is the parallel here. So he, he has to kind of match. Can, can I just go back to another? Because the 74 okay. election, which came, uh, yeah. Trudeau was a treading water. People yeah. who, were, who were on that campaign told me that, that I wasn't in that one, but they were in the I, yes. they found an issue. And the issue was wage, uh, wage and, and price controls, which yeah. St Robert Stanfield had talked about. Trudeau 
asked in some campaign stop, do you want your wages frozen? And the public went, and that was his issue. And yep. true, the sun needs to find an issue. It's Many right. people have said that the pandemic will figure large in this, and it will certainly figure large if we have a real, di if there's difficulty caused by the fourth wave. But how much does the prime minister's high ratings when it comes to handling of the pandemic, how much does the fact that this is a summer election, people are not necessarily as focused on the election, and they're focused on just getting through the pandemic, how much does that act in his favor? How much does that act? Is it, is it a risk? It's going to be the leading issue, and there's the logistical one, as we've been talking about. How do you conduct it? Elections are all about hand to hand yeah. contact, yeah. touch, meeting people. How is that going to? That's, that's Justin Trudeau's strength, is meeting people. So, how is he going to pull that off with pandemic controls? And then there's the issue that people feel like we're not through this yet. Um, and why are we uh, having this conversation? I think we can have the conversation about how we want to be led after a pandemic. I think that's probably what it should be. Can the um, well, what we saw yesterday on on uh, I'm sorry on Friday, what we saw was the prime minister uh, announcing or his government announcing new measures in terms of um, mandatory vaccination. That is going to be a controversial issue. To what extent are actual future pandemic measures going to be an issue in this election? Is it a wedge issue? For example, the Conservatives are not in favor of mandatory vaccination for the whole civil service and for federally regulated industries, for example. Yeah, I think um, that was a wedge issue. It was a trap which I think uh, Erno Tool walked into um, by saying that we're generally in favor, but we, we don't want it mandatory. Yeah. Uh, it was a kind of, well, what side are you on on this? Uh, you know, the pandemic has been a mixed bag for Trudeau. I mean, until the vaccine started flowing, it looked like it was going to be a, an anchor around his neck. But then, once everybody's vaccinated, uh, suddenly it's uh, he can look back at his record and, and with some confidence that it, the, the public's going to go with him. I do think it's going to depend how the fourth wave, wave unrolls. Whether this is uh, one other thing I would say though is that if, if campaigns have to stop in person because of the pandemic. Uh, you know, Aaron O'Toole is the one who needs to get out there and meet people and get his name known and his face known. And if he's trying to do that from a, a studio in the Western Hotel in Ottawa, that's going to be really hard work. Mm -hmm. To what extent, I mean, this has been referred to, some people have said that the electorate is in a very weird headspace because of the pandemic, that there's a volatility and maybe even an irascibility in the Canadian electorate. Any thoughts on that? I hear it myself, anecdotally. Yeah. You know, um, it, you know, Ottawa is not exactly a representative sample, but yeah. um, but I do hear it. In I think people are tired. Uh, it's exhausted. Normally, politicians try to stay out of the public's face. Yeah. Again, Jean Chrétien used to counsel this: yeah. uh, don't get in people's faces too much because. And the politicians have been in people's faces for a year and a half, sometimes daily, from Rideau Cottage over there. Um, that's a risky thing now going into a campaign is the public has been exhausted with seeing people on TV and it, it could, familiarity normally breeds contempt. Yeah. Um, so that's a, that's a risk. It's a, I, I think we've got a whole new set of rules and communication rules in this election because of what we've been through the last year and a half. John, is this the, uh, is this the uh, Prime Minister's majority to lose? Because people say, you know, in the dint of hundreds of billions of dollars of spending in the, in, with the argument that we were there for you, which is going to be a huge argument, is this his majority to lose? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you look at the, all of the polling, it's not just one or two polls, it's the consensus of polling that he's ahead in the polls, uh, that the country, people in the country feel the country is going in the right direction, that the government's approval rating is pretty strong. Trudeau's own personal personal approval rating is stronger than it was in 2019, and the, rate, the approval rating for the Conservative leader is weaker than it was in 2019. So I think you look at all those things and you say, well, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he draws on to, to win it, to, to win back a majority. But to your point about um, being in people's faces, uh, you know, I, I just think that there's a potential that... <laughs> The country's not in a kick the bums out mood for sure. Okay. It doesn't seem to me there's a yeah. change election. It's not like a 2015 election. No, no, but there might be a fatigue that results in people just not being enthusiastic, not motivated, and not going to the polls. Whereas potentially the Conservative voters want to stop the minority, and maybe, and if it's more mail in ballots, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of imponderables that, uh, that might not work out the way that the polls suggest it. Mm -hmm. Tone's well, going to be really important. Tone, yeah. uh, if the Prime Minister comes out today, and appears overconfident, cocky, uh, too sure of himself. That um, that will annoy liberals, you know. Um, so I I think that uh, he's got to be modest. He's got to have a really good reason for why he's uh, calling an election. 
And th as John says, the conservative base is motivated, right? They are uh, they're <coughs> determined to... Uh, Let's talk about the uh, the NDP in this and the, and, the, and the Green Party and the Bloc. Any other any comments, any reflections on those other parties? Well, I don't mean to say other parties, but on the... Well, the NDP are have. not going to be just another party. I think they're going to be a, a major factor in this election. Yep. If only because the, the, the traditional Liberal tactic in the last week of the campaign is to, to scare the dippers. Uh, you know, <laughs> here's a potential for a Conservative government. You've got, you can't vote NDP, you've got to vote Liberal to right. keep out the Conservatives. If that's not a factor in this election, yeah. and the polls suggest... As it doesn't seem to be with the polling. It doesn't seem to be then that frees up a lot of people to vote the way they want to vote. And, 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 and in that case, all bets are off because yeah. the, nobody could calculate the splits that might uh, come from a, an NDP vote that's in the, in the low 20s. You might see a lot the more NDP conservatives. Makes, yeah, the NDP make the argument, vote your conscience is not an imminent conservative landslide. Vote for the people who got you extra benefits. And I, I do think that the country is generally quite happy with that arrangement, whereby uh, if Trudeau oversteps the boundaries, He's reined back in by Parliament, as he was in the early uh, part of the pandemic when he tried to get the, the almost two years of That's Parliament right. parliament free spending, taxing and yeah. borrowing. And Parliament said, no, we want to have still have control of that. Susan, uh, third, third, fourth, fifth parties that you're looking at with interest. I, I'm intrigued by the fact that the Prime Minister and Jagmeet Singh will be in Montreal today. Yeah. I, it tells me that these two are going to be... Uh, sort of chasing each other around through yeah. the campaign. As they're chasing each other's votes. Exactly, yes. Um, the Green Party, mm -hmm. uh, wow. <laughs> this should be an election that has their issue in it, climate change. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Annamie Paul is launching her campaign to be daring, mm -hmm. but right now the most daring thing she can do is kind of keep her party together. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's been, she's, I guess, succeeded in having the leadership vote postponed, but um, it does seem this has been a strange year already for the Green Party, and it promises to get stranger, I think, during yeah. campaign. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, will, we will watch with interest. I want to thank both of you for taking the mm -hmm. time. Thanks for chatting with us Thanks. in this early stages mm -hmm. of the election. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. And I've been in discussion with John Iveson, uh, columnist and Ottawa Bureau Chief of the National Post, and Susan Delacourt, uh, longtime political observer, <laughs> writer, and columnist for the Toronto Star. And we now go back to our regular programming. Do you want a federal election right now? I think it's too early. We're in, still in the midst of this. I mean, we, we think we're over, but I'm very concerned about the Delta variant in the U.S. especially, and that's spreading here. I'm kind of undecided at this point. Just like I, I'm, I'm not sure where I would vote exactly. I'm, I'm not unhappy with where, where things are at mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So to me, I, I'm, yeah unsure if if we need a federal election okay. at this point uh, a federal election now i i'm fine honestly uh, I, i'm you know i always vote every election i'm eligible to but i'm almost burnt out we up in nanaimo we had a ton recently like four or five in a row there yeah i think things are okay right now personally i don't think canada's ready for it right now we've got to get another year over this COVID stuff and then probably be more decision to do it in a year down the road than we are right now or even 18 months down the road. Don't want true to win that long, but I think it'd be better for everybody if we get the course going first before we actually sell a ship. No. Um, billions of dollars have been spent for um, COVID relief in many different forms, and I think that a federal election is just an added cost to an already struggling economic country, like the economics of this country. Simple as that. Yes and no. I am very unhappy with the Conservative leadership, federal leadership. Uh, I would like to see them step it up a little bit and uh, be more proactive. Um, so in that sense, as a Conservative, I don't think I would like an election. However, I think, um, I think the people of Canada need to voice their opinion and voice their vote. So it's a yes and no answer. Uh, it will depend on what the need will be for, but I think if there are some serious concerns that need to be addressed, then yes, a federal election would be appropriate at this time. No, I, I don't think it's an opportune time to do that. As I say, there, we have a lot of uh, housekeeping matters in this country that need to be straightened away, and uh, to embark on a, an election that is more about who's spending the much, as much money as the other one or uh, digging up dirt you know, I don't think we need that right now. I think we need a kinder, gentler place. You know, what Canadians are noted for. I don't think it matters. I think that, I'm not sure what the motivation behind calling an election 
was, but if calling an election allows for whatever government becomes the government to feel more secure in their position to make the decisions that they want to have in place and the policies they want to have in place, then perhaps it is time. Yeah, I think any time that we can get people's opinions out there, it's good. Uh, democracy works well when it's checked often. So I, I think absolutely having a federal election right now in the wake of the pandemic too, right? There's um, people's opinions on uh, local or federal government ha have changed. And I think emotions are raw <laughs> and having kind of a gauge of where the population is, I think that would be a good thing. Not particularly because we're just coming out of all the COVID and uh, it would be nice not to have to be concerned with that for now. However, um, politicians think differently, so uh, yes. Whenever it seems fit, I mean, if there's an election, that's probably because something's not working. And I think with a minority government, there's a lot of things that aren't getting passed that should be fixed. Uh, the, the speediness of things getting fixed and legislation changing, I mean, it isn't as fast as it should be. So of course, in an election, if it can make changes that are faster and, and better for the Canadian people, then why not? Yeah, I have nothing against it. The uh, COVID and everything else, you don't want it to push your luck. I think it should be more like late fall or next next spring, be the best, best time. I, I would like to see the government go as far as possible, try to work together instead, try and these stupid infighting and stuff like that is just dumb. Just work together and get things done. All right, a snapshot of uh, views of Canadians from across the country, and you'll hear from more of them in our coverage throughout the day and throughout the campaign for that matter. And just to set the scene for you, that's the shot you see on the screen as well of the uh, front door of Rideau Hall. The Prime Minister went in uh, probably 10, 15 minutes ago to uh, meet with uh, the Governor-General and ask her to dissolve Parliament and uh, trigger an election campaign. Uh, which we expect will be held September 20th after a 36-day campaign. The Prime Minister will confirm that in the next few minutes when he comes out of that meeting with the Governor-General and addresses Canadians at that podium and then takes questions from reporters. And then we'll be hearing after that from uh, all of the other uh, major party leaders as well in rapid succession. Uh, going to get back to our uh, uh, group of party commentators in just a moment, but uh, we're going to work our way through some of the key issues now, which will inform the conversation we have as our coverage continues this morning, as it is in uh, any national election campaign. The management of the economy will be a key driver of votes uh, this election, and the debate will focus on how the Liberals have guided Canada through the pandemic and the competing party visions of how to rebuild the economy after the pandemic. Here's CPAC's Andrew Thompson with more on the cost of COVID-19 and the road to recovery. When will life fully return to normal? It's a top of mind question for Canadians, but what should that normal look like? And how much should the federal government spend to make it happen? We will be there for Canadians as long as it takes, whatever it takes. Now Mr. Trudeau wants to use this health and economic crisis as an opportunity to reimagine Canada's economy. The pandemic raised federal spending to levels unseen since the Second World War. Money poured out of Ottawa for emergency support, for tax deferrals, and for supporting the provinces. The deficit soared to $354 billion, but the economy shrank a record 5% in 2020, with COVID-19 battering businesses big and small. Some economic pillars like the housing market have remained strong, and household savings have ballooned an average of 15% last year. But those gains have flowed more to middle and high income households. The Bank of Canada has said economic activity has been more resilient than anticipated. But low wage workers, young people and women in particular, remain out of work and only strong and sustained growth can overcome the pandemic's severe impacts. The real question will be by the end of 2021, as we go into 2022, uh, where will the chips fall? Will folks be able to return to employment, particularly in low wage sectors? Um, or will they find that those jobs simply aren't there at the same time as uh, important government benefits evaporate? The Liberal recovery pitch from the last budget. Inclusive growth and $135 billion in new spending over the next five years. More than half earmarked for childcare, COVID-19 support programs and benefits. With billions more for affordable housing, the green economy, and helping businesses go digital. 
it all comes down to this. Good jobs, a strong and fair economy, and a healthy environment. Aaron O'Toole is after more national self-sufficiency, more manufacturing jobs and more incentives for small business creation with targeted and time-limited stimulus for hard-hit sectors and a responsible winding down of emergency measures. Spending to protect Canadians during the pandemic is the right thing to do, and Conservatives have supported it. But we can't pass unsustainable debt to our children and future generations. The IMF lauded Canada's timely, decisive and well-coordinated policy response to the pandemic, but cautioned that billions in new stimulus would need more justification. But it's not a unanimous view that more spending could be too much for Canada's economy to handle or jeopardize fiscal health. We have a large debt to be sure, but it's not really impacting the budget as much as it would have 10 or 20 years ago. It's certainly possible that interest rates would, would increase uh, and it's possible that inflation might increase, but we don't have any indication at this point in the long term that that's gonna happen. The Trudeau government adjusted its fiscal anchor to unwinding COVID-related deficits and reducing the federal debt as a share of the economy over the medium term. That debt-to-GDP ratio is now projected above 50%. Liberals believe low interest rates make this manageable, arguing the Canadian economy is still far from seeing broadly shared benefits. But the pace of recovery and 6 to 7% growth expected this year has led the Bank of Canada to expedite its timeline for raising rates. One of the objectives at the federal level should be to, you know, put a clear path forward to not only reducing debt, but, you know, significantly kind of reducing our debt to GDP ratio so that if, you know, if we should come across another crisis, we have a little bit of room, wiggle room to be able to deal with it. The NDP plan for creating 1 million jobs touches on essential workers, infrastructure and domestic production capacity with higher taxes on the wealthiest of Canadians. The Bloc Québécois wants to focus on Quebec's natural resources and renewable energy sector. And the Green Party says now is the time for a major push to a net zero economy. What should a post-COVID economy look like and how much to spend in support of the recovery? Two questions that loom large as Canadians prepare to vote. Live shot of Rideau Hall, Peter Van Dusen with you for our continuing coverage of the launch of the uh, 2021 now election campaign in this country. Prime Minister has been in there for a uh, little over 20 minutes, expect him to be in there half an hour, maybe a little more, uh, asking Mary Simon, the Governor General, to dissolve Parliament and uh, approve his request for an election uh, that would be held. Uh, we are hearing and expecting the Prime Minister to come to that podium and tell us it will be September 20th after a 36-day campaign. And then we expect him to get lots of questions around timing of the election call, why now, and uh, how he thinks it'll be framed. And you, you can expect uh, the economy to be at the uh, center of that conversation about why uh, he feels he needs a, a new mandate from Canadians. And uh, let's put it out there, the, the Liberals are after a majority mandate. That's what uh, the election call is, is largely about. And the timing of that is important. Uh, let's go back to our panel of party commentators. Susan. Uh, how important will the conversation around the economy be uh, in this campaign? It will be very important, Peter, and I think it's a good conversation that, that the Liberals will welcome. If you look at the Liberal team, Christian Freeland, Marc Garneau, François-Philippe Champagne, Jean-Yves Duclos, there's an incredible amount of depth and good economic stewardship there. As a country, we've weathered the pandemic. We've figured out, we've been creative, figured out a way to help Canadians. And the Liberals have put together a path that they put it out there on how to help uh, how to help us as a country dig out of it, whether it's investing in green infrastructure, regular infrastructure, broadband, et cetera. The child care program is huge. Economy and jobs, we learned this was a she session. So the very first thing the Liberals did in the last budget when they brought down a budget after the pandemic was to say that we were going to have affordable child care. And they put it into place. I know this has been a promise that's been outstanding for a long time. But now we have eight agreements across the country. We need to know. Uh, the Liberals are keen on putting these into place. Will Aaron O'Toole cancel them? Uh, will he cancel these spots that will be available for Canadians? So the economic stuff, I think, is very key. Getting people back working again also involves okay. getting women and families back working again, and that means childcare. 
Ashton, let me hear you on that. Uh, the importance of uh, there will be many issues uh, during the course of the campaign, uh, and you know, healthcare. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of those in our coverage today. Healthcare uh, issues around uh, climate change, the environment, issues around uh, representation, diversity, uh, uh, and, and all of those things that are important to Canadians. Uh, economy is always right up there, though. So, how will that conversation go? It should be because it touches each and every one of us uh, every single day. Uh, if you are a Liberal supporter and you're backing the Prime Minister on his handling of the economy, then you're basically conceding that there is no solution that government cannot solve with taxpayer dollars. And the Conservative outlook on how the economy should be treated is a little bit different than that. Uh, I think what you are going to see from Aaron O'Toole is a much more hyper-specific, detailed plan about how we can get more money into the pockets of Canadians so they can do with it as they see fit. Now, the Liberal plan, what you're going to see is a lot of very expensive promises with very little detail. We've already talked about the fact that they've committed $100 billion over the next three years. It seems like they have some themes on how they want to spend that money, but they haven't really told Canadians why or exactly how they are going to do so. And I think that is where we are missing the mark if we want to assess the Liberal plan. And I think Aaron O'Toole will be much more specific and much more trusting that Canadians know what to do with their money better than government. All right. Uh, Kim, let me hear from you, the New Democrats. I mean, a lot of people will look at the campaign promises and see a lot of similarity in, in where the New Democrats are and where the Liberals are. But what do you want them to know about differences? Look, at the end of the day, it's, it's about moving beyond words. And, you know, Susan talked about how Liberals have promised childcare for years, decades, in fact. In the 1993 Red Book, uh, they, were, they were going to absolutely bring forward a, a affordable daycare. Uh, those kids have had kids, and some of them have had kids uh, since the we're still waiting. And and it's great. I'm glad we're finally doing that. I welcome people finally living up to their commitments, but that's not going to be what's happened. We we saw over the course of the pandemic in every municipality across the country, uh, people struggling with homelessness, people struggling with mental health, people struggling with access to health care clean drinking water, which they have, you know, yes, there have been some movements on this, but there are still boil water advisories and reservations across this country. There are things that have been known about, that have been talked about, and for goodness sake, run campaigns on, fine. But when are we actually going to finally see action on these things, actual meaningful action happening now? They could do all of those things. The, nobody was stopping the Prime Minister from actually fixing the water problems at Attawapiskat. They chose not to. And this is why people That's are not frustrated. True. That is utterly true. And the, you, it's and, not true. And you, you made the, 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 the minister himself talked about some of these. Yeah, we're not going to get to him as fast as we could because of COVID. COVID's a convenient excuse for things that have been talked about uh, for years and nobody actually got around to doing some. Let's actually start figuring out how to move Kim, forward. That's what Canadians are looking for. All right, so yeah, go quickly, ahead. Peter, on the boil water advisories, they're not all complete. There's no question that needs to be done. The Liberal government has actually been working with communities. That's the difference here. And in fact, on COVID, communities cut, closed their doors. They closed their borders and they said, we do not want anybody who isn't from the community in this community. So you can't send water people who build water treatment plants into a community if the community is saying no thanks. So that actually is the, a legitimate At, slowdown. And the five some of the years water, water advisories, before. you can't do that. But the, the, the government committed to taking away, to removing boil water advisories, more than 100 have been done. It's not finished yet. There's no question. But it's more that's happened than under any other government. And the commitment is there to keep going. But it's a commitment okay. in partnership with the communities. And they're moving at the pace that the communities have the capacity to do. A few weeks ago, Charlie okay. Angus did a press conference with a young woman who literally has chlorine running through her body because of what's happening in their, in their communities. There is not clean water. This is a national travesty. And how do we call ourselves an advanced nation when this still is happening? And like, let's not act like the Liberals didn't have a majority government before the last two years. They didn't do anything then. Now, COVID's a convenient excuse. Time for talk is done, and that's why Canadians are frustrated. Are, 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 okay, you can't, you me, can't say that 100 oil water advisories have been removed and then say 
that nothing okay. was done. You, you can't do that. Stuff actually uh, did happen. Ashton, you know, let me, let me, Ashton, let me, not yet, it's in progress. Ashton, let me bring you into the conversation because at the heart of this conversation is the whole notion of, of performance and credibility. Uh, so talk to me about what you think that, I mean, so uh, we don't have a measure of performance and uh, I suppose over, we don't have a, a a sort of track record of credibility yet for for Mr. O'Toole. So how does he how does he frame that conversation during an election campaign? Uh, yeah, look, uh, Mr. O'Toole has uh, yet to become prime minister, right? So there's really no uh, benchmark to compare him to, uh, unlike the Liberal Party, which has a notorious history of overpromising and underdelivering. <laughs> Uh, Mr. O'Toole is a man of his word. That's why I think you are going to see a plan with great detail and great specificity um, very soon, if not tomorrow or the next day. And the reality is Canadians have been listening to Justin Trudeau's song sheet for six years now. He, it's not as if he's an untested leader and there are a litany of broken promises to choose from. A litany. And I wouldn't even know where to start. And the problems facing Canada right now are, are, are quite severe, and this election is going to come down to trust. Uh, the Prime Minister has broken the trust of Canadians on any number of occasions uh, across the political spectrum. Uh, Mr. O'Toole uh, is, fortunately for him, a little bit more of a unknown commodity. He has a chance to prove himself in front of Canadians, and I think that's what you're going to see over the next 36 days. Kim, we heard a couple of our journalists talk about uh, the notion of, I mean, we, we heard David Coletto earlier on the program talk about things looking pretty good for the Liberal Party, but we, anecdotally, I've heard them, you've probably heard them, our journalists talk about it, the notion of volatility in the electorate and that, okay, if we're going to have an election, uh, you know, it's got to happen sometime, but maybe I don't really want it but um, what role do you think that volatility might play in this campaign and you know how how does Mr. Singh for instance let's start there um, you know uh, take what might be volatility in the electorate and have people uh, maybe rethink their choices or solidify their choices or question their choices absolutely and one of the things I love about Jagmeet and his leadership style is it really is uh, about some positivity, calling to people to account for sure, but how do we move forward? And if, if people don't want an election, and let's be honest, no one ever wants one, but we're here now, uh, but there is an apathy out there. And, and if I were in, trying to figure out for the governing party how to get people to the polling stations, so far, they don't really have a ballot box question to motivate them. Jagmeet has uh, certainly given his supporters and those who are taking a second look at him uh, to go, huh, there's something about this guy I like. I like some of the people he's bringing forward. There's some really great candidates. Uh, Paul Taylor in Park Delhi Park uh, is an extraordinary candidate. Uh, we're seeing really great candidates even in, in, in Quebec. People want to write off new Democrats in Quebec, but we're also seeing some of those who lost by a little bit last time. Ruth Ellen Bursour is running again. So all of this comes together of it's not just the guy whose photo is on the plane, but also with the team that's around him, and there's some really extraordinary things happening. All right. Uh, Susan, what, uh, talk to me about volatility and what kind of a challenge that could present for, uh, for governing Liberals. Well, a campaign, you know, they matter, as everybody has said. Uh, things can happen for any leader in a campaign. And the, by the very nature of politic, politics, thankfully in Canada, we're not as polarized as the U.S. is. But people have opinions on all the leaders. That's politics for you. So uh, there could be some sway. But I think, you know, your earlier spot with David Coletto showed where uh, people's comfort level is, showed where their confidence is, showed that people recognized it was the Liberals that had their backs during the crisis, that when they got their CERB checks or their, their wage subsidies from a business perspective, perspective or the rent subsidies or the vaccines got into the country, they know it was the Liberal government that did that for them. When the child care agreements start to get implemented, they'll know that those were deals that were struck with the federal government implemented by the provinces. So volatility, sure, that's the very nature of politics. I think at the moment, at the beginning of the campaign, people are still focused on summer. After people get back in school, they'll look at what's going on. I think that doesn't bode well for Jagmeet Singh or Aaron O'Toole. They need the whole 36 days of this campaign for people to get to know them and know what they stand okay. for. For the Trudeau Liberals, I think people have, there's a head start there. And it'll be, I think the real race will be September 6th or 7th all the way to the 20th. And that's when you're going to see 
uh, everybody zeroing in and focusing. Peter, can I hop in on volatility? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. That's a, your, your next session. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to say, um, look, unfortunately, we have a, this is just one example, um, but it is a uh, extreme example, unfortunately. We have a government, an Afghan government in Kabul that is about to fall. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Canadians stranded on the ground. This is just one item. Uh, uh, along the lines of something that could pop up during the election um, events, my dear boy, as uh, has been said previously. Um, you go back to the 2015 campaign, there was a, uh, a young boy, a Syrian refugee, who washed up on a beach, um, and that was a, a lightning rod during that campaign. Um, so I think, look, in terms of vol volatility, essentially what you're asking us to predict is whether or not something will pop up during the campaign. It absolutely will. And how leaders respond to that is how they will be judged. In terms of foreign policy, this prime minister has been weak on Russia. He's been weak on China. He is always a day late and a dollar short. We have hundreds of Canadians ready to be sent over yeah. to the Beijing Olympics in 2022 to be used as political tools by the Chinese regime. And we're doing nothing about it. And the prime minister has said little to nothing about right i mean it's it's and when you talk about uh, to all of you when we talk about uh, the notion of volatility and uh predict what might pop up, up during the campaign there is that uh but there's there's also the notion and kind of the way i'm framing it is that you know we saw from david coletto there's yeah, a bit of it. There's an appetite for change, but it's not a, a drastic appetite for change. If you're the opposition leaders in a campaign, you need to create that appetite for change. At some point during the campaign, you have to flip people from being okay with the way things are to wanting change and making a decision at the ballot box uh, about that, right? And I mean, that's uh, Susan talked to me about that. That's, you know, the, if, if you're the governing party, that's what you don't want. And But to, to Ashton's point, you can't predict what you can't predict popping up in a campaign. You, you want the campaign to go a certain way, but it's how you handle the stuff you weren't expecting that makes, it, makes a difference in a campaign. Sure. And as important as all Can Canadians think we are as a country, we can't stop the world's events from taking place. But I do think we're capable as a country, and certainly every Canadian government is capable of walking and chewing gum at the same time, handling the issues that come up. Uh, if you're the opposition leaders, you need every single day of this campaign, and you need to be able to optimize and maximize every single day of this campaign. And as you know, as we said, Aaron O'Toole has to spend the first half of this campaign saying, hi, I'm Aaron, I'm not Andrew, and I'm not Stephen. But some people, he's saying, hi, I'm Aaron, and I like Stephen. And that, that's a very tricky scenario. I think this whole um, the issue with vaccines and mandatory vaccines that the government's just announced on Friday for uh, trains and planes for and federally regulated employees, this is something Canadian and Canadian communities are want. And from a volatility perspective, this will be part of the discussion. And this is something that there is a division between the Conservatives and, and the Liberals on. Every leader is going to have to capitalize in the right way on the day's events of the campaign right. and hopefully build to, uh, you know, build to yes at the ballot box. Let me jump off on that, Ashton, with you. And, and as we wait, uh, like I say, the Prime Minister's inside. We expect him to uh, come outside in the next few minutes here to, to speak with reporters. But um, let me jump on that uh, to the extent uh, about what we've heard about some of the concerns inside the Conservative Party, about w what Mr. O'Toole wants to do with that party, where he wants to take it. Uh, some people mm -hmm. in the party are not comfortable with that. What is the Conservative Party today as we go into this campaign? Uh, well, I'll, I'll be very short and sweet. And uh, the former Prime Minister's greatest achievement might be his ability to live in the heads of Liberals rent-free. Of course, I'm talking about Stephen Harper. But uh, O'Toole's Conservative Party is one that is hopefully more nimble, younger, more encompassing of all of Canada, <clears throat> new Canadians, and... As he said previously, uh, he wants Canadians to look into the mirror and see a conservative. And to do that, you have to, one, contrast your positions with the current prime minister and point out where there has been failures. And there has been failures. And two, you got to present your own vision for what Canada should be. What would a conservative party actually do? Why would I trust you with my vote? Why would I trust you with the economy? If you don't tell us, you don't deserve the vote. Aaron O'Toole is going to tell Canadians that very soon. Uh, Kim, uh, let me ask you for your thoughts on this notion of uh, uh, opposition leaders having to create an appetite for change. Mr. Singh is, it would seem to be, according to the latest polls, 
uh, in a pretty good spot for a new Democratic Party leader, around 20 percent as we head into the campaign in, in popular support. Uh, to win a lot more seats, he needs to try and bump that number up, and he needs to, you know, create that desire for change in Canadians that uh, is perhaps there, but maybe not deeply rooted uh, in enough of them. So how does he do that? In, in part, it is the conversation that happens on the campaign trail, those unscripted moments. You'll remember uh, last election, there was the, I'm going to call him Lucy, a gentleman who walked up to Jigmeet Singh <laughs> at a farmer's market uh, and accosted him and saying, you know, you'd be better off if you weren't wearing a turban. How he responded to that, how he responds to so many things on the campaign trail, that authenticity of who Jigmeet Singh is, especially in those unscripted moments, is actually why people are paying attention to him a bit more, looking at him in all sorts of swing ridings and not just sort of traditional NDP uh, ridings. And, but, and but so can those I, can kinds I, sorry, of things will happen. Let, let me jump in, Kim, because, I mean, my observation is over time, is, isn't that already happening? I think there's a connection with Jagmeet Singh, the person. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the challenge for New Democrats is to convince Canadians about the NDP and their policies, uh, because for the most part, the polling shows that Jagmeet Singh is a very pop, perhaps the most popular leader. Yeah, and, and popularity is great, and it's always better than the alternative of not being very popular. But it also now is showing to Canadians what your team is, what your strategy is, how you've thought about not only saying lofty goals and aspirations, but what does that mean for me and my family and my friends and my community day to day? It is showing that you're actually ready to govern. And that's the kind of thing that New Democrats... When they start talking about those things, when Jack Layton talked about them in, in the 2011 campaign, well showing that here he is, how he's going to roll with things, uh, that's what got people excited. And look, the prime minister can be a bit thin-skinned uh, in, in unscripted situations. And the world is a volatile place right now. And the more he is thin-skinned, I mean, I look at that fundraiser he was at a few years ago when the Indigenous woman asked him questions and his response was, hey, thanks for buying some tickets tickets to our fundraiser. Oh, you know, how he rolls with these things is actually quite uh, quite extraordinary. So we'll see the unscripted moments of the campaign and how people okay. can say a showcase through this. So, Susan, so broadly speaking, leadership versus, uh, you know, the, the power of a leader versus the policies of a party, uh, the significance of that in this campaign. Sure. Um, just quickly, Peter, Jagmeet Singh is definitely a likable guy. I think there's a lot of people that would love to sit down and have a chai soy latte with him. I think that would be fantastic. Does he have the credibility and the chops to govern? And does his party, are they practical? And are these very expensive promises that they're talking about even realistic for this country at this time? That's the issue. In terms of unscripted moments, uh, Mr. Singh is excellent at that. He's a nice guy. So, and unscripted moments, I would say Justin Trudeau has demonstrated himself exceptionally well in those tough town halls with those tough questions on the streets talking to people. To your question on the policy side of things um, and popularity and power of leadership, that's where the Liberals have a good track record and that's where they differ from Mr. O'Toole. Your, David Coletto said Aaron O'Toole comes in even weaker than Andrew Scheer. How is that even possible? Uh, Jagmeet Singh has, you know, he's risen in person, personal popularity, but it's it's a long way away from Canadians really trusting the keys to the country uh, and the keys to the, the economy right. to the NDP. And this is where I do think that Liberals have an advantage. They have a proven team, depth of cabinet bench, okay. global experience, trade negotiate, trade deals negotiated. These are the ones that if people say we've got to dig out of this unprecedented economic situation that is a result of a global pandemic, I know these guys can drive the bus safely. All right. within the so so in, that, in that context, Ashton, talk to me about uh, the, uh, we've touched on it earlier, the challenges for, for Mr. O'Toole. He's, uh, the difference between him and the two other uh, major party leaders is that uh, they've had campaigns before. They've been in front of Canadians longer. So it seems to me Mr. O'Toole has to not only uh, get to know, have voters get to know him, but even before perhaps they pay closer attention to what he's offering in the campaign. I think the plan is certainly going to deserve some scrutiny, but let's talk about the economy just quickly, shall we? Um, the NDP's economic plan would drive the economy off a cliff. If we're talking about buses. The Liberals want you to assume that even though the gas tank is empty, the bus is still going to continue to roll down the street like everything is fine. The Conservatives are going to tell you that there's a gas station up ahead and that you're going to have a safe trip going forward. 
And that's really what the difference uh, between those three major parties in economic vision is. Uh, look, again, Mr. O'Toole has a lot of work to do. We are talking about what we expect is going to be the first day of the campaign. Uh, we have not yet seen the Conservative Party of Canada platform. I think we will see it exceptionally soon. You can bet that if not the majority, very close to it, will be dedicated to the economy. And you will see real plans with real action items and hopefully real ways to measure the results. And that's what I'm expecting from Aaron O'Toole and his team. And I think that's what Canadians are going to get. All right. Uh, Peter, one. Have very, very quickly, Susan. Aaron O'Toole still is going to have a problem uh, beyond defining himself. It's also defining the Conservative Party. Uh, uh, Ashton said earlier it's his Conservative Party. Well, his Conservative Party in March at their convention voted against a motion that said climate change is real. So is that Aaron O'Toole's Conservative Party? He's also going to have to deal with the noise out of Jay Hill and the Mavericks and Max Bernier. He's going to have to fight to keep that right flank while at the same time trying to grow his tent on a progressive tank. It, okay. you're gonna ha he's going to have to talk out of his mouth, both sides of his mouth, and that's going to be a problem, and it's going to confuse voters. Right Here's what we else. try to do here. We, we always try to be fair. So, Ashton, why don't you respond? Uh, Mr. O'Toole has addressed that uh, Conservative Party of Canada resolution, and it's not at all uh, how he feels personally, and it's not at all uh, consistent with the uh, environmental plan that the Conservatives have already released, one that I so think in many ways is more ambitious than the Liberal plan. And oh, by the way, the Conservative plan doesn't demonize one of Canada's largest industries in terms of contribution to the economy. That is what you can expect from the Conservative Party of Canada. But Ashton, that begs the question, though, if, it, if it's not what he believes, and there's lots of things Aaron O'Toole likes to say, he doesn't believe where his party is, and sometimes there's a disconnect, to be sure. But what has he done to manage those, it, work with those candidates, work with those people within his party, to make sure that people like me and, and my family and my community, when we see Aaron O'Toole speak, we know it's actually what we might see. And the same problem Aaron, uh, Aaron has is the same problem Andrew Scheer had, is he might want to say the right things and he's going to believe in a, you know, free votes and all of that, but he can't wrangle his caucus. He can't wrangle his party. And that's going to be dangerous for Canadians if he actually ever gets the keys to power. All right. Stand by all of you. Um, we will be uh, coming back to you as our coverage continues and uh, give you a sense of what's uh, going to be happening next. The podium shot at uh, Rideau Hall, the prime minister still inside talking with uh, the Governor General, and he will emerge from that conversation uh, shortly, we believe, having asked her to, and we expect, having received her approval, to dissolve uh, Parliament and uh, call an election for September 20th in Canada after a 36-day campaign. After the Prime Minister concludes that conversation, he will come out to that podium you can see on your screen uh, outside the front door at Rideau Hall. He will address uh, Canadians and then he will take questions from journalists. After that, uh, the other party leaders, the opposition leaders, will uh, then be going to this uh, scene at the Weston Hotel in Ottawa where uh, the podium is set for uh, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. We will hear his uh, remarks to Canadians. He will also take questions from reporters when that is done. And following Mr. O'Toole, we'll also be hearing from uh, the other party leaders. Jagmeet Singh will be here in Montreal uh, at that podium. You'll hear him address uh, reporters and take questions uh, as well as he launches the NDP campaign. And uh, we'll also, uh, some point during this process, be hearing from the Bloc Québécois leader and also uh, this uh, shot uh, of a podium for the Green Party leader, Annemie Paul. Uh, she will do the same thing. She'll launch the Green campaign and address Canadians and take questions from reporters there as well. As we stand by uh, for the Prime Minister, let's go back to the streets and uh, what Canadians are thinking as we head into this campaign. How do you feel about a federal election during the pandemic? I don't think that having going through a pandemic and trying to run an election is a smart thing to do. So I wouldn't want to have to go and vote. I mean, we did for the city elections, but I think that they should wait until the pandemic's been cleared and things are back to normal, maybe another year or so. No, nope, that is no, that's a no, because uh, some people are scared uh, from the pandemic still. Uh, they're still taking some uh, precautions, you know. Uh, so I would say they should wait until the uh, COVID, obviously the pandemic should be over, then vote. That way we get the better uh, voting system. I'm somewhat comfortable with it. I think like uh, vaccine, vaccine numbers across the country have, like people are more vaccinated. And maybe it's an opportunity to look at other avenues of 
voting, uh, online voting, or um, uh, voting ahead, you know, maybe it could be an opportunity to get more votes if you look at different ways of casting your ballot. So uh, maybe that's maybe too early or too short notice to make th those types of plans, but I'm okay with it during a pandemic to answer your question. I think it can be done. I'm totally against that. I, I just don't think it's the right time to do that. I'm thinking that in this case, I think the Liberal government, I think, has taken advantage of the situation and Conservatives being down in the, in, the, in the polls. And there's a lot of other factors, I think, that play into this. But during a pandemic, I'm just not seeing it. No, that's a stupid idea. Um, I think the fact that we're moving so along, so quickly along with restrictions as is, is terrible. Having a, re a federal election now would be even worse. It'd be a terrible idea. We should focus more so on getting, getting everyone vaccinated and focusing on ensuring that we can get the economy and having everything open much more smoothly and safely rather than focusing on having a, such a quick federal election. Uh, well, I would say that any change would be a good thing considering how poorly the current government has managed the whole situation. I mean, they're doing the best they can, but their best isn't good enough. During the pandemic itself, I. You know, they did it down the states, and they did it quite successfully. Well, some people would disagree with that. They did. Um, and, um, you know, during the pandemic itself would have been a bit more of a, of a situation, that, although we're still in the pandemic and we have a, a ways to go yet. I'm not as concerned as I was before, but if we follow the policies and the practices going into to vote and, and whatnot, it shouldn't be a problem, so I'm not that concerned. I have mixed feelings on it. I feel like it's hard to get everyone to actually go out and vote more so now than it would have been before because some people might be like scared or paranoid about the whole COVID thing. But I think it's important to also make a change as soon as you can. <laughs> and right now to have an election, I, I just don't think it's the right time. I, I mean, give give them at least three years. I mean, they've been in, they've been, they haven't even been in two yet. So, I mean, it's just. You know, it's it's kind of it's kind of it's kind of bad timing in, in, in my 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 estimation. But yeah, honestly, we've had in New Brunswick two elections so far, and they went fine. I don't see any issue doing it on the federal side. Um, yes, it makes it difficult for campaigning, um, but I really do appreciate seeing the variances in the campaign and the effort that the candidates are going through to actually get out there and talk to you without actually getting out there and bothering you at your house. Um, it, it's a new world. It's engaging a lot more uh, a lot more voters that they wouldn't have engaged with traditional means. So I think, honestly, having it under the pandemic has shown us a lot of ingenuity that people can come up with uh, and creativity, and as well, giving us a better view of who they actually are versus the standard meet and greet that most people try to pass off as a campaign. Peter Van Dusen with continuing live coverage here on CPAC of the launch of Vote 2021 in Canada. A federal election campaign is uh, officially probably just moments away here. The Prime Minister, uh, this is the shot at Rideau Hall. You see uh, journalists gathered there. You also see this podium where the Prime Minister will emerge from Rideau Hall in the next few minutes. We're told he'd be inside. He's been in there since, uh, I think uh, by my watch, it was uh, around 10.17 uh, Eastern time, maybe a little later than that, but he's been in there almost... Uh, 50 minutes or so now and he was we were told he'd be in from 30 to 45 minutes asking uh, the governor general Mary Simon to dissolve parliament and to uh, order an election uh, to start the process to trigger an election for September 20th after a 36 day campaign so we're standing by for the prime minister to come out and address Canadians and then speak with reporters uh, just ahead of that here's uh, what you need to know if you don't already know it about uh, the prime minister the liberal leader as the campaign gets underway. Uh, here's some things to know about Justin Trudeau. This is Justin Trudeau's third election as leader of the Liberal Party. He's 49 years old, a former school teacher. He's been an MP for almost 13 years, first elected as the MP for the Quebec riding of Papineau in 2008. He became Liberal leader in 2013. In the 2015 election, Trudeau made Canadian history as the first leader to ever take a federal political party from third place all the way to power. But in the 2019 election, his Liberals were reduced to a minority. This time around, the Liberals are hoping Justin Trudeau's leadership during the pandemic and his government's rollout of hundreds of billions of dollars in support programs outweigh opposition attacks over ethical issues 
such as the We Charity controversy. In this election, Trudeau and the Liberals are portraying themselves as the best party to ensure a green, equitable, prosperous recovery. And when he comes to the podium, we can also expect the Prime Minister to uh, talk a lot about the federal government's response under the Liberal tenure to the pandemic and uh, plans for improving the health care system uh, in uh, the years ahead. Uh, let's look at uh, the kind of um, conversation we might hear around health care when the campaign does get underway. And as soon as the Prime Minister is at uh, that podium, we'll have it live for you. Healthcare constantly ranks as a top concern for Canadian voters. And COVID-19 has shown an especially bright light on pre-existing issues where calls grow for more federal involvement. The dignity and safety of seniors, mental health and the opioid crisis, paid sick leave and other problems that, like the pandemic itself, don't discriminate. I like to think that it underscores for everyone, you know, that there but for the grace of God go I. COVID, although it did impact more people in lower socioeconomic groups, it, it impacted us all in different ways, our families, loved ones, um, the elderly in particular. Long-term care residents have bore the brunt of COVID-19, with Canadian homes having the worst mortality rate among wealthy countries. Report after report has long called for change, but perhaps it took the tragic death toll and military reports on atrocious living conditions in some homes to bring long-standing problems out of the shadows. From inspection standards and staffing levels to infection control and overcrowding. That is an area where we see, particularly on the left of centre, uh, that there is a significant appetite to see a lot of spending and a lot of change in this area. One survey found nearly half of Canadians will now do whatever it takes to avoid having themselves or family members enter long-term care. 76% want significant changes or total overhaul, and three-quarters believe long-term care belongs within the public health care system. 55% are willing to pay more taxes, and a majority also want more federal involvement, though the idea is less popular in Quebec and the prairies. The federal government has to come to the party just to just to stay still with the, I think what everyone agrees is appalling standards and long-term care in many places uh, is going to require huge amounts of investment over the next 20 years or so. As for mental health, the pandemic caused a decline in 40% of people, according to the CMHA. Low-income Canadians, Indigenous people and those with pre-existing conditions were especially hurt not to mention children and their parents coping with school closures and cancelled activities. Meanwhile, wastewater analysis found a significant increase in cannabis, uh, fentanyl and... All right, going to jump in here to bring you live now to the Prime Minister of Canada, Liberal Party leader. Let's listen to Justin Trudeau. Good morning. I want to begin today by addressing the unfolding events in Afghanistan. We've been constantly monitoring the rapidly evolving situation, and I've been briefed by officials earlier this morning to get the latest developments on the ground. As always, the safety and security of Canadian personnel is our top priority. The current situation poses serious challenges to our ability to ensure that safety and security of our mission. So as of this morning, Canadian diplomatic personnel are on their way back to Canada. We thank them for their tireless efforts to help the people of Afghanistan in their pursuit of democracy, human rights, education, health and security. Our commitment to the people of Afghanistan, including women and girls and the LGBTQ2 communities, remains unwavering. And we will honour the sacrifices of Canadians, our armed forces, diplomats, journalists, and civil society have made over the past years. Our government has also committed to resettling up to 20,000 Afghans through the ongoing Special Immigration Measures Program. Our ongoing work to bring Afghans to safety in Canada under SIMS remains a top priority, and we will continue to work in close collaboration with partners and allies on this commitment. 
Ministers Garno, Sajjan, and Mendicino will be continuing this work throughout the coming weeks. Canada firmly condemns the escalating violence, and we are heartbroken at the situation the Afghan people find themselves in today. This is especially so given the sacrifices of Canadians who believed and continue to believe in the future of Afghanistan. We will continue to work with allies and the international community to ensure that those efforts were not in vain. We are committed to Afghanistan and to the Afghan people. Thank you for joining us today here in Rideau Hall. I have just had a talk with our Governor General, and she has accepted my request to dissolve Parliament. Canadians will therefore vote on September the 20th. My friends, it's been a big couple of years. The last 17 months have been like nothing we've ever experienced. And we're all wondering what the next 17 months, not to mention the next 17 years, will hold. A global pandemic, a global recession, a global climate crisis that's causing wildfires and flooding around the world. You're probably wondering what this means for you, for your job, for your kids, for your retirement, for your community, and for your country. Well, that's fair. But just look at what Canadians did in this time of crisis, in this time of uncertainty. When this pandemic struck, Canadians dug deep. You put on your mask to keep your neighbours safe. You followed public health rules, stayed home, and supported our frontline workers. And you rolled up your sleeves to lead the world on vaccinations. No one expected this crisis. But time and time again, community after community, you showed what metal we're made of as Canadians. So don't stop now. If you haven't already, go get vaccinated. And if you have, Talk to the person you know who still needs to get their shot. They won't necessarily be easy conversations, but they're important to have. We owe it to each other. Because with our actions, we show what it means to be Canadian. And now more than ever, that matters. Look, COVID-19 wasn't something we expected as a government either. But just like you, we knew that staying true to who we are and what we believe in was the only path forward. So from day one, we focused on having your back. Because that's what we stood for. Because that's what we've always stood for. That's why we came to Ottawa in the first place, to build a government that would stand up for the middle class and people working hard to join it. That was the real change we delivered over the first six years. In fact, the very first thing we did was to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% so we could lower them for the middle class. It's the real change we delivered by lifting hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty with the Canada Child ben Benefit. Real change by delivering clean drinking water to thousands of Indigenous people in over 100 communities. By building and refurbishing almost 200 schools so far, so that tens of thousands of Indigenous kids have a better chance. It's a real change we delivered by pushing hard so that everywhere in the country there is a price on pollution and then standing firm so that in no province is it free to pollute anymore. And those are the values that drove us to deliver the CERB and the wage subsidy to make sure that Canadians could get through this crisis. We've decided to, to have the back of families with the CERB and the wage subsidy. We have supported small businesses with the assistance to paying their rent. 
and what was even clearer in 2020 and since is that our future depends on you. But we're still here. We're here to just defend you and have your back. Your voice. The decisions your government makes right now will define the future your kids and grandkids grow up in. So in this pivotal, consequential moment, who wouldn't want to say? Who wouldn't want their chance to help decide where our country goes from here? Canadians need to choose how we finish the fight against COVID-19 and build back better, from getting the job done on vaccines to having people's backs all the way to and through the end of this crisis. For example, as a government, we chose to make sure that federal public servants and everyone boarding a train or a plane be vaccinated. Not everyone agrees. Not every political party agrees. Well, Canadians should be able to weigh in on that and on so much more. We believe that a government's most important responsibility is to keep Canadians safe and thriving, and that's what we'll continue to do. We've had your, your back so far, and now it is for you to choose. It is for you to state what you think and to weigh in on the decisions that our government will make now, because that will define the future of our children and grandchildren. We're going through a historic moment, and you have, you, and you can, you can voice your opinion and choose the future of our country regarding vac vaccines or the support to give to all Canadians throughout the crease. All Canadians should be able to weigh in on how we will be ending this crisis and build better. And as a government, we decided, we decided that uh, federal civil servants and everybody boarding an airplane should be vaccinated. Not everybody, not or not every party will agree on this. So it is for Canadians to be able to state their view on these topics when we believe that the biggest responsibility of a government is to make sure that Canadians can flourish and, and can be themselves in the future. Do everything we can to keep people safe and to end this pandemic and rebuild. And I certainly don't accept any politician saying you shouldn't have your choice on how to do that or on what comes next. Because as much as we've done over the past many, many months, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. We think families looking for childcare should get that now. We think workers deserve good middle-class jobs now. We think more ambition on climate change is needed now. That's what we think. So what do you think? You deserve a say, because this is your moment. C'est le moment dès maintenant de se battre encore plus fort pour un Canada. This is the time to fight even harder for a safe and healthy Canada. This is the time to be even more ambitious in creating housing, working harder towards reconciliation, being bolder in protecting the environment and growing our economy. My friends, that is the choice you have to make in these elections. And people who've worked hard for a good retirement but are struggling, I hear you when you say you deserve better. We're ready to make sure you get it. To parents thinking about how it just keeps getting more expensive to raise a family. To young people worried about how to afford a home. You're right. It is tough. Indeed, it's unacceptable. So we're going to continue investing in housing, and we're going to keep making life more affordable. To students raising your voices on the climate crisis, yes, I'm right there with you. This is a crisis. And yes, we're banning single-use plastics, and yes, we've won the fight for a price on pollution right across this country, but yes, that's not enough. Our planet and our future 
are at stake. So I need you alongside me in this fight, because together we can do so much more than we can apart. And to kids, you've missed birthdays and school days. This pandemic has hit you hard, and you stepped up to help your moms and dads, to help your community. And now we need to step up to make sure that you're safe, to make sure we're building you the best possible future. Real solutions to the real problems we face. A better, stronger Canada for everyone. That is your future to choose. And this is your time to choose it. In this important moment, maybe the most important since 19, 1945, and certainly in most of our lifetimes, who thinks Canadians shouldn't have a say? After making it through 17 months of nothing like we've ever experienced, Canadians deserve to choose what the next 17 months, what the next 17 years and beyond will look like. And I know that we have the right plan, the right team, and the proven leadership to meet that moment. So to the other parties, please explain why you don't think Canadians should have the choice, why you don't think that this is a pivotal moment. Because I'm focused on our real plan. I'm focused on the path forward with Canadians. So to Canadians, I'm asking you to vote for real, progressive leadership, for strong health care, for affordable homes, for a clean and protected environment. Make your voice heard, have your say, and together let's move forward for everyone. I'm asking you to support a progressive and ambitious government, a strong health care system, affordable housing, a protected environment. Have your voices heard and let's move forward together. I would like to thank members of the media for being here today and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll take 20 minutes of questions. Toronto Star. You didn't use the word majority, but I know you would like a majority to enact that plan. Uh, however, the NDP says you have the confidence of Parliament. They'd support you in um, any of these measures that you talk about and all of these ambitions. So how can you justify to Canadians the need for an election that will cost $500 million in the middle of a fourth wave when you said to Canadians you would not go to the polls before the end of the pandemic? This is a really important moment in Canada's history. For the past two years, for the past 17 months specifically of the pandemic, we've been making really big, really consequential decisions. And in the last election, nobody was talking about what we might do in a pandemic. So the government and indeed Parliament needs an opportunity to get a mandate from Canadians, to hear from Canadians on how to end this pandemic how to build back better in really meaningful ways. As Canadians know, this is a moment where we're going to be taking decisions that will last not just for the coming months, but for the coming decades. And Canadians deserve their say. That's exactly what we're going to give them. I think everyone understands that this is a pivotal moment in our history as a country. The past few years, the uh, last 17 months, have required huge decisions by Parliament and the government so that we could not only get through the pandemic, but so that we could lay the foundations for a more equitable, fairer, stronger, and more prosperous society for everyone as the economy starts up again. And I think it's very important for Canadians to make their voices heard and tell us how they want us to get through the pandemic, through the end of it, how we are to build back better.
This is a time when Canadians are vaccinated in increasing numbers, but we're not out of the woods yet. How are we going to get through the end of it? Well, that warrants uh, decisions and choices by Canadians on the months to come and the decades to come. What do you say to people who think that in gambling like this in the middle of a public health crisis, that if you don't get a majority, you should resign your political futures at stake? Will you resign? I think Canadians know that our democracy is strong. I think Canadians know uh, that we are coming through this pandemic, that it's not over yet, and people need to continue uh, to step up and get vaccinated to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. And that's certainly something I'm going to keep reminding people about every single day over the coming weeks, that people need to continue to do their part protect their communities, protect each other, protect our kids who can't yet get vaccinated because they're under 12. I think this is a moment uh, where Canadians can and should be able to weigh in on what we're going through and on how we're going to build a society that is stronger and better and learns from uh, the challenges we've all experienced and the sacrifices we've all made uh, through the worst of this pandemic. The pandemic is not over. And we're going to be taking consequential decisions on how we finish with this pandemic. And I think it's Canadians' right to weigh in on that. Next question. Good morning, Prime Minister. Ashley Burke, CBC News. Sorry, Mr. Trudeau. Um, during the last sitting of Parliament, you managed to survive the throne speech. You managed to, get, managed to get your budget passed, as well as get legislation through. Can you tell Canadians what your thinking is, why you need to have an election now in order to continue to govern, and provide some concrete examples of what you feel the, the opposition has prevented you from accomplishing? I think all Canadians get that this is a historic moment we are living through. Government and indeed Parliament has enacted significant measures to support Canadians through an unprecedented crisis. And we've done it in a way that met the urgency and the intensity of what we all went through over the past many, many months. But we're at a moment now when many, many Canadians are vaccinated, many more are continuing to get vaccinated, where I think it's right for Canadians to be able to pronounce themselves on where we're going, on how we get through this, on what the next steps are for fighting the pandemic as we face a fourth wave, but also what the next steps are for rebuilding our communities, our society, our country, so that it is better and more resilient for years to come. Canadians need to have their say. Nobody asked anyone how they thought we should manage a pandemic in the 2019 election. And together, Parliament and indeed Canadians have done incredibly well. We are leading the world on vaccinations. We've stepped up to protect our loved ones and Canadians are continuing to step up. But it's time we had a national conversation, a national direction on those next steps. And that's exactly what we're going to be able to do over the next six weeks. Following up? Or however many weeks there are. Can you also explain to Canadians who are tuning in why you are calling this election now when there are thousands of people in Afghanistan who you've promised to help, who are in, in a severe danger of being captured or killed, and, and you're doing this on a day when you've just announced that the embassy is closing? Again, um, we are extremely concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, and I can assure you uh, that officials and indeed ministers continue and will continue to weigh in on protecting Canadians, getting Canadians uh, safely out of Afghanistan, and continuing to step up, as Canada has so many times around the world, to bring people to safety. We will be accepting in 20,000 Afghans into Canada. And that means, once again, as Canadians have so many times, they get to step up and welcome people into their homes, into their communities, who are fleeing horrific violence, building a better life for themselves, for their families, and through that work, building a better life for all Canadians. 
It's something that we've done. It's something we're going to continue to do. And our democracy and our democratic institutions are strong enough to be able to ensure that even as we do this important work for Afghanistan, we're able to check in and make sure that Canadians have their voice on the extraordinarily pressing issues facing them here in this country right now and for the coming years. We remain deeply concerned by the situation in Afghanistan. For many years, Canada has been committed to improving the uh, present and future of uh, the Afghan people. And it's with great sadness that we see what's happening now. I can assure you that our diplomats, our officials, and our minister, and I myself, uh, whom I've just received a briefing on uh, the situation on the ground this morning, we will all continue to do the important work that's needed to bring all Canadians back home and to ensure that we can welcome 20,000 Afghan people and their families in the months to come. Our democracy is strong enough and our systems are strong enough so that while we are doing that important work, we can also give all Canadians a chance to have a say in how we are to continue our work to get through the remaining pandemic and to build back better for the years and for decades to come because this is a pivotal moment in Canada's history. Thank you. Next question. Can you please clarify what the government will still do for the former interpreters and other embassy staff who are Afghans, who are still in Afghanistan? Will those people still be brought back to Canada and how? The security situation on the ground is uh, extremely uh, fast evolving. Uh, we are uh, in close contact with our allies, uh, with the Americans who have uh, increased their pre troop presence on the ground to secure uh, the airport and the green zone in Afghanistan, in, in around Kabul. Uh, we will continue uh, to work uh, to get as many uh, Afghan interpreters and their families out as quickly as possible, as long as the security uh, situation holds. And we will continue to work over the coming months. Uh, to resettle refugees uh, who uh, will flee Afghanistan, who will look uh, to come to start new lives in Canada. Uh, we've talked about 20,000 of them, and that's uh, something that we're able to do because Canadians will once again open their homes, their communities, and their hearts to people fleeing from violence uh, in far-off parts of the world. At the same time, I want to take a moment uh, to thank all the members of the Canadian Armed Forces, past and present. Uh, those who uh, fought so incredibly bravely and saw uh, fellow CAF members fall by the wayside over our years of engagement in Afghanistan, but also those who are on the ground right now, continuing to work to support the people who've supported Canadians in our time there, continue to be there as we speak, working to get as many people out to safety as possible. Our Canadian Armed Forces do an extraordinary job in stepping up, in being there to promote Canadian values, to s help people around the world. And today, like every day, they re deserve our recognition and thanks. Following up? Our reporters, uh, not just with The Globe, but from many media outlets, are being flooded with calls from former interpreters and their family in tears, fearing for their life. Meantime, the embassy in Canada is, has been evacuated and your government says they're on their way home. So how will you bring these people home and when will that happen? We continue to work to process and support uh, people seeking to flee Afghanistan and come to Canada in safety. Obviously, uh, the uh, security situation is extremely concerning on the ground and the protection of uh, Canadians and our armed forces are top of mind. But we continue to do the work on uh, allowing and enabling uh, 
uh, people who've been there for Canadians, whether it's interpreters or drivers or security or whatever, uh, to make sure that they're coming to safety. There are also human rights activists and uh, civil society leaders, uh, journalists uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, community leaders who we are working with to try and make sure uh, that we are offering them uh, the safety and the future that they deserve. Bonjour, Raymond Fillion de TVA. M. Trudeau, bien des Canadiens ce matin. Raymond Fillion, TVA. Mr. Trudeau, many Canadians are wondering whether it's responsible for the leader of the government to be on the road for five or six weeks when this crisis isn't over yet and we're at the beginning of a fourth wave. Is that a responsible thing to do? I think it's extremely important in this very pivotal moment to give Canadians a choice about how we continue to fight the pandemic, which, as you say, is not over yet. However, given that the great majority of Canadians are vaccinated and others are continuing to get their shots, because every single day of this campaign, I'm going to be there. I'm going to be continuing to encourage everyone who hasn't had a shot to get one and encourage them to, to do so. It's very important at a time when the choices we make as a parliament, as a government, will have a direct impact on the lives of people during the crisis and for the years to come. Well, I think it's very important for us to be offering Canadians a choice and to let them have their say on how we will continue going through this pandemic, something that wasn't a, a topic in the 2019 elections. We didn't know that there was going to be a pandemic in 2019, and I think that we've done an extraordinary job with vaccines, with uh, measures to support one another. It is important, however, for Canadians to be able to have a say on uh, the next steps as we get through the end of the pandemic and build back better for the next years and months and years. Well, why not wait a few months? And coming back to my colleague's question, if you don't get the majority you're seeking, will you resign? I think we very much need to point out how much better things are for us now as a country because of efforts the Canadians may that Canadians have made, our health care workers, our frontline workers who've done such an extraordinary job in getting through the pandemic and keeping us safe, but also Canadians who've made tremendous sacrifices by staying home, by being there for one another, and by getting vaccinated in record numbers. We are the top-ranking country in the world when it comes to vaccines. We are having barbecues. We are going to the supermarket. Life is coming back, or at least closer to normal. There is a fourth wave coming, but people understand that our institutions are strong enough to continue working even during difficult times. And especially at a difficult time when decisions made by Parliament, decisions made by the government will have a tremendous impact on the lives of people, not only in the months, but in the years to come. It's very important for Canadians to have their say. Mr. Trudeau, Catherine Lévesque, uh, La Presse, Canadian Press. I'm putting this question for the third time. If uh, you achieve only a minority government at the end of this, will you resign? We are at a point where Canadians deserve to have a say, deserve to decide on how they want the next steps of the fight against this pandemic to take place and how we are to build back better. In previous years, I have shown my values, I have shown how I believe we can build back better. I have shown that I have the team that we need, that I have the plan, that we have the plan to improve the lot of millions of Canadians. 
who understand that we are at a point where choices will have a, a crucial impact. Canadians will have a say on what mandate they give the government and parliament. My job as a Canadian is to continue to be here and continue to support Canadians as long as it takes with everything it takes, as I've always said. Well, you didn't quite answer the question. In 2019, you chose to launch your uh, campaign in BC. Now you are starting it in Quebec. What uh, role will Quebec be playing in the upcoming election? And do you think that it's Quebec ridings that will give you a majority? I started the last campaign in my home in British Columbia. Now I'm going to my home in Montreal. I'm at home everywhere in this country. And the important isn't the what's important isn't necessarily what we do from day to day. It's what we will hear when we engage with Canadians who will have an important choice to make in these elections how we are to continue fighting the pandemic and how we are to build back better. In all parts of the country, the concerns will be different. And I think this campaign provides an opportunity to hear concerns very clearly, to hear what Canadians' concerns are. Quebec is going to be important to me as a Quebecer, but the whole country is important to me because how did we get through this pandemic together by working with the premiers of provinces and territories in a totally unprecedented way? We work together on huge issues, be it uh, daycare spaces, be it assistance for small business, be it uh, the fight against climate change. We have always been there to work with Canadians and to have their backs from coast to coast to coast. You've had a lot of announcements in the last couple of weeks, even this morning, new child care agreements, long-term care agreements with provinces. You're insisting that you need an election to go to the people to get a mandate, but you're doing all of these things. You didn't wait for an election. So if you can do all of those things without an election, why do you need a mandate f further? This is about giving Canadians an opportunity to weigh in at a really pivotal time. Yes, you talk about the child care agreements that we've signed with uh, eight different provinces and territories and are going to ensure that millions upon millions of Canadians have access to affordable child care. Well, this is something that we talked about in the 2019 election. Talked about it again in the uh, 2021 budget. And we're moving forward on that. But there are many things in regards to ending this pandemic, in regards to building back better, that we didn't talk about two years ago in the 2019 election, that I think Canadians have a right to weigh in on. We've seen situations where uh, conservative backbenchers have referred to some of this government's decisions as tyrannical in terms of how we're uh, make, creating mandates for vaccination of public servants or vaccination of people on trains and airplanes. Well, the answer to tyranny is to have an election. And I think people who disagree uh, with this government or disagree with this direction uh, should have an opportunity to make themselves heard. And that's what this election is all about. It's allowing Canadians to weigh in. It's allowing Canadians to be heard, allowing Canadians to, in this moment where we are uh, so strongly vaccinated and looking towards the future, not just the end of this pandemic, but how we build back better, looking for an opportunity to make sure the decisions being taken in Parliament and by government are reflected, are reflective of the hopes and dreams of Canadians. I'm also curious, with the fourth wave in Canada clearly uh, underway and there's risks of having a pandemic election, what do you think those biggest risks are and is that worth it to you? I think obviously uh, with the rise in numbers, uh, uh, case numbers amongst the unvaccinated, now that does represent a risk. And that's why it's going to be so important that we continue, all parties, to encourage uh, everyone across this country to continue to get vaccinated. If you haven't gotten your first dose yet, get your, your first dose. If you're waiting for your second dose, book it now. We need to make sure that as many Canadians as possible are protected against this disease. Because there are Canadians 
kids under 12. Uh, immunocompromised Canadians who, for medical reasons, can't get protected, who are going to be relying on everyone else who can get vaccinated to get vaccinated to keep them safe. My kids uh, have to get tested and show vaccinations uh, before they go to summer camp, the older ones. We're expecting kids to be vaccinated in many different situations, and they're stepping up for that. I think it's the least adults can do to step up and get vaccinated to protect those kids who can't get vaccinated yet. And that's the message we're going to keep pushing out there, that people need to continue to get vaccinated. And we're going to keep moving forward on measures that both encourage people to get vaccinated, but also make it more difficult for unvaccinated people to spread the disease to others. This is an important principle that this government is taking, and it's certainly something that, amongst others, Canadians have a right to weigh in on, and that's what this election will be about. Thank you. We'll take one last question. Bonjour, Julianne Lapointe, Radio Canada. Julianne Lapointe, Radio Canada. For many Canadians, do not want an election. Alors, they feel betrayed because you'll be using public funds, whereas they had to tighten their belt for months and months. I think people understand to what extent uh, we're not really uh, in any kind of normality. We're trying to decide how to build back better. We're trying to deal with uh, what's going on. Over the past 17 months, Parliament and the government had to make huge decisions that will have an impact on the lives of Canadians for years to come. I think that at this point, Canadians deserve to have their voices heard. They deserve to be able to weigh in, to have a say on how we are to get through the rest of the pandemic, how we are to build back better in the months and years to come. That is democracy. It gives Canadians an opportunity to have their voices heard and to choose the direction of, of, of government. So Canadians will have to have a say, and they will. They'll be able to weigh in on the pandemic and on the future. I know that millions of Canadians across the country want to be heard, want to have a say on decisions we're making, on the choices coming up for the months and years to come. Un nouveau gouvernement, ça veut nécessairement dire une période d'ajustement, des nouveaux députés, des gens qui vont devoir apprivoiser un nouveau travail aussi. To Alors, learn how to work. So how do you think you'll be able to get the machinery rolling quickly, especially at a point when we might be seized by a fourth wave? The work of governments in continuing to protect Canadians will continue. We will carry on doing what we need to do with regard to Afghanistan, with regard to Haiti, where once again they are facing uh, dreadful events that, that are heartbreaking. The government and our partners in the provinces will continue doing what's needed to keep Canadians safe in the weeks to come. We, obviously, are going to be very glad to welcome new members, members that Canadians will elect to represent them in Ottawa from the parties, uh, the various parties. And I know that Canadians' ability to choose what their mandate will be, to choose their plan for the future of this country, to choose who's in Parliament and make decisions that are going to be so important in Canada's history. I think that this is an important moment for all Canadians, a pivotal moment, and I am very much looking forward to putting forward our vision and sharing with Canadians my optimism for Canada's future as a whole. One of the things we know is that even while there's an election going on, the work of our government continues. 
whether it's dealing with Afghanistan or dealing with the heartbreak of yet another uh, terrible earthquake in Haiti, or whether it's uh, continuing to do the necessary work to keep Canadians safe through this pandemic and work uh, with our partners across all the provinces who are themselves working very hard on dealing with this fourth wave amongst unvaccinated people. Our institutions are strong. The opportunity we have right now for Canadians to make themselves heard and to send, in many cases, new representatives to Ottawa to be their voices, voices for their communities in Ottawa, to be able to have their choices resonate not just through the end of this pandemic but into the coming years and decades as we build back better. This is a moment in which Canadians deserve to have their voices heard. Canadians deserve to make their choices. And like I said, I'll leave it for the others to explain why they don't think Canadians should get to weigh in in this extraordinarily consequential historic moment. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse d'aujourd'hui. This is what said his presser. Merci tout le monde. Thank you, everybody. All right, there we have it. Justin Trudeau confirming uh, the Governor General has dissolved Parliament and Canadians will be going to the polls on September 20th. The election campaign underway today. Uh, we'll be hearing from the opposition leader, Aaron O'Toole, in about five minutes from now. In fact, we have a shot, I think, of Mary Simon uh, after during the meeting signing the proclamations, uh, this photo from Rideau Hall, signing the proclamations to dissolve Parliament and uh, trigger an election which begins today. And then we'll be hearing from Aaron O'Toole. So the message from Justin Trudeau, a lot of people waiting to hear him justify the reason for the election. Uh, simply put, it's time for Canadians to have a say about what happens next in the pandemic and what happens uh, in terms of rebuilding the economy and rebuilding Canada, turning it around to some extent in the opposition parties saying, look, some of the measures we've been taken, uh, critics have called tyrannical. So if we're tyrannical, let's have an election and let Canadians uh, decide. Uh, and lots of questions about uh, the uh, deteriorating situation in Afghanistan as well. But let's focus on uh, the Prime Minister's comments about uh, election timing. And let's go back to our panel of political commentators, Susan Smith, Ashton Arsenault, and uh, Kim Wright. Thank you all for staying with us. And uh, look, we just heard at length from the, from the Prime Minister. So let me start with, with Ashton here. And Ashton, uh, did you hear a compelling argument there from the Prime Minister about why Canadians need an election now? In part, the argument is... Uh, your uh, party and some others have suggested that he's being tyrannical, so let's let Canadians decide. Uh, well, what I heard was the Liberals want more power and they want a majority. Um, if you go back and listen to the clips package that we were watching earlier, uh, I feel like the majority of folks that you interviewed actually agreed with that position, that an election was absolutely not necessary currently. But what a jarring start to a campaign when UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson has recalled Parliament to deal with the situation on the ground in Afghanistan while our Prime Minister is asking for another four-year mandate. Uh, pretty jarring optics, if you ask me. I, I know the Prime Minister said it was uh, crucial, pivotal, monumental, um, used a number of words to describe the current time that we all find ourselves in. But what he didn't say is actually why it was necessary. So. The takeaway, they want four more years in power. Uh, Kim, what are your thoughts on what you heard from the Prime Minister? Yeah, there was no overarching narrative. And what I'm very concerned about is, you know, again, this goes to talk a good game. For weeks now, we have heard that there is a, a deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. We're hearing from interpreters who put their lives on the line for Canadians. And Canadians have a proud history of diplomatic service around the world in our military actions. But when push comes to shove, these interpreters are being left to when it's safe to get them out, when maybe we get around to filling out the darn paperwork. They could have got these folks out weeks ago. Uh, they didn't do that. And now they're now we're looking at some pretty stark realities of what the executions will be like of some of some of these folks on the ground. And that's the prime minister's fault. They could have easily uh, evacuated them. Look, we've we've all heard about what Ambassador Taylor did. Uh, to get people out of out of Iran, uh, it is just unfathomable to me that we will leave uh, people stranded behind because it was too hard to get around to it. And all I can say for the rest of his conversation points around why a campaign now, uh, 
look, health care, child care, pharma care, all of these things, he has support in the House to do them. He hasn't done them uh, to nearly the extent I think should be done. And if he wants to hear what Canadians have to think, I'm sure he's going to get an earful on the campaign. And Canadians may not uh, give him the right. answer he's quite looking for. Aaron O'Toole, in one minute from now, Susan, uh, go ahead. Uh, so why was this, uh, did you, you presumably heard a compelling case you thought from Justin Trudeau about why Canadians need a vote now? Well, he laid it out there. He said, we're at a, we Canadians have a choice and they deserve to choose the kind of future we have in terms of how we're going to handle coming out of this campaign. He reminded Canadians that when in the last election, 2019, there was no pandemic on the horizon. The government's taken measures to protect Canadians, look after them, and now they need. Now they're giving Canadians the choice and the opportunity uh, because the decisions that are taking now will affect our kids and our grandkids. I think the prime minister was very clear. The other thing he was was exceptionally prime ministerial. He started off on the Afghan situation. We talked earlier, Peter, mm -hmm. while we were waiting for the PM about how events will continue to happen, how you can't, as much as we love in Canada, to have the world stop, it's not going to. And uh, I think Justin Trudeau showed Canadian cities a firm grip on the situation, bringing 20,000, uh, the goal to bring 20,000 Afghans to Canada as quickly as possible. We've demonstrated we can do it with our Syrian refugees that we brought to Canada. We can do that again. But fundamentally, the PM said, to Canadians, and he challenged the other leaders to say, right. why won't you give Canadians a choice about the kind of okay. future well, that's going to happen coming out of let's this Let's hear what Aaron O'Toole has to say about it. He's at the podium. Let's listen in. This past year and a half has been difficult for all of us. Across the country, families have lost loved ones before their time. Hardworking Canadians have lost their jobs and have seen the cost of living skyrocket. We're finally at a point, thanks to the efforts of all Canadians who've stayed at home, got tested, got vaccinated, where we can see our loved ones, our friends, and our families again. We shouldn't be risking that for political games or political gain. La dernière année a été difficile pour tout le monde. Partout au pays, des familles ont perdu des proches. Uh, they travail away, away. Their families have lost their loved ones, their fam workers have lost their jobs, and prices continue to skyrocket. Canadians have made many efforts. During the pandemic, you stayed at home. You had yourself tested, and you received the vaccine. And this has been productive, it's been successful, because we can now see our friends, our neighbours again, our dear ones, our dear friends. But we mustn't endanger all the work we've done just for political gains or political games. ...about the best interests of Canadians would be straining every sinew to secure the recovery right now. Instead, Justin Trudeau has called an election. That's Justin Trudeau's choice. And I hope that his decision doesn't cost Canadians too dearly. My wife, Rebecca, and I had COVID-19. We know the fears and uncertainties that are out there. But let's be clear. This election is not about the next week, the next month, or even the next year. It's about the next four years. It's about who will deliver the economic recovery Canada needs. It's about who will take action to protect Canadians from spiraling living costs from rising taxes, from poorer services. For the past six years, we've been promised solutions, and year after year after year, Justin Trudeau has let the Canadian people down. The result? Hard-pressed families struggling to pay bills and worried about the cost of food, of housing, of heating. And the Liberal Party's answer? to ask you to reward them with another four years of majority government for doing the bare minimum. Another four years of broken promises and of letting Canadians down. And the NDP, Greens and Bloc Québécois, they support spending other people's money as much as the Liberals. They're all the same. Depuis six ans, on nous promet des solutions. But year after year, Justin Trudeau has just dropped Canadians. What's the result? Families who are under stress, who find it difficult to pay their bills, people who are worried, 
People are worried about the price of food, the price of housing, the price of heating. And what's the answer of the Liberal Party? They're asking you now to reward them with another four years. Another four years of false promises, of doing the minimum, and of just abandoning Canadians. And the Bloc and the NDP or the Greens, what are they going to do? Well, just like the Liberals, they want to spend your money. They're all the same. Isn't enough. Canadians need more. Canada needs more. We need a strong economy to support high wages for workers and great infrastructure. We need a strong economy so that today's Canadians can have confidence that tomorrow will be brighter for the next generation. Canadians deserve to know what their politicians will deliver. They deserve to know that there's a plan and they deserve a government that will keep its word. Twelve years in the military have taught me to always have a plan. Canada's recovery plan will unite our country and secure the future. I am a new Conservative leader with a proven track record and a fresh approach. It's Canada's recovery plan to get our economy firing on all cylinders and to get our public finances under control. It's our plan to secure one million jobs tough new anti-corruption laws, mental health action, securing Canadian-made medical supplies, balancing the budget. Les 12 ans que j'ai passé dans les forces armées canadiennes m'ont appris... I spent in the Canadian forces have shown me that you always have to have a plan. And that's what we want to do with the Canada Recovery Plan. The Recovery Plan will help us to stimulate our economy, to get it moving again and to manage our public our fiscal position responsibly. It's our plan to act. A million jobs, new tough anti-corruption legislation, action in terms of mental health, medical supplies made in Canada, and a balanced budget, and solutions to deal with the shortage of manpower. The alternative is Justin Trudeau's entitled government, borrowing $424 million a day racking up $1.4 trillion of debt that he's going to ask you and your children to pay back. We can't afford more of the same. We can't afford more borrowing and higher costs of living while Justin hands out contracts to his friends. Conservatives will stand up for hardworking Canadians and their families. We'll work for you, not a small group of people in Ottawa who help themselves, lobbyists, donors, and friends of the Liberal Party, will work relentlessly to make sure that for generations to come, Canadians can grow up with world-class services, a healthy economy, and healthy finances. Canada is a country where politicians must earn trust, not one where you're born into power and can take it for granted. Our team is ready to get to work, to earn your vote and then deliver that plan. The election is about the future, and the choice is this. Who do you trust to secure your economic future? There are five parties, but two choices. Canada's Conservatives or more of the same. Vote for a strong economy. Vote for Canada's recovery plan. Vote to secure the future. Vote Conservative. A qui faites-vous confiance pour agir pour votre avenir économique? Uh, to act for your uh, economic future? Well, there are five parties, but just two choices. You have the Conservatives, or you have more scandals, more spending, more debt. Vote for a strong economy. Vote for the party, the recovery plan of Canada. Vote for the future. So, vote Conservative. Thank you very much. Andrew Lawton, True North. You've been very vocal in pushing for transparency with regard to the uh, National Microbiology Lab uh, security leak. 
We've heard stories of Chinese infiltration of Canadian institutions, of influence campaigns against uh, politicians. How big a threat do you think uh, Chinese regime infiltration is? And if elected, what would you do to counter that? Justin Trudeau has been offside with respect to communist China for six years. And our citizens, the two Michaels, are approaching 1,000 days in prison. It's been the Conservative Party that's been standing up like Canadian governments of the past, for human rights, for our dignity, whether our motion with respect to the Uyghur minority population and the genocide, with respect to banning Huawei from our critical 5G infrastructure. Mr. Trudeau is completely offside with our values as a country and our allies. And the risks to our economy, to our public safety, are real. So Canadians need to know a Conservative government will never sacrifice your security, the well-being of our country and our values at home and abroad. In September, you pledged to balance the budget within 10 years. More recently, we've heard projections from the parliamentary budget officer that we could be running deficits until 2070 for 50 years. Do you think that balancing in 10 years is still feasible? And if so, what would that course correction from an O'Toole government look like? It looks like Canada's recovery plan, our five-point plan to secure the future. We will get the budget back to balance over the course of the next decade, our fifth pillar, because our first pillar is going to get people working in all sectors of the economy and in all regions of the country. We're the only party that supports people getting back to work in the energy, the softwood lumber, steel, aluminum, our fabricators. We value small businesses and, ha and will have very detailed programs to help those in hospitality, tourism, hanging on by a thread. We will have the economy surging in the right direction for all Canadians, and that will allow us to balance the budget over the course of the next decade by helping people get back to work in all parts of this country. Good morning, Mr. O'Toole. What's the position of the Conservative Party on mandatory vaccination of government public servants? Thank you for your question. Uh, vaccines are very important. Vaccines are effective and safe, and I encourage all Canadians, all Quebecers, to get vaccinated. My wife, Rebecca, and myself, we were hit with COVID-19, and that's we published our vaccination. It's a very important tool in order to turn the economy around and in order to combat the fourth wave. I support strengthened measures, such wearing of masks, so as to be able to show a negative test result and also a quick testing for those people who haven't yet been vaccinated. These are precautions, reasonable precautions, that we have to take. Justin Trudeau, once again, has just uh, let Canada down on the election. An election during the fourth wave is another example of Justin Trudeau's failure. Vaccines are safe and secure for use. They're a critical tool in fighting COVID-19. That's why Conservatives have been pushing for a year to get a stable supply of vaccines early. That's why my wife and I, Rebecca and I, had COVID-19. And we know vaccines are critical, why we videoed our, our vaccination process. We must work together to fight COVID-19. And I support enhanced measures such as masking, showing a negative test, and rapid testing for those who are unvaccinated. Those are reasonable precautions that we can all use to fight together against COVID-19. Mr. Trudeau is launching an election in the fourth wave of a pandemic, not securing the health and economic well-being of Canadians after he let the Delta variant into this country. This is a time for us to work together for the well-being of all Canadians. As regards vaccination, mandatory vaccination of federal public servants. What's your position on that? Well, as I said, vaccines are effective and safe, and I encourage all Quebecers and all Canadians to get themselves vaccinated. 
It's a very important tool, together with the other tools, such as wearing masks, uh, faster testing systems, and conservative support. I argue that Canada can make their own decisions, Canadians can make their own decisions. We have to educate. We must enforce people. And we have to work together against the fourth wave of COVID-19. And that's why we've got a plan. The fourth pillar of our plan for turning Canada around. More self-sufficiency in terms of vaccination for medical equipment. And we have to be more ready in the future, better prepared for any pandemic. Hannah Thibodeau from CBC National News. Hope you're doing well. I, I want to ask you more on vaccines, please. Uh, when it comes to mandatory vaccines, uh, Mr. Trudeau says it should be mandatory for federal workers who go on planes or trains. You have said get your vaccine, but you don't believe in mandatory vaccines. He says this will be a part of the decision that Canadians will make on which party believes in this. But also, I want to ask you, sir. Do you believe in a vaccine passport for people who have been vaccinated to have access to certain events or venues because they have gone out there to get their vaccines? Thank you, Hannah. As, as you know, my wife, Rebecca, and I publicized our vaccination process to show Canadians directly that vaccines are not only safe and effective, they're the critical tool in turning the page in COVID-19. We have to try and encourage and have as many people as vaccinated as possible and then take reasonable precautions to use other tools to keep all Canadians safe. As I said, using rapid testing, using screening, using masking, all of the tools that Canadians have learned to, to live with in the last 15 months, we have to, to use to fight COVID-19. And the federal government should respect and partner with any of the provinces on their approaches to keep Canadians safe as well. Some provinces will use a pass passport, a vaccine passport, other provinces will use a a combination of measures to fight against the spread. I'm very disappointed, honestly, that Mr. Trudeau calling an election amidst a fourth wave of a pandemic is trying to confuse and divide people with respect to their health care decisions. Oh, Je vais toujours travailler en I will always work uh, closely with provinces on health and uh, on the well-being of Canadians and Quebecers. We have to work together, and I will always respect the decisions uh, made in Quebec, like a vaccine passport and uh, other tools uh, um, from coast to coast, because we have to work together. I'm disappointed uh, by Mr. Trudeau's approach uh, uh, in the middle of a fourth wave, uh, the fact that he's calling uh, an election. and. Uh, is dividing people on uh, the issue of the health. We have to educate and not force people, and uh, we have the necessary tools to fight against the fourth wave. Believe in vaccine passports yourself, and then just to clarify my first question, and then second, will all of your candidates be vaccinated? As I've said, and it's critical for Canadians to, to hear this, vaccines are safe and effective for use, and I encourage all Canadians to get vaccinated and to ask questions if they have any questions about the process. That's why I've been very public. My wife and I got vaccines and did it on video because we all have to work together. We also have to work to use the other tools that are there as well. And there can be reasonable accommodations using masking, using rapid testing, using screening to make sure we keep people safe. It's time for us to work together and I can assure you the Conservative Party, all of our team members, all of our candidates will be working hard to try and work with public health leaders to follow health advice and to keep Canadians safe amidst an election being caused, called for no reason other than political gain by Mr. Trudeau. He knows there's a fourth wave. He has all of the briefings. He has more information than all Canadians. And I sincerely hope Justin Trudeau is not putting people at risk by launching this election. Next question. Abigail Beeman, Global News. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I'd like to ask you about the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory video on Twitter. I'm wondering how much of a setback it is for you to have a number of caucus members uh, criticize a party video on the eve of an election and if unity is something you'll have to be working on in, in this campaign. Conservatives are united. We don't think we should be having an election in a fourth wave. 
but we do see the division caused by Mr. Trudeau, the flight of jobs and investment in our country. Our country's never been so divided, and we're going to present a serious plan. Canada's recovery plan, our five-pillar plan to kickstart an economic recovery. Our team is united about getting Canada back to work and making sure we're never again unprepared for a crisis as we have been over the last 15 months. I'd also like to ask you, now that you have been a Conservative leader for a year and you talked about getting Canadians to know you better and there are still Canadians who, who don't know you very well, I'm wondering what you're going to do to change that in, in what's going to be a tight uh, time frame in this campaign. Well, I've been the COVID leader in a year, but I'm really proud of our team and I'm really proud of our efforts to connect with Canadians on Zoom and through all means and we'll be doing that later today. I'll be talking to thousands of Canadians later today as I have as leader of the opposition. Canada needs a plan. It's been a tough year for everyone, including my family, all Canadian families. Our five point Canada's recovery plan will address everything from jobs to accountability, trust in government, issues under Mr. Trudeau's cycle of scandals, national mental health leadership, an issue that's been important to me since I left the military, making sure we're ready and making sure we get our finances under control. I know that Canadians are worried about the future and as they get to know me, I bring people together, I deliver, and we have a plan to secure the future. Laurence Martin from Radio Canada, I would like to go back to my, the question asked by my colleague from CBC. Are all of your candidates vaccinated? All our candidates will work very hard on the ground and will follow public health rules. As I said, vaccines are very important. Uh, they are a, an essential tool to fight COVID-19. And in our team, we will work uh, harder uh, in order uh, to follow all uh, health measures from coast to coast. This is not really a response to my question, but uh, uh, the gay pride uh, uh, in Montreal today, and some leaders are there. When you became uh, a leader of the Conservative Party, you said you would be attending such events. Uh, what kind of message do you think, think that you're sending by not being there today? I am uh, preparing for an election, of course, but I have uh, uh, been very clear about the LGBTQ community, um, their ally. I will work with that community on their welfare uh, to protect their rights, and I will participate uh, in uh, gay pride events in the future because as an MP, I already uh, participated in such events in my riding. You, you say that Justin Trudeau is putting people at risk by forcing us into an election campaign. And yet you won't require your own candidates who are going to be directly interfacing with the public, with voters, to be vaccinated. Why not? Well, Glenn, Mr. Trudeau's made a decision to launch an election in the fourth wave of pandemic. There's no reason for this election. And in fact, we've asked him not to. But as Canadians have seen over six years, Mr. Trudeau will always put his own self-interest, interest of insiders, ahead of the national interest. And he's doing that again. I hope there's no risk. I'm disappointed in his decision. Our team, from myself right through to all of our candidates, will follow public health guidance and make sure we're part of the fight against the fourth wave. It has been a tough 15 months for our country. That's why we have a plan to get our country back to work, Canada's recovery plan. And as we communicate that, Glenn, we're going to be making sure we follow all public health guidance to keep people safe. You've been traveling the country over past months. You were at the Calgary Stampede, for example. Uh, and now, with a very short election ca campaign starting, you were spending the first part of it, the first day, and possibly all day tomorrow, in a hotel ballroom in Ottawa, nowhere near voters. Does that not look performative, that you're trying to emphasize the idea of virtual campaigning when you haven't been virtually campaigning before? And, and What's the reason why you're stuck here in the Ottawa bubble and not getting out and meeting people? What's been great in the last month and a half, Glenn, is I've been finally able, as the opposition leader, to get out there. The Calgary Stampede, the, the, the greatest outdoor show on earth, was amazing. I've, I've met people and, and saw the risks of the fires in British Columbia. I met with folks in the offshore industry in Newfoundland and Labrador who have been under attack, have been completely 
neglected by, by Mr. Trudeau. I've met with small business owners in all parts of the country in person, wearing masks, following measures. Today, using some of the innovations we've learned over the last year, I will be speaking to thousands of Canadians directly in Quebec, in British Columbia, and in some other provinces as well. So we're going to have exciting opportunities to get out and, and see people on the ground, hear about their concerns, talk about Canada's recovery plan. But we also are going to use some of the technology that allows us to connect directly and be accountable to Canadians. On va utiliser tous les outils. We will use all available tools in this election, including technology. Uh, we uh, met people on the ground uh, uh, from coast to coast. I went to Levy with my daughter Molly uh, for Dominique Vian's uh, candidacy, a strong voice uh, for the greater Montreal region. And we will uh, have uh, a strong dialogue with Quebecers. We will talk about our plan to put Canada back to work uh, virtually on the ground in regions in Quebec and throughout the country. Specifically, as Prime Minister, would you have done or would you be doing to deal with the ongoing crisis in Afghanistan and the uh, events of today? Well, these are very sad events today in Afghanistan, and my, my heart goes out to the thousands of military families across the country who, in the last few weeks, have, have really been suffering because we lost people in that country. Um, and for many of our veterans, uh, it's horrible to see the Taliban once again securing control of the country. I, my heart is also breaking for the women and, and young girls there. Um, that's why Canada was there, our longest mission. And to think they're, they're going to be subjected to those um, horrific conditions. So Canada must work with our allies. And we're going to be standing up for dignity and for human rights as a government because Mr. Trudeau has not. And today I'm, I'm really thinking about our, our military families. This is a very difficult time for them. My heart goes out to military families throughout the country because our forces took part in the war in Afghanistan for human rights for girls and women over there and it's a hard time for military families and we have to work closely with our allies to help and I will be there as a Prime Minister to uphold our values and for human rights working with our allies throughout the world. You said the Conservative Party needed to have the courage to change in order to have a more positive result than it's had recently. Um, there was pushback then on climate change. Do you think your party, can you seriously say, has your party changed as you go into this election? We have the courage to put our country first with a plan to get the country working in all parts of the country and in all sectors of our economy. And our party has put forward some incredible ideas that Canadians will be getting to know more details on in the next few months. We are the only option that want to get people working, want to help the small businesses that have been hardest hit to restore accountability and trust in not only the Prime Minister's office with three personal ethical investigations, the sexual misconduct allegation cover-up in the military for three years, people are losing faith. We have a plan to restore that. We have a plan to show leadership on mental health, on preparedness, and get our finances under control. So there's courage in the plan we're presenting. And I invite Canadians. I am a new leader with a new style, and I'm in this for you and your families. And my entire adult life, I've served Canada, and now I'm asking for your trust to secure our future. This will be the last question. This will be the last question. Hi, Mr. O'Toole, Chris Reynolds, Canadian Press. I haven't heard you speak directly to several questions around vaccination and your own Conservative candidates. I'm wondering, again, will you be requiring candidates in the Conservative Party to be vaccinated, or will you even be asking them to get vaccinated? Chris, as I've said, vaccines are a critical tool. They're safe and effective, 
and Conservatives for the last year, as you know, have been demanding vaccine supply and access and encouraging Canadians to get vaccinated. Um, I think we can also have an approach that uses a whole suite of health measures from rapid testing and screening, mask usage, to have reasonable accommodations uh, for people that may not be vaccinated, whether young children or, or, or other people. We have to use all of the tools and not divide Canadians. Let's work together to fight the fourth wave. I don't think we should be having an election in a fourth wave, but public officials should be talking about all of the measures we've learned in the last few years. All families have a collection of masks at home. Let's use them. Let's use all of our tools. Let's talk about vaccines, rapid tests, distancing, mask usage to fight COVID-19 together. This morning, Justin Trudeau said that Canadians have a, a right to weigh in, a right to have their voices heard and, and vote in an election. Uh, should the Prime Minister resign if he is reduced or, sorry, if he stays at a minority government status? Canadians deserve the right to have a government that will be ready for a crisis. Canadians deserve to have the right for a government that puts their interests ahead of the interests of lobbyists and insiders and friends of Mr. Trudeau and his, and his family. Canadians have a right to a plan and to a team that will deliver what we're promising Canadians. So I'm going to be presenting Canada's recovery plan. I have a track record of bringing people together from my time in the military, my time in the private sector as a volunteer. I'm in this for my children and your children. And so Canadians have a right to see the options. There may be five parties, but there's only two choices, Canada's Conservatives, or more of the same from the Liberals and their, the other parties. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Merci Thank you very much. Hello again, Peter Van Dusen with our live continuing coverage here on CPAC as the uh, Vote 2021 campaign gets underway officially today. I've been listening to Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. Uh, if I can uh, summarize quickly here, essentially uh, challenging again the timing of the election campaign, saying it shouldn't be happening, that uh, you know Justin Trudeau is putting the health of Canadians uh, in second place behind his own self-interests. Uh, in calling the election as he did, but you also heard lots of questions, and this will likely quickly become a point of uh, demarcation in the campaign with Aaron O'Toole refusing to say whether he supports mandatory vaccinations for federal workers and uh, refusing to say whether he will insist that uh, candidates running for the Conservative Party be vaccinated. Let's go back to our uh, uh, political commentators watching along with us uh, for a quick round here, and then we'll get to the bloc leader, Yves Francois Blanchet. Susan, let me start with you. Uh, what did you hear from Aaron O'Toole? A big mistake is what I heard from Aaron O'Toole. He basically said by not requiring his candidates to be vaccinated that you're, it's a bit of a risk for you to answer the door to a Conservative candidate because you don't know if they're double-vaxxed. We know that the other party leaders have required that of their candidates. That's number one. The other one is he won't, he won't uh, support mandatory vaccinations for people getting on federally regulated industries, which are planes and trains and people returning. So if you need to fly somewhere in Canada or internationally, you don't know that the person beside you, with a medical exception, hasn't been vaccinated. That's a very, very simple thing. The other thing I heard him talk about, he started off on a negative tone, uh, which was, I, I, again, I think a bit of a mistake, talking about danger and all kinds of things like that in terms of re-electing a Liberal government. Um, I, I don't think that's the optimism people are looking for. He doesn't have a united caucus. He doesn't have a united party. So he's got a long road ahead of him. But I think this vaccination issue is going to be a huge one, and he's made a big mistake. All right, Kim, let me hear from you on this. What did you hear from Aaron O'Toole? Yeah, I, I didn't hear a compelling who Aaron O'Toole is and what he wants to be for Canadians. And I was really hoping to see that come out of this. I think conservatives that I've talked to across the country, including at the Calgary Stampede, uh, were, are really looking for 
what are they running on? How do they want to be different? What does this secure the future mean? And I get there's a stay tuned component of this, but I didn't get a sense of this is a, a leader who gets excited about the politics and the art of the possible. Uh, and certainly I don't get a sense he's uh, really secure in what his uh, narrative is for all of his candidates and campaigns. So I think that's going to be a challenge for him going forward. All right, uh, Ashton, let me finish up with you here for this part of our conversation. Um, how did Mr. O'Toole do here in both uh, you know, uh, as an overture to Canadians to get to know me, but he's going to face some continuing questions about where he stands on the issue of vaccinations, not just for uh, federal workers and federally regulated industries, but for his own candidates. Yeah, it was the type of uh, speech I was expecting, um, very heavily relying on economic messaging. Uh, he's going to put forward a plan that prioritizes every sector of the economy, not just the ones that we like or feel like we can uh, score political points on, a plan that is going to reduce the cost of living for Canadians, and a plan that is actually going to put more into your pocket at the end of the month as opposed to taking more out of it. On vaccinations, I'm thankfully, uh, Mr. O'Toole is actually very clear on this, and uh, I was very happy to hear that. Vaccines are absolutely critical, and if you're a Canadian, it is your duty to get one. Now, at the same time, there is a large difference between asking Canadians to be vaccinated and curtailing the rights and freedoms of Canadians who, for whatever reason, are not vaccinated. And that is what Mr. Trudeau has proposed. And he's going to run into difficulty. As Susan said, it's for federal folks only. Nobody in provincial capitals is talking about doing this. So first of all, the plan is just filled with holes to begin with. But at the same time, I'm very happy that Mr. Toole came out and said every Canadian that should be vaccinated should go out and get one, not tomorrow, today. Okay. Uh, thanks for this round. We'll come back to you. We want to hear from uh, the block leader next and the NDP leader, and then we're going to uh, have you back to, to talk about that as we... Uh, move along with our campaign coverage, but Yves-Francois Blanchette's launching the Bloc campaign today. Let's listen in. Bien, bonjour tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. D'abord, permettez-moi d'adresser mes salutations et Let mes voeux pour uh, une extraordinaire fête nationale. Transmit my best wishes for a wonderful national holiday to our Acadian brothers and sisters. <coughs> I phoned the president of the Association of Acadians in New Brunswick this morning in order to convey to the Acadian uh, nation all good wishes from the Bloc Québécois. Toute la solidarité. Allow me also to express my support du peuple haïtien. that we feel for the people in Haiti once again. Once again, they've been hit by a tragedy. Allow me also to express my concerns, my deep concerns, for everyone, but particularly for women in Afghanistan who are now threatened. Once again, they might fall under the yoke of a regime uh, characterized by unprecedented violence and sexism. And I also would like to convey my wishes, however, for a very good and stimulating campaign, election campaign. And those are my wishes to all candidates. Not just Bloc Québécois candidates, but candidates from every political party. Everyone who has decided to participate in this democratic exercise in these difficult times. The Parliament should have lasted four years. That's a spirit on fixed aid elections legislation. So now we have to start to ask, really, if this legislation has any sense, has any meaning. We're also in the middle of a, pand a pandemic which seems to go on and on. Therefore, making the calling of a general election very irresponsible. With certain reasons, I tried to understand when the Prime Minister stated them. And I heard everything except what seems to be the truth. That is the word personal ambition. That's the truth of this. Despite all of this, let's make sure that this democratic exercise uh, would be really uh, a time where we could have some fun also, where thousands of workers will work voluntarily for five weeks, not just to convey the ideas which they represent, 
le plaisir de but also for the sheer enjoyment of this uh, participation, for this form of camaraderie, which really inspires all political parties. Until recently, the Prime Minister swore, he swore, you know that all that he was doing had nothing to do with electioneering prospects. His one goal, he said, was to protect the health of Canadians. Il aurait réalisé soudainement, and suddenly he realized in the month of August, two months after the end of the last session, he realized that Parliament under the summer sun had become dysfunctional. Well, that seems rather dubious. And now we see that there are no great promises there to prepare an election. We see the real face, the real intentions of the Prime Minister, and I think it's been the case for him for quite some time. Now, I'll answer a question to which the Prime Minister refused to answer earlier. In the case of a minority government, what would you do, what would you not do? Well, a party leader, a party leader always puts his head on the line in an election campaign. Political courage uh, requires that you admit this and you actually state it. You have to say it clearly without beating around the bush. Le leader and yesterday, the Liberal leader wrote on his Twitter account that the Liberals are the only party to support mandatory vaccination for employees of the federal government. We understand two things here. We understand that the issue here, the issue of the campaign, and the issue of this mandatory vaccination decision is not one related to public health, but rather it's an issue which is related to an election subject, election theme. We can see this by the main spokesperson of, in Quebec for the Liberal Party. But if the situation is really so serious that you have to impose mandatory vaccination, and I would, I'm the first to say I'd like to see everyone vaccinated, but if the issue is that important, if the threat is that dangerous that you have to manage vaccination, well, isn't it too dangerous, therefore, to call an election campaign? Isn't that a contradiction here? A total contradiction for the Liberal Party. And it's not their first contradiction. Now, in an election campaign, which might have followed a pandemic, at least in Quebec and Canada, because elsewhere in the world, you know, they're not going to get out of this uh, pandemic very soon. Maybe we could have considered how we can help seniors between 65 and uh, 75 years of age. They've been abandoned by the government, by Trudeau's government. We could have discussed how we're going to prevent some other pandemic in the future, which might be somewhat different from the current one. How are we going to stimulate research in pharmaceuticals in Canada and in Quebec, particularly in terms of vaccination? They could have explained, for example, how they're going to protect the agricultural model that Quebec has, which has been protected over the last few years, no doubt because of the major role of the Bloc Québécois to help the farmers through the supply management system. They could have explained how, for example, we can impose a ceiling, a maximum, and then reduce the production of oil and petroleum in Canada. When we see the recent report of the G8, which states that the role of Canada is absolutely dreadful here. Canada is part of the problem, regardless of what Mr. Trudeau says. That's a fact. And we have to remind Mr. Trudeau that his government has invested more in petroleum than the Conservatives actually did. Well, that's saying something. Well, we could have explained how they are really the foot draggers in terms of uh, climate change. Well, they make so many commitments, so many slogans. They try and find the stars to talk about this, and then they do the opposite of what they should be doing. 
with total loyalty to the petroleum sector in Western Canada. They could have talked about how they can actually support the Quebec uh, forest industry in order to ensure, for example, the second or third transformation uh, by uh, ensuring, for example, the continuation of these resources, but also what has been done in the aluminum industry, which has been done, protected because of the Bloc Québécois. He could have talked about tourism, he could have talked about fisheries, he could, could, could have talked about Quebec regions. He could have talked about a serious crisis, a serious shortage of manpower, which is the first subject being addressed by all municipal elected representatives, by all economic stakeholders in every part of Quebec. He just hasn't talked about that. Why doesn't he talk about that? Why aren't they promising jobs rather than promoting uh, inclusion of new people in the workforce? Why doesn't he talk about productivity? modernizing companies by using these financial resources. We won't get these again. I have to say also, in the election campaign, we should have heard, and perhaps we will hear. We want uh, explanations for those people over the last two years who really, whose trademark has been to treat Quebec and Quebecers as racist. But well, we have to deal with this. We're not going to forget about this tomorrow morning because really we're going to a new period. Of... But instead of talking about all of this as much as we should have talked about it every day, in fact, we're going to analyze the actual figures for that day. How many new cases, how many cases of hospitalization, and how many deaths. We'll ask every day what uh, campaign organization, for example, will be the first to have a breakout of COVID. We'll be focused on uh, everyday issues rather than focusing on future issues. Sur la sortie de pandémie. This is not the election which will help us get out of the campaign. Out of the pandemic, it's the election of a prime minister who refuses the mandate of voters entrusted to him in 2019. Because that mandate demanded from him, as he was obliged to do, demanded as the opposition agreed to do also, to negotiate, to reach an agreement, to improve legislation, to improve bills, rather than just imposing his own personal will. But this Prime Minister, who wants a majority, was in Quebec as well, we explained to him quite clearly that they don't want a Liberal majority in the House of Commons. There's even some risk here for the gains that Quebec has made over the last two years in the majority ambitions of Mr. Trudeau. What will happen to the major improvements that uh, Quebec has made to the broadcasting in terms of uh, French ownership? What about the free trade agreement with the United Kingdom or the one with the Americans in terms of supply management, which wasn't been the subject of compensation? What will happen with the necessary energy transition and the need uh, to stop so far as possible by increasing the project of hydrocarbons in Canada? What will happen also? With this enthusiasm, this unusual enthusiasm, support for the idea that Quebec is a French nation and should this should be expressed in its choices. What will happen, as we've seen recently at the end of the session, the progress for French, whereas once Parliament has left, has risen for the summer, the Prime Minister appointed a person, probably a very interesting person, but amongst the qualifications of this person, this person then the basic ability to speak French. What will happen with challenges supported by the federal government against Bill 21 on secularism? What will happen, for example, with the need to, to increase uh, health transfers, as all the provinces, including Quebec, have demanded? And so as to exert pressure in Ottawa. But this will be harder to do in the case of a majority. What will we do about the treatment of seniors? The government doesn't want to support this. What will happen also? Well, we don't know. 
contourner un élément fondamental. Il y a un point fondamental ici que nous devons reconnaître. Une campagne pour le Bloc québécois. Well, through all the other issues, this will mean the emergence of an economic nationalism which will be purely Quebec-oriented. It will be a Quebec, it will be a campaign also to promote French, a campaign in order to determine to strengthen gender equality and also real freedom of expression in all parts of society. It will be a campaign also for freedom, period. It will be a campaign also in order to clearly assert who we are. And we are the Bloc Québécois. The Bloc Québécois. Thank you very much. All right, Peter Van Dusen listening to the campaign launch of the Bloc Québécois leader, Yves-François Blanchet. Uh, while he's been talking, the uh, NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh, has uh, been launching the NDP campaign in Montreal. It's underway, that campaign launch. Let's listen to what Jagmeet Singh has to say. Bonjour et merci beaucoup. Je veux commencer en reconnaissant... I'd like to start by recognizing the tragedy in Haiti. And I'm so sad about what's happened in Haiti. And we have to help the people there. Talk about what's going on in Afghanistan. It is very, very troubling what's going on. We're seeing the reality of Kabul falling, and I'm really worried about the women particularly, but the people that served with and helped out Canadian forces. I'm deeply troubled. We need to make sure we are doing everything possible to help out and to evacuate uh, those that are in danger now. En général, c'était un temps difficile. La pandémie... Seen the pandemic who hit people so hard. We know that workers have had to deal with major challenge. There have been small problems, but there have been major crises also. And during these difficult times, we know there have been other crises also. The climate trade crisis continues. We know there have been forest fires caused by a climate crisis, which has an impact on all the country. We have a housing crisis, which continues also. A crisis which was difficult before the pandemic, but it's now worse. And we also know that there are problems with our health care system. This has been a reality for quite some time, and it's continuing. When we think about the climate crisis, Justin Trudeau is the only leader of a G7 nation who has increased emissions over the six years he's been in power. And we know that the climate crisis is so devastating. We are feeling the impacts of it right now with forest fires across Canada, making it hard to breathe, making it hard to see the sky. This is a real challenge that we're up against, and it's only getting worse. We know that the housing crisis was a crisis before the pandemic. It's only gotten worse over these six years. It's becoming more and more unaffordable for people across the country to find a place that's in their budget to rent or to own. We know that Indigenous people continue to face serious struggles, not having access to clean drinking water, being denied basic human rights. All these things have only gotten worse over the past six years. And despite things getting worse, we see Justin Trudeau right now focused on an election. We are still in a pandemic. We are still worried about this pandemic. And people have referred to the pandemic and said, well, we've all been in the same boat. And I say really clearly, we've not been in the same, we've not, we've not been in the same boat. We've been in the same storm for sure, but some people have ridden out this storm in luxury yachts while others have been in leaky lifeboats. We know that the ultra rich in this pandemic have been given a free ride by liberals and conservatives, so they have increased their wealth. The richest billionaires in Canada have increased their wealth by $75 billion in counting, and Justin Trudeau has allowed that to happen. Companies like Amazon make record profits, but still contribute virtually no taxes in Canada. Instead of, of calling an election, Justin Trudeau should be focused on these crises, on getting people the help they need, on walking the path instead of walking away from these commitments. So many people are wondering why this selfish summer election. Well, it's clear Justin Trudeau wants to grab power, wants a majority. But why does he want a majority? It's certainly not because he wants to help more people or help people more, it's only because he wants to help people less and people end up paying the price. 
The reality is he is fed up with new Democrats pushing him to deliver more help to more people, and he certainly doesn't want to put in place any measures to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. I believe that better is possible. Si on ose ensemble, je sais qu'on peut investir dans notre avenir. On peut investir pour régler la crise du logement. On peut investir dans nos housing crises. We can invest in healthcare. We can react to the problems that affect the Aboriginal community, the Indigenous community. We can work to create a better, more just system. It's extraordinary what we can do together, and that's what we want to do. We we'll act together. We can invest in people. We can make sure that the ultra rich pay their fair share, and we can build a better society together. Thank you very much. Today, and I'm ready for any questions you might have. Encore un grand merci à toute mon équipe qui sont ici. Thank you to my team that's here, and I'm ready for your questions. Merci. Merci, Jagmeet. On va commencer avec les questions. We'll start with questions. Jean-Sébastien Cloutier, Radio-Canada. Good morning, Mr. Singh. You've no doubt heard Mr. Trudeau's speech, who says this is a unique opportunity. And it's time really to ask Canadians what's the direction they want for Canada? What kind of economic recovery do we want? I guess you don't agree with this. Is it really the time to ask Canadians to make a choice? Well, it's a good question. But if you look at what people have already said that they want, they want to see. I'll just wait a moment. Les Canadiens et Canadiens, les gens Canadians, people all across the country have already said they want to make sure that the ultra-rich play their fair share. Did Justin Trudeau hear the demands of people? People are saying that the Indigenous community has to have access to drinking water. Has Justin Trudeau listened to people? People have said that we have to do more in order to deal with climate change. Is Justin Trudeau listening to people? So I could go on with this. There are a number of examples where people have already demanded certain things. And Justin Trudeau really hasn't listened to people. He hasn't listened to people's demands. So the question is this. Why should people now have trust that Justin Trudeau will listen to their demands if after six years he's ignored all the demands? A sub-question now, Mr. Singh. Your election platform <coughs> is quite well known. There are a lot of commitments there from two years ago. But two years ago, Mr. Boulouris, behind you, was the only member, the only candidate elected. Have you learned from that? And how you can you adjust your position now in order to change Quebecers' minds? What would you say to Quebecers in order to make a difference here, to vote for the NDP and rather than voting for the Liberals? If you can see with the $10 daycare program, there are some insignificant incentives, left wing incentives. So why should you vote for the NDP? So with the NDP, yeah, we never take for granted people's votes. <clears throat> so we work hard in order to earn the trust of people. And what we've done during this pandemic, for everyone, all across the country here in Quebec, we, the NDP, we're the ones who force the government to deliver more help to more people. For example, now we have a... Uh, really, we now have a figure which is much higher. We force the government to double the amount that they were giving. And two million Quebecers have received this benefit, this necessary assistance. And also with the wage subsidies. Mr. Trudeau started with 10%. 10% wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to help people. <coughs> And we force the government to increase the benefits, the amount, up to 75 percent. And doing that, we saved millions of jobs. We've shown, with Previn, evidence that with the NDP, you have someone who's got your back, who's fighting for you and your families. And we've shown that with tangible proof. We've also shown that the other opposition parties They've not done anything at all to improve people's lives. And during a difficult period in their lives, one of the major challenges that we faced with in a generation, we were there to help people, and we know that in the future people will need us. So if you vote for the NDP, then you'll have someone who will fight for you, 
who will force the government to do what we need to do to help you and your families. And during the recovery, this is absolutely crucial to have allies who can defend your interest and the interest of the average citizen. Olivia Stefanovic from CBC News. Hi, Mr. Singh. You've called this a selfish election, but I'm wondering what you would say to Canadians who do feel like they want to have a say in this post-pandemic recovery. And what is your vision? Why is your vision any different or stronger? I'll start with the vision. Uh, we, we know that the Canadians are worried about what happens next. It's a very genuine and real worry. People are up against a lot of challenges. They're worried about what happens next. And we've seen governments do one of two things coming out of an economic crisis. There is a clear playbook that previous Conservatives and Liberals have used, and that's either cutting the help that people need, which I'll remind folks Justin Trudeau is already doing right now. He is cutting, he has already cut the help that people who can't go back to re work receive by cutting the CRB by $800 a month. He's also clawing back the GIS from seniors who needed to access CERB. So he's already clawing back and cutting help to people who need it most. The other option is to put the burden back on the people that have already suffered or already struggled by increasing taxes on workers, on small businesses. We are the only party saying very clearly there is a third option, which is to make the ultra-rich pay their fair share. Companies like Amazon, which make record profits in this pandemic, do pay virtually no taxes in Canada. We can stop that. We can make sure they pay their fair share and invest that back in people. Everyday workers pay their fair share. So should wealthy corporations, so should the richest billionaires. Just because you're a billionaire shouldn't mean that you get to hide your wealth. And that's one of the things that we bring to the table, that we're going to make them pay their fair share and invest that into health care, into housing, into justice for Indigenous people. And uh, in terms of people having their say, well, Justin Trudeau talks about people having their say. People have had their say. They've demanded very clearly that the ultra-rich should pay their fair share. Justin Trudeau teamed up with the, with the Conservatives to vote against our, our motion to make that happen. People made it really clear they want pharmacare. Justin Trudeau teamed up with Aaron O'Toole and the Conservatives to vote against a universal pharmacare that would help all Canadians. So Justin Trudeau has shown again and again, I can go on, that you know, people demanded clean drinking water. That's what people wanted in this, in this very important time. Again, he didn't listen to what people asked for. So what gives people any confidence? Right now, people are wondering, well, if he didn't listen to us when we asked for all these important things, why should we believe that he's going to deliver what we asked for now? If he wants to do what people are asking for, let's go back to Ottawa and do it. There's no reason why we can't. You're starting your campaign in Quebec, where your party has lost a lot of seats. You only have one seat right now in this province, and you also only have one seat in Atlantic Canada. So I'm wondering what your message is to voters in eastern Canada, and if you can't make any, any more growth or any more gains in the next election, what that says about your party's future in this part of the country. Well, I want folks to know when times were tough, we were in this pandemic and it was hard on a lot of people and, and workers were wondering and uncertain about what was going to happen next. We were there for them. We were there for people and we fought for you and your families. It was New Democrats that delivered the help that people needed and counted on. Millions of people kept their jobs because we were there to fight to increase the wage subsidy. We brought in a paid sick leave that never existed at the federal level. We made that happen and we stood up for people. And so everyone in, across Canada benefited from New Democrats being in Ottawa. And I say to folks, imagine how much more we could do with more New Democrats elected. The people that I met recently in Atlantic Canada would benefit from New Democrats fighting for them and their families to give them the help they need. We saw that in this pandemic, no other opposition party could point to a single victory that they fought for and won to make people's lives better. They did not benefit from having those other MPs representing them. New Democrats were there for them. And that, that's what I put to them, our track record and how another four years of Justin Trudeau saying a lot of great things but not delivering them is not going to help people. It's going to hurt people. And that we have the only plan that says that the ultra-rich should pay their fair share to invest in people. Prochaine question, Virginie Anne de la Presse canadienne. Virginie Anne, Canadian Press against COVID-19 sanitary measure. Um, a lot of comments that were emerging was their mistrust towards politics, science, and the government. And I'm curious to see uh, what would you uh, say about your plan on rebuilding the trust with Quebecers and Canadians? 
I think it's so important that people have trust in the decisions we make. And so one of the most important things we can do is to give transparency, clear evidence, clear reasons why people need to follow public health measures. The more transparency, the more evidence, the more examples we can give of why it's important, I think is really, is really helpful. Uh, we actually have a great candidate, Nima Mashouf, who is a, uh, someone who's an expert in virology, who understands uh, diseases, who can help build that, that type of confidence. But I want to thank everyone who's taken the vaccine. It is so important that we follow these public health measures because we are all really connected. If we do everything possible to take care of each other, we will get past this pandemic and we can build a better Canada. But to do that, we need more transparency and clarity, more information shared. A lot of people have genuine questions and we can answer those and provide more information. And I'm confident Canadians, Quebecers, everyone wants to do their part. If we can provide them with that transparency, they will. And Annie Bergeron Oliver from CTV News. Hi, you talked in your opening remarks about how the situation in Afghanistan is troubling. Um, we're hearing that there may be thousands of Afghans with ties to Canada who believe that they're stranded, that they won't be able to get out. I'm wondering two things. One, what would you have done differently if you were leader during this crisis? And two, how are you going to make sure that this issue remains on the forefront of the top burner, despite the fact that we're in the middle of a campaign? Thank you. I really appreciate the question. First off, I wouldn't be calling an election. There are a number of crises that we're faced with right now. There's a, you know, the earthquake in Haiti where we need to be doing our part to help out. There's a, a really large Haitian population here in, in Montreal that's deeply concerned and worried about what's happening. And uh, in Afghanistan, this is a serious crisis. These are people that are at risk. Many of them are those that served with Canadian forces provided help and support, translation services. There are Canadian supporters, these are allies, that we need to be doing everything possible to help. So I wouldn't have called an election. I would be deploying all resources possible to get those uh, that are at risk out of Afghanistan, provide them with help to evacuate not only the people directly impacted, but their families as well. We've played a really important role around the world, and there's been many sacrifices made in Afghanistan, and a lot of people on the ground who need our help right now and, and I would focus on that and how we can continue in this campaign is I'm going to raise this up raise this issue and let Justin Trudeau know uh, let uh, the government know that there's so much more that we can do right now and we should be doing to help these these allies out and you've also said that it's dangerous to be holding an election during a pandemic but you did go and help Premier Horgan campaign in British Columbia in 2020 so what's different now well, a couple of things. Whenever an election is called, I will always be there to help out people and to show folks that there is there is uh, a strong option with New Democrats to fight for you. Uh, right now, what we're up against uh, with with Justin Trudeau calling this election is w what is the reason for it? You know, we've got two years left on our mandate, and it's clear that in calling this election, he's walking away from a lot of things that could be done. You know, today is Pride. And there are a lot of things that we could continue to move forward on that Justin Trudeau promised that he would bring in. He promised that he would put an end to the blood ban. Well, he's walking away from that commitment because once we go into election, all the work towards that goal is, is going to be restarted. The conversion therapy ban that we wanted to push forward, more work needs to be done there. He's walking away from that. Really, it begs the question, why have this election right now if he wants to do the work that he claims he wants to do? We have shown again and again, if it's help for Canadians, we are there. And we've delivered that help. We have fought to get more help. But if it's to hurt Canadians, we've seen Justin Trudeau team up there in O'Toole to force the port workers here in Montreal back to work, to vote against pharmacare, to vote against taxing the ultra-rich. So we've seen that Justin Trudeau can make this parliament work if it's to hurt people, and we've been able to force him to help people. Why is he having this election when none of those things require an election? We will now go to questions on Zoom. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand function. If you have a question, please use the raise your hand function. That concludes our event. Thank you. Merci. Merci. Thanks so much for being here. Merci. I'm joined now by our panel of party commentators. Susan Smith is a liberal commentator. Ashton Arsenault is a conservative commentator. And Kim Wright is an NDP commentator. Uh, well, Susan, the campaign's underway now. We've heard from the leaders. Has the Prime Minister presented a compelling argument for why we are in a federal election now? Uh, all right, we're uh, going to get Susan's, uh, we're having a problem with Susan's audio here. Let's see if we get her 
uh, unmuted. Okay, so Back let on. me just re-ask the question. Susan, we heard from all the parties today. As, let's start with the Prime Minister as he made a compelling argument to send Canadians to the polls now. He has. I'll try and make that compelling argument again, Peter. Sorry about the mute. Uh, he's he said to Canadians, now is the time for them to choose the future for coming out of the COVID recovery. There are big decisions that need to be made from a government perspective, big investments that need to be made. And he wants Canadians to have a choice about the direction that we go, because the impact of these choices uh, it impact our kids and our grandkids. You know, contrast that with Aaron O'Toole, who said he's going to balance the budget in 10 years. I didn't hear him say what he was going to cut in terms of that. This country has gone through, and, uh, and the world has gone through a very difficult time from the pandemic. We're coming out of it. We're leading in vaccinations. And the Prime Minister is saying when it comes to climate change, when it comes to reconciliation, when it comes to health care, when it comes to um, investing in green infrastructure, he's got the plan that Canadians can choose and he's inviting them to contrast it with their others. All right, Ashton, the Prime Minister says it is time for Canadians to have a say in what happens to rebuild this country after the pandemic. Uh, what's your response to that? Uh, look, I'm, I'm still seeing it for what I think most Canadians see it for, and that's a power grab. Uh, I think the Prime Minister dodged uh, the question on why a election is required right now during the middle of a pandemic, particularly as we're walking into the fourth wave of said pandemic on every single occasion that he could eschew that question. So I don't think he really uh, had a refined sales pitch for Canadians today as to why an election is required. And again, I feel like most Canadians are not on side with the fact that we're going into an election today. As in, do they want it? I don't think they do. At the same time, I think you know the Prime Minister uh, got most of his talking points out. Uh, I think they were a little light on details. And in fairness to the Prime Minister, I think uh, the NDP is the only party out right now with a uh, platform. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to change very quickly in the coming days. I think you can expect a robust plan uh, from the Conservative Party of Canada, you know, if not tomorrow, very shortly thereafter. It's only 36 days to work with, and there's so much work to do, and there's a lot of explaining to Canadians what the vision is going to be and why your party should best represent the interests of Canadians going forward. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Okay. It is day one. We're a little light on details, and I'm looking forward to a little bit more. Uh, Kim, uh, let me turn to you. Did the Prime Minister make the case for an election now? Absolutely not. There is nothing that I had heard from him that couldn't have been done in, within Parliament, uh, certainly working with the opposition parties, Jagmeet Singh, certainly uh, as he was unveiling his platform the other day, but also as we just heard mm -hmm. his remarks, uh, he is ready to work on the things that matter to Canadians, clean drinking water, access to vaccinations, uh, meaningful work on truth and reconciliation. All of these things were possible. The Prime Minister wants this majority government this is nothing more than an ego trip uh, filtering out through a divine right to govern. That's all this is. And I think Canadians will see through that. They're tired of promises and memes and all of the stuff. Let's actually get, along, get through this, get to governing, get to governing in the interest of Canadians. And I'll also say, you know, Jagmeet Singh, is his, his release today, his, his launch today, really did show the most humanity of any of the leaders. It showed a bit of personality, certainly an understanding of how these things are not just lofty public policy goals, but how they impact people's lives. And also holding to account things like the conversion therapy bill. You know, the Liberals try to blame that on Aaron O'Toole and goodness knows Aaron O'Toole's people have a lot to account for as to why they voted, a, voted against it. But if these things didn't get done. They could have got done. The blood ban, the conversion therapy bill, all of these things that actually would have impacted Canadians' lives. And we haven't seen it, and I still don't see a narrative out of the Prime Minister as to what he's going to do differently. All right, let's talk about what the opposition leaders had to say, Susan, today. Uh, Aaron O'Toole talked about his plan for the economy, but uh, he also faced lots of, lots of questions and would not commit to mandatory vaccinations for federal workers and federally regulated industries, and, and wouldn't commit that all his conservative candidates will be vaccinated. How much of a problem do you think that is or will become or could become for Aaron O'Toole as the campaign kicks off? I think that's going to be a tremendous uh, problem for Aaron O'Toole, and I'm surprised that he's walking right into it. It's easily rectifiable. He could have knocked it out of the park and said, I think all of my candidates should be vaccinated. And I think anybody getting on a plane or a train in Canada and federally regulated industries, they should be vaccinated unless they have a medical exemption. He did not do that. So 
you don't know. Uh, under an Aaron O'Toole government, you don't know if the people beside you have had their vaccinations or not. You certainly, in the course of the campaign immediately, don't know whether or not your conservative candidate has had a vaccination or not. That is going to be a huge problem for him. And I actually think it was a significant strategic error because it's common sense that you would get a vaccine. He himself and his wife have got a vaccine. Why not would he exert the kind of leadership he needs to on this party uh, to say to people, this is the right thing to do. You have to get them and I would mandate this okay, as prime minister. Why hasn't he done it? He's pandering to the right wing of the party and his conservative base. All right. Um Ashton, let me hear you on this. Uh, does, does Aaron O'Toole's the position we heard today, which was to not endorse mandatory vaccinations and not say they'd be required for candidates, do you think that position helps or hurts him? Uh, I'd be remiss to not go back and say that this was the Liberal Party of Canada's position up until three days ago, conveniently on the eve of an election. Uh, so I'm going to assume that this was done to create a political wedge. So uh, the Liberal Party is attempting to divide Canadians on vaccines. Aaron O'Toole is not. He has said that every single Canadian should be vaccinated. If you can do so today, do not wait until tomorrow to do so. At the same time, it is a very different matter to force vaccinations and not consider the rights of Canadians on the other side of it. And also, Nobody has talked about the legality of this and how it would actually be enforced at the federal level, nor has anybody raised the issue of what provincial leaders are going to do, because as we all know, transportation is not exclusively a federal matter. So there's lots of questions. Planes and trains I are, though. These... Correct. Planes and trains are. are. You, you can't smoke on a plane Canadian? and you can't, get a sh you can't uh, smoke does, on a train. Why so, can't you? I guess it does raise the prospect Susan, of having... do you exclusively di travel on planes or trains? I don't. No, I don't. But okay. for people who choose to, they should know. They should. They should know and feel confident that people have had the vac a vaccination that is available to prevent spread of COVID. Right. Like came, came all of this. It came all of this is in the context of, of uh, all of this is in the context of a, a campaign that's taking place while we have a fourth wave of a pandemic. So, um, should we expect to keep hearing questions uh, about vaccinations and where the party leaders on? Uh, stand on things like mandatory vaccinations. What role do you think that's going to play, at least in the early days of the campaign? Absolutely, and you will. And you've already heard uh, from from Jagmeet Singh and the New Democrats that they've required everyone on tour to be vaccinated. Everyone who's uh, all of their candidates, all of their MPs, have all been double vaccinated. So we're going to see that uh, that rolling through. Ultimately, though, I always love these jurisdictional squabblings that always take place when it's convenient to be. Oh, we can't do daycare because the provinces are part of this. Oh, we can't manage interprovincial trade barriers because it's a provincial problem. Oh, we can't give municipalities the right to govern themselves because, yeah, they're a jurisdiction of the province. At the end of the day, it's easy to finger point. Governing is much harder, and I want to actually see people get on with this as opposed to finger pointing. All right, uh, Susan, let's talk about the launch of uh, Jagmeet Singh's campaign today. Uh, he's been holding his own in the polls and his message today was, look, vote New Democrat because of the gains the NDP obtained during the pandemic and the promises the party's making to spend on social and health programs. So uh, what kind of a threat do you think that presents to Liberals uh, in terms of courting the progressive vote uh, if the NDP, uh, you know, we'll keep an eye on the polls, but if the NDP and Mr. Singh were to continue growing, uh, what kind of a challenge does that present? If you just want to listen to the surface messages delivered by Jagmeet Singh, it's all good. It's all sweetness and light in terms of what the NDP were doing. He's an, his French was amazing. He had a, he's very relaxed. He's very affable. There's no question about that. But in terms of the depth of the policy platforms, the, the realism around them, uh, he's missing the boat. I think it's not there, and people need to dig and scratch the surface a little bit better. He's also misleading Canadians in areas like boil water advisories and other things where significant progress has been made, but yes, more work needs to be done. Big time. <laughs> À 145 de plus, il espère devenir premier ministre. Il a un siège au Québec et il ne va pas augmenter sa popularité dans les prairies. Dans la région. He's got a message. He had a good start, but from a, a substance uh, perspective, he better hope people don't scratch the surface too hard. Let me hear you, uh, Ashton, on the NDP campaign before we get to Kim here. In, uh, in, in pure political terms, conservatives want uh, the NDP to do uh, 
better. Uh, they don't want the NDP to be government, but they want them to do better and uh, pull some of that vote away from uh, from Liberals because that tightens up a lot of those races. So what do you think of uh, the NDP message today? Certainly some truth in that, Peter. I'll, I'll do the old two positives and a negative. Uh, nobody does <laughs> empathy better on the federal scene right now than Jagmeet Singh. Uh, and at the same time, he is very, very difficult to defeat uh, in the moment. Uh, if you catch him on any day, he's ready to go with a soundbite, and that is a true political gift. The negative is, his plan deserves some heavy scrutiny because it is the plan of more. More taxes, more spending, more debt. That is the NDP plan, full stop. So when Aaron O'Toole says, what you're getting with any other party is more of the same, he is correct. But I would argue in the case of the NDP, it's even worse. All right, and Kim, let me hear from you on this. And, and uh, what you heard from the NDP leader today, where, where do you think the focus of that campaign goes? Well, Jagmeet Singh has a spring in his step. He's got money in the bank. He's got extraordinary candidates coast to coast to coast. And he has a message that resonates. People have come out of this pandemic and are getting through this pandemic, recognizing there are some serious institutional flaws in this country, and they require leadership to move forward on it. Ultimately, governing is choosing. You choose where you want to put your resources, where your time, where your energies and your efforts. And you can say, we're going to cut and we're going to hack and we're going to do all these things. That's what Aaron O'Toole's message is going to be whenever he finally gets around to a platform, because somehow it eluded him that the election was going to start today. Uh, but governing is choosing. And if we want to make sure that we have a Canada that actually helps protect people here in Canada and around the world, that's the kind of thing that Jagmeet Singh has also shown on a practical level that he can move forward on. Right. I mean, we look at the wage subsidy, the pittance that they were the Liberal government was trying to give to businesses to keep employees was actually quite appalling and shocking, and they were getting no uptake until Jagmeet Singh and the New Democrats said, here, here's how we get businesses, small businesses, our community, uh, local mom and pop shops back to work. That's the kind of leadership I look for, and that's the kind of right. leadership I'm excited about. All right, day one of the campaign uh, is underway. Uh, Susan Smith, Kim Wright, Ashton Arsenal, uh, thank you all for your time today, uh, and we'll talk again soon. Everyone take care. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. All right, uh, the uh, Green Party leader, Annemi Paul, is uh, launching that party's campaign today. We're uh, most of us uh, watching this channel familiar with some of the challenges the Green Party leader has been facing in recent months. Uh, but the campaign launch is taking place. Let's listen to Annemi Paul and the Green Party. I'm here on the territory Anishabi, Anishobi, and Tarado Wendak traditional lands. Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Odinashone, the Huron Wendat. Um, you know, my kids are here today in the background, and uh, I was telling them that I'm glad I didn't put money on whether this election would be called or not. <laughs> because I told them there is no way, there is no way that an election is going to be called at this time. They said, Mom, I think there's an election that's going to be called. Um, and it turns out that they were right. Uh, the reasons that I don't believe that an election should be called at this time and that the Green Party doesn't believe that an election should have been called at this time uh, is told in the numbers. And uh, here are a few of them. 270, 49, 570, and 4. 270, that's the number of fires that are raging right now in British Columbia. 6,000 plus have been evacuated, and almost 28,000 others are on high alert. 49, 49 is the number of degrees that uh, BC experienced and the town of Lytton experienced uh, just over a month ago that left that town burned to the ground. We are experiencing the worst drought on the prairies, uh, perhaps in the history of Canada, and the worst drought Canada has ever experienced if it keeps going this way for much longer. 570. 570 is the number of Canadians who died directly linked to the heat dome that settled over British Columbia. 570 Canadians who would otherwise not have died, died. And four. 
we are in a fourth wave. We are officially in the fourth wave of this pandemic. And for anyone who wants to tell me or the people behind me that we are out of it or it is different, um, they are wrong and they should come down to this neighborhood where we have many frontline workers, uh, where we have we had hot spots like St. Jamestown that had the highest rates of infection for much of the pandemic. They should tell my mother who is expecting her, uh, her latest grandchild in a couple of days um, and won't be able to go and be there in the hospital with my sister because of the pandemic. They should tell her that the pandemic is over. And so these are the numbers that tell the story. And there was a time that when calling an election under any of these circumstances would have been unimaginable. There was a time when any of these events would have provoked an emergency recall of parliament. Let us also take a moment to, to acknowledge as well that, Haitian, that um, the Haitian community in Canada uh, is very worried at this time. Uh, there are hundreds of Haitians uh, who died tragically in the earthquake on Saturday. Let us also take this moment to remember and to recognize that Kabul has fallen today. Kabul, where 40,000 Canadian servicemen and women served where a thousand and more were, where a thousand were wounded and over 159 lost their lives. Kabul has fallen. Kabul has fallen and instead of going back to parliament on an emergency basis to ask how will we protect the women and girls and people who remain behind? How will we ensure that all of the sacrifice that Canada and, and, and our servicemen and women have made was not in vain? We are headed to the polls. And then let me add one last number, 500. 500 million. 500 million is how much the last non-pandemic election costs. And let's ask ourselves what we could have done with that money and how many people we could have helped with that $500. 500 no, million dollars. And so why are we here then? After the prime minister said just in May that there would be no pandemic election, we are here because the Liberals have decided that they want all the power, that they want a majority, and they think that now is the best time to get it. Ils ont décidé de déclencher une élection dans telles circonstances. C'était inimaginable, mais c'est vraiment un témoin de combien Le gouvernement a décidé de reléguer la population du Canada au bas de sa liste de priorités. So instead of heading back to work, we have this election. And instead of focusing on public health, public health has lost out to partisan ambition. Here's what could have been accomplished in two years that are left. Because we have areas of commonality, we have areas of collaboration, we have areas of cooperation between parties, and let's stop pretending that we don't. Let's do things for people in Canada. As you can see here, each one of these policies has been passed by the respective members of the respective parties. Guaranteed livable income, universal pharmacare, long-term care reform, Miss the um, respect um, and implementation of the calls for justice from the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls report and a just transition for oil and gas workers. All of these extraordinary priorities, all of these that we agree on. Two years is enough time to get this done if you have the will to do it. S'il y a la volonté de le faire, on peut accomplir tous ces objectifs. Nous avons les votes. Nous avons no, un mandat de nos membres. Nous avons un mandat des Canadiens et Canadiennes aussi. And so, again, common sense and collaboration has lost out to the quest for power. The thing that I believe that the backroom operators who cooked up this election uh, have uh, gotten wrong is that try as they might with their polling, try as they might um, with their calculations, they underestimate the desire of people for change. They underestimate the desire of people for change that this pandemic has provoked. And we are ready to strike out in a new direction. Leurs calculs, leurs sondages ne le permettront jamais, 
jamais de, de, uh, de calculer l'ambition et la détermination des peuples du Canada. And so while they've decided that this is the best time for the Liberals to secure their majority, ultimately it will be up to you, the people of Canada, to decide who you send back to Ottawa to represent you. Uh, I know that many people in Canada are, uh, are, are getting to know me and will get to know me over uh, the next, uh, next while. So let me just say a few things about myself. I'm a mother, my children are here today. I'm the daughter of immigrants. My mother is here today. My father sadly died uh, in long-term care during this pandemic. I am a wife of 25 years. I am a sister. I am a social entrepreneur. I am a former diplomat. I'm a lawyer. I'm a policy analyst. I am someone who had the great fortune of being trained uh, at Princeton University and the University of Ottawa Faculty of Law. And because of that, I am someone who loves big ideas. Uh, I also love big, doable ideas. And I am a Canadian who believes, like all of the Canadians behind me, that there is a possibility of greatness within our country. And that we can be heroes. That we can be part of a generation of Canadians that will earn their place in the history books. Et je suis un Canadien qui croit en nos possibilités, notre potentiel, la grandeur de notre nation et notre capacité d'être héros. I joined the Green Party, as did all of these Greens, because that is what we believe, and that is the dare, and we believe the Green Party offers the daring ideas to get us there. Uh, in normal times, the dearth of ideas that we have seen would be a problem. But in unprecedented times, it is fatal. Our country is suffering. It needs leadership. It needs leadership that offers a positive, progressive, and compelling vision about how we will repair the social and economic damage wrought by the pandemic, how we are going to secure our future prosperity, how we are going to tackle the climate crisis and build a more resilient society that leaves us better protected. That's where we come in. <laughs> Cue the Green Party. <laughs> in my past 10 months as leader, I've emphasized that we need to seize the opportunity uh, to address three great challenges. Turbo boosting our move to a green economy, completing our social safety net, and forging a just society. The green economy represents the greatest economic opportunity of our lifetime. It is estimated to generate more than a trillion US per year by 2030. And Canada has the chance of a lifetime not only to definitively bend the curve on greenhouse gas emissions, but also to set ourselves up with the jobs of the future, to set ourselves up with the competitive economy of the future. It's where the jobs of the future are, it's where the smart money is going, and it's where Canada needs to become a global leader to secure our future. Alors, au lieu d'être le, um, le chef de file mondial, en matière d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre, parce qu'il faut reconnaître qu'au moment, le Canada est un des pires émetteurs de gaz à effet de serre à parmi les pays au monde. Nous sommes le pire émetteur à parmi les pays riches, pas que les pays riches, mais tous les pays au monde. Et nous n'avons jamais réussi à, 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 à attaquer même une cible, une cible pour, pour um, réduire nos gaz à effet de serre. Uh, nous pouvons le faire, uh, mais nous, do nous devrons avoir un plan. And while our party may be best known for its environmental focus, it is our innovative, evidence-informed social policies that have shone through during this pandemic. When I ran here in Toronto Centre in 2019, I spoke about the urgent need for guaranteed livable income. I spoke about the need for urgent long-term care reform, and I spoke about the need for decriminalization and the creation of a national safe supply to prevent the opioid deaths, related deaths that are ravaging this community. 
Uh, the pandemic has proved these concepts have worth and it is very encouraging to see the cross-party cooperation and consensus uh, that is emerging around these issues. But the thing to remember is that we are always going to need those big ideas. This is where the Green Party comes in. This is the thing that sets us apart. We are always going to need to innovate. We are always going to need to look down the road. We are always going to need those people who are the fearless champions of policies that we were the first to propose, like equal marriage, reviving um, the, the call for national pharma care, or proposing, being the first to propose a carbon, shared carbon border with the United States. And so we see that people in Canada have said clearly that they do not want to go back to way, the way things were, and they are really ready to strike out on a new path. We only do this through cooperation and collaboration, and again, Look at how much we could accomplish through cooperation and collaboration if we set our minds to it. Si nous saisissons la voie de coopération, alors nous saisirons la possibilité de grandeur. Because we can only do this together. We are in this together. We will only accomplish great things together. And so, in honor of the 570 Canadians who lost their lives in British Columbia, uh, in the month of June, uh, what if Canada, imagine if Canada was to become a global leader in limiting global warming, the most catastrophic offense, effects of global warming, and securing our planet's future. Imagine, imagine. Le Canada peut devenir un leader sur un, un leader mondial sur le plan de limiter le réchauffement, à le réchauffement glo global, le réchauffement de notre planète. In honor of the 15,000 people who died in long-term care, uh, including my own father, avoidably during the pandemic, imagine if we made Canada the best place in the world to age. And imagine if we made Canada the very best place to live a life of dignity from the first day to the last day. It is possible. I need some, you know, yeah. You have to believe it. We all have to believe that it's possible. And in honor of the indigenous uh, children whose unmarked graves are still being discovered across our country. Imagine if we became a global model for what it looks like to respect indigenous sovereignty, indigenous self-determination, and true nation-to-nation -nation engagement. And so in this election, which again, oh, someone get that for me, which again, uh, we should not be here, we should, this should not have been called uh, that is what we are asking people in Canada to imagine. And we are asking them to come and talk to us. For those who say that we are dreamers, of course we are, and we need to be. But we are practical dreamers. We are people that have a plan. We are people who have proven the value of our policies over many, many years now. We are leading scientists, and one of them is here, Phil DeLuna from Toronto St. Paul's, our candidate. We are entrepreneurs, we are entrepreneurs, we are physicians, we are students, we are creatives, we are academics, we are civil society leaders. And we are here at the end of the day for you. We are here at the end of the day because we share your values and we are here to be your fearless, tireless champions in whatever community you come from. And remember that whenever a Green is elected, they stay elected because that's how much we care about the communities we represent. I am seeking to be that champion for this community, one that is so generous, so resilient, and has provided us with our frontline workers, has provided us with our healthcare workers, has done so much for itself during this pandemic and just needs a little help from the real representation that it deserves. And so my leaders tour, the bulk of it, was going to be here in this community. And I'm going to invite all of Canada to join me as I tour the neighborhoods of this very special community and talk about the issues that matter to people across Canada um, and talk about the difference 
that our green policies could make in your lives. My election as leader of the Green Party of Canada was proof that this can still be a country of extraordinary firsts, that this can still be a country where we can make history. I approach this election in the same way that I approach the election for the leadership of my party, with hope, with humility, with humor, and yes, to my kids, I can be funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> with humor, and most of all, from start to finish, I hope with a great deal of honesty and honor. And I extend the same invitation to all Canadians, all of the people of Canada, as I did on the night that I was elected leader. I say to them, to every person that is ready to be daring, to every person that is ready to strike out in that new direction towards a better future, I say welcome, I say now is the time, and I say join us. Thank you so much. Green Party, Green Party, Green Party, Green Party. <laughs> Because it's, it's not just me, it's all of we, the Green Party. <laughs> okay, I'm ready to take any questions, and I think I need to put in this headpiece, yeah? Yeah, um, Ms. Paul, we're going to start with questions at the location, and then uh, see if there's any reporters on Zoom who want to ask questions. We will start with uh, questions uh, on the ground, and then uh, we will move to Zoom. If there are any questions... Good afternoon, uh, Madam Paul. David Thurton, CBC News. Hello, David. Um, Sorry, just a second. Let me yeah, just yeah. Uh, do your thing. I'm going to. I will. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, Owen, it was a bit heavy there. Okay, let me get uh, set up and we're good to go. Okay, perfect. Hi, David. Good to see you. Yeah, very good Lucky to see sharp. you. Lucky <laughs> uh, Sharp. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, you're saying that this election isn't necessary, that we shouldn't be going to a pen, into a pandemic election. But the Prime Minister was out there today saying that why shouldn't Canadians have a say? Why shouldn't Canadians have a say in the direction that we need to be taking our country at this critical juncture is the way he kind of described it. So I guess I'll just put that to you. Why shouldn't Canadians have a say about the direction that Canada should be heading post-pandemic uh, or as we exit this pandemic? Well, thank you very much for the question, and I would just say that Canadians do have a say. And it's really a testament to how far removed uh, the, uh, the government uh, ha and the Liberal Party have become from the people that they were elected to represent, that they wouldn't imagine that people in their communities could have a say about what happens in Parliament through their elected representatives. We had an election two years ago the government has a budget that they have successfully passed. Uh, the opposition parties have indicated their willingness to continue to work uh, in this minority parliament and to get back to business. And as you know, there is a tremendous amount that still remains to be done. And there is a tremendous amount of, call, of commonality if we decide that we're going to shoot for greatness. And so uh, the Prime Minister um, is going to be, I think, flailing around for a while, grasping at straws trying to find uh, any reason to justify this beyond what I believe is patently clear to the people of Canada, which is that the Liberal Party has determined and their, ins their backroom operators have determined that this is their best opportunity to get all the power uh, through a majority. And if it means having an election during forest fire evacuations, uh, heat domes, fourth waves, um, you know, the, the, the legacy, losing the legacy of our troops in Afghanistan, well, you know, I guess that's just the price uh, that they feel we're going to have to pay. And so again, the people of Canada uh, will have to decide whether Parliament would be better off having a variety of new voices who have a different approach, um, if, or if they're going to send back uh, more of the same. En français, oui. Uh, alors, uh, in oui, French, yes. So, yes. This means that the government uh, is creating a wedge between uh, its 
MPs and their writings. The Prime Minister proposed, suggests that it's necessary to have an election during a pandemic to confirm what Canadians wish for. I think that, and I think it's clear for everyone, what is happening is that the Liberal government and the Liberal Party decided that now is the time to call an election because it is their best chance to secure a majority. So even if we have an election during the fourth wave of the pandemic, uh, while uh, 270 forest fires are raging in BC, even uh, if uh, we turn our back to our legacy in Afghanistan, even if, uh, even though we have many commonalities, even if we could do a lot of work together in collaboration over the next two years, which remain, they decided to call an election, but uh, it is up to Canadians to decide whether they want to go back to the same parties, to the same MPs with the same political approach, or if they want to move to a different direction, uh, to a different destination. Real quick, because of what we've seen happening within the Greens, mm -hmm. because of all of that, if you do not win Toronto Centre, is there a way forward for you to continue as the leader of the Green Party of Canada? And en français, en français aussi. Yeah. In French, as all women, I can do uh, multitasking, but I have to admit that right now, uh, being the leader of the Green Party of Canada, being the main cheerleader uh, for all our candidates throughout the country, uh, to make sure that I'm there uh, to uh, be convincing, um, uh, when I put forward our policies to Canadian and to be here uh, uh, to canvas the residents of Toronto Centre uh, and to make sure that we win. All this is uh, taking up all my time. As all parties, we have a, a process uh, which will take place after the election. I will wait until after the election to evaluate all this. Right now, my job is to win my seat, to win seats uh, for candidates like Phil de Looney. I don't know if there are other candidates. Uh, we need to win seats and uh, to offer to the people of Canada a more positive, a more progressive, a more collaborative uh, option because this is what we need. In English, um, in English, I said, "Look, as 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 every woman knows, you, you know, we have to be multitaskers, and I'm definitely a multitasker. But my multitasking is full up right now. I am the lead cheerleader for all of our fantastic candidates who are running. I am the chief spokesperson for our tremendous green policies that would absolutely make a, a difference in people's lives if we have more greens elected and sent to Ottawa." And I'm trying to win this seat in Toronto Centre to give the folks in this good community the representation that they finally deserve. And so I'm full up for my multitask now. Um, we, like all the parties, have a process after elections for evaluating leadership. Um, I will go through that. Uh, but for the moment, uh, we only have 36 days in an election we should never have had. Um, my focus is 100% on this moment in time and what we can accomplish together uh, in this moment in time. Thank you, David. Radio Are there Canada, any... donc, en français, vous plaît, je vous aussi de... Radio Canada in French, uh, I will also uh, to uh, res ask you to respond in English after. Woods, you are facing uh, some financial issues as a party, and a political campaign is costly. And so are you confident that financially your campaign can go ahead? How will this uh, work financially? For many years, we were a startup as a political party, uh, but uh, uh, you can uh, have an election with uh, a lot of money or uh, with little money because we are powered by our volunteers, by people who are drawn to our policies, to our values and culture. So I am confident that we can do it. And in fact, uh, 
if there is an unexpected gift to having called an election during a pandemic, it's because, as you see, we need to have small gatherings. We always tried uh, to uh, set a uh, gold standard in terms of health and safety uh, for our volunteers and for the public. So uh, we will uh, have a campaign which reflects the moment in our history, uh, a um, sober campaign, a campaign uh, that doesn't uh, spend uh, loads of money and uh, that follows the public health guidelines. Um, in order to have a strong election. The Green Party is still a startup party. And those of us who join it, we are people that are unafraid of building something big, something better together. Uh, we have always been um, a party that is animated by our volunteers, um, by the people that are attracted to our values, to our policies, to our principles. That is the engine that drives us. And so whether we have a huge amount of money or a small amount of money, we can still get a great deal done because we have the resource that matters the most. And that's the people. And so we are going to have an election that also reflects this moment. You know, we are a party that respects uh, the Council of Public Health Officials. Uh, we know that we are in a fourth, fourth wave. We know that we can't have big gatherings. This is the max. Um, we know that many of the tools that we should be able to use to connect with people are going to be out of reach because we are in a fourth wave. And so um, given that, uh, we're going to be able to run an effective election absolutely with the resources that we have. Et en question uh, supplémentaire, uh, juste and, uh, as a follow-up question, how many candidates do you have and what are your objectives? Uh, uh, because 30 days is a short uh, time period. I don't have the total for today. Every day uh, we are confirming uh, a larger number of candidates throughout the country. We completely rethought our nomination process. So this was something underway even before I was elected as leader of the Green Party. We wanted to have a nomination process that was uh, the best in terms of diversity and inclusion. We wanted to make sure that we were totally open to all the talents in our country. We launched our campaign precisely for that reason. So that's something uh, which took some time, but it was worth it. Uh, we are now uh, to uh, gain a lot of momentum, and uh, every day we have more candidates. Our objective remains uh, to have a complete slate of candidates for these elections. That uh, made a very important commitment uh, in 2019, you know, well before I was elected in 2019, our party said, particularly after the last election where we had the least diverse slate of candidates, that we were going to do the work. We were going to ensure that we were the gold standard in terms of policy, nomination policies and procedures uh, that would ensure inclusivity and diversity and make sure that we were open to the very best talent uh, because that's what our party needs and that's what our parliament needs. And so that process meant that we were a bit uh, uh, longer getting out the gate, but we're building tremendous momentum. Our goal remains the same, to have candidates running coast to coast to coast um, in all ridings uh, uh, in Canada in this election. Hi, Anime. Hello. Uh, of course, we, we all know there's been, unfortunately, a lot of infighting within the, the Green Party. So. How will you um, be able to help restore the confidence of Canadians during this five-week election, which is not a very long time, of course, as you alluded to? So how will you uh, be able to help restore confidence in Canadians that you will you know, bring this Green Party to uh, leadership? That's a great question, and um, I guess there are two answers to that. The first is that we are in a significant process of renewal, uh, which is underway. It's not quite uh, complete, but I think that uh, it's going to yield really uh, exciting outcomes uh, for our members, uh, first and foremost, uh, but for people in Canada uh, in general. Uh, we haven't gone through this kind of significant renewal in a while, uh, and of course, it's you know there's 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 no there's no disguising, and I wouldn't want to. When you do these things, uh, it it takes time, and change is not always easy, but it's always worth it. And so we're going through that, but we're a party that I believe unifies at the times that matter the most. 
Our number one mandate in our constitution is to get Greens elected. And in general, we usually only get the opportunity every four years. And so we're absolutely going to be focused on that. We're absolutely going to do all that we can uh, to provide people with a, a green option. And that is the key thing. As I said uh, in my remarks, get to know the greens, uh, the green that is running in your community. You're going to find almost certainly an extraordinary person who has been committed to your community for many, many years, uh, who is already a leader in whatever human endeavor they have set for themselves, um, and who is committed to being a tireless champion for you the way that our sitting MPs are. Greens always get reelected because they always put their communities first. They always put their responsibilities as members of parliament for their constituents first. So you're gonna get someone that is prioritizing you and the needs of your community and also working towards a more collaborative parliament where we can get important work done. Mm -hmm. What should we be able to do to try and help quick the ridings to a green? What's your strategy, I guess? Our strategy is one that is focused on, on, on us. You know, I, um, I was attracted uh, to this party, many of us were, because we really are committed uh, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to Parliament uh, to trying to usher in a new culture. Uh, we've heard from many outgoing MPs from this session and from 2019 when we had a historic number of first-time MPs leaving Parliament that it is a culture that has become toxic. It is a culture that has become unwelcoming. It is a culture that um, has concentrated too much power in the hands of too few. And so we see ourselves as being part of the antidote to that. Um, and for people that are thinking about um, who to vote for in this election, as I said in my remarks, think about who is going to prioritize the needs of your community. Who is there to represent you? Um, are, are, is the person you're electing going back to Ottawa in order to follow the directions of, of someone else? Or are they there uh, in order to faithfully respect um, the wishes of the community? Because that is the bond. And I think that if people uh, do that, and if they take a look at the extraordinary policies that Greens were the first to propose and that now are making a difference in people's lives, they're going to see a lot to like and they're going to choose to vote for us. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any more questions on the ground? So I will just go to the Zoom. Are there any questions on Zoom? Are there any questions on Zoom? On the Zoom call? Si vous plaît. No questions here. Thank you, Ms. Paul. Pas de questions ici, merci. No questions here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.